Hello, I'm audible. Good morning. Good morning, Abhishek. Good morning, Imran. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Semicon 2022, uh, day two. Uh, now we are in the session eight, and he's the course director of Inuelis India. And uh, the entire uh, session will be moderated by Dr. Imran Subhan. He's a consultant and head residency director, emergency medicine, Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. He's a past president of Society for Emergency Medicine India. So over to you, Dr. Imran. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Vishek. Um, welcome to Semicon 2020, everyone. This is organized by the West Bengal chapter of the Society for Emergency Medicine India. And today is day two of the Semicon virtual conference. So the Society for Emergency Medicine India is the largest group of trained and qualified emergency physicians and paramedics in India. SEMI is also a full member of the International Federation of Emergency Medicine and the only organization representing India on the global map of emergency care. Uh, SEMI conducts two uh, uh, conferences annually. MCONs are our, remain our flagship conferences, which is the largest gathering of emergency physicians. And uh, SEMI also conducts the SEMICON conferences, which are focused exclusively on imparting education uh, to the postgraduate trainees under various residency training programs here in India. Uh, we had some fantastic talks yesterday by more than 30 speakers, and we had more than 750 uh, viewers online connected with us. So uh, today is also going to be a great day of learning with very interesting topics and speakers. So with that introduction, let me just go with our first speaker. Our first speaker is Fabit Mohedin. Uh, he is the chief of emergency medicine of Baby Memorial Hospitals, Calicut. He's a past president of the Kerala State Chapter of SEMI and the secretary of Sono School Ultrasound Courses. He's also the faculty for the SEMI's National Ultrasound and Life Support Courses. So his talk is on emergency ultrasound and its role in the emergency department. So can we have the video for, of Dr. Fabit, please? Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Fabit, Chief of Emergency Medicine, Baby Memorial Hospital. Uh, I thank the organizing team of uh, Semicon for giving me this opportunity. The topic given to me is emergency ultrasound and its role in ED. So it's like a vast topic. I won't be able to cover everything. So I will tell you what all we can do on that. Um, <clears throat> My approach is going to be ABCD approach of ultrasound. So you can do ultrasound of airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. In airway, uh, you know that uh, American Heart Association has included airway assessment, that is intubation confirmation with ultrasound. So you can um, confirm your airway placement uh, with ultrasound. So what you're going to do is a transfer scan of the neck, and then uh, you will see the trachea as you will see the air, air tissue interface that's a white line there and then you have uh, the reverberation artifact of the air tissue interface okay uh, esophagus is going to be a collapsed structure so you're not going to see esophagus so when you're intubating you will not see anything basically you will see only the trachea and some moments there so if you're intubating into trachea you're not going to see anything okay so it's going to be uh, you know clear uh, I mean, you can't find anything extra. But if you're intubating to esophagus, so if you're intubating to esophagus, what is going to happen is, you will see the trachea here, okay? So you'll see the air tissue interface, and then you will see the collapsed structure esophagus, and something, some tube is coming into that. So you will see, now we can see one tube here, that's a trachea normal, and then you see a tube, okay, in the esophagus. So this is what you're going to see, okay? So normally you see only one tube, okay? If you see another one coming in, that's a esophageal intubation, okay? Uh, moving on, so you can actually, uh, you know, locate the cricothyroid membrane to do a cricothyrotomy or a surgical crack. Uh, coming to breathing, 
Uh, we can do ultrasound of the chest to know pneumothorax, hemothorax, pleural effusion, lung contusion, and, uh, and uh, pulmonary edema. So when you do ultrasound of the chest, you're going to see a bad sign. So this is the uh, topmost, this is the, uh, the upper rib, okay, which is white in color. So you know that the rib is going to be white and then the shadow of that posterior acoustic shadow, okay. So that's our top rib and this is the bottom rib, okay. And that this is going to be the intercostal, uh, the intercostal space, okay. And you'll see white intercostal space there. Uh, that's a pleura. Okay, so you have uh, the pleura here and with the A lines, white lines, they are the A lines. So this is the air tissue interface and you see the A line, they are, they are the reverberation artifacts. Uh, so what are the normal artifacts you're going to see in lung? You will see pleura with lung sliding, pleural sliding or we call it as lung sliding. You see A lines, you see uh, when you put a M mode, you will see a C show sign. I'm going to show you all those and these are the areas you can scan the lung. Basically I do scan uh, right from the margin of the sternum all lateral and also the posterior part. So there's no point I usually keep because if it is a small pneumothorax it's going to be here. So I don't want to miss even one point there. So I, I scan whole chest as such. Okay so uh, do, remember to scan the posterior part as well. So whenever you have uh, the parietal and visceral pleura together, okay, what you're going to see is the lung sliding, okay. So how does it look like in uh, ultrasound? So it looks like, uh, so that's uh, lung sliding, you can see that small and like marching, and marching on this particular line, that's a pleura, parietal pleura and visceral pleura rubbing each other when he's taking breath. So you can see that uh, A lines, the white lines are the A lines. So this is normal. Okay, so normally you see pleural sliding. When you put an M mode, you're going to see a C shore appearance. This is anti C uh, appearance in ultrasound. And then this is the beach uh, counterpart. Okay, so whenever you have A in between this parietal and visceral pleura, uh, this uh, this lung, uh, lung uh, sliding will not happen. Okay, so this is absent lung sliding. Now coming to pneumothorax, you know that the air is going to be in the topmost part. Okay, that's why I told you you have to scan right in the apex and uh, very close to the medial, uh, close to the sternum, and then you go lateral. The air is going to collect here and then move laterally, and then the lungs start collapsing. That's a disadvantage of uh, of your uh, chest X-ray. What happens in chest X-ray is the air start collecting, and once it has a significant air, then you will see the lung margin coming in chest x-ray. But uh, ultrasound, even if you have small air, you can pick it up right in the apex, this part, okay? And then uh, you go lateral and find the lung point where you find the normal lung sliding happening at the lung point. Okay, so this is absent lung sliding we are talking about. So uh, you don't see, you see the pleura and there is no movement or there is no ant marching on that particular line. That's uh, absent pleural sliding. One of the differential diagnoses is pneumothorax. There are a lot of other differential diagnoses, like if you are integrated to the um, uh, left lung, your right lung will not have a uh, aeration. So you will see the same thing. Okay. There are other conditions like in certain eclectasis or pneumonia, all those uh, places you can you may not find a, a pleural sliding. Another thing is uh, you, if uh, uh, the pleura are actually uh, together, like for disease conditions, uh, you know, where they have thickened pleura or uh, things like that, then that also the, the pleural sliding will not be seen. Uh, now, uh, cetosphere sign is basically uh, whenever you put the M mode in a pneumothorax, you will find that seizure appearance is going to go away and you find it as seizure. There's no seizure anymore, you're going to see the cetosphere sign. Okay, so uh, a lung point is nothing but the, you can see the sliding up to here, you can see the normal aeration happening here and this part of the pleura, it's not sliding. So when you, when patient is trying to take a breath, you can see the sliding and then there is no sliding at this particular part. That's a uh, lung point and it's very specific for pneumothorax. Coming to hemothorax or pleural effusion, you, uh, you know that the fluid is going to be in the uh, dependent area. And so you keep the probe in mid uh, axillary line, nine to seven to nine metacostal space to find the fluid. 
okay what you're going to see is the you know the you may be seeing the diaphragm here and above the diaphragm you will see the pleural fluid as black and then uh, there's something called a spine sign where normally there is lung here so the air is not going to go and see the spine okay the ultra sorry the ultrasound is not going to go through the lung uh, or through the air to see the spine normally but if you have fluid ultrasound likes fluid so it goes through the fluid and then the posterior part of the spine uh, or you can see the spine that, that's called a spine sign if you see spine sign that means there is pleural effusion okay or hemothorax okay uh, also you can find a, a collapsed uh, lung there you can see um, a tissue like like liver like structure there above the diaphragm this is the diaphragm you can see pleural effusion plus uh, consolidation there now coming to pulmonary edema or contusions basically uh, what you're going to see is the b line b line is nothing but it, it uh, the, the definition of b line the b line should arise from the pleura okay it should not be above the pleura if it is arising above the pleura we call it as e line that may be subcutaneous emphysema so the b line has to arise from the pleura and it has to cut all the a lines and it will end till the posterior part i mean the bottom part so this is a b line so normally you will see one or two b lines uh, so if it is more than three b line in one particular area it is that side it is positive for b lines okay so b line means it is same like your curly b lines it's the lung at that particular area is wet that's what i mean a lot of number of studies will say that uh, lung ultrasound is better than just x-ray to detect the uh, pulmonary all right, so this is how it looks like. You can see clusters of B line together forming one big uh, junk of B line, okay? And you can see another B line here, okay? So if you have bilateral B lines in the anterior part of the chest, okay? And in two zones, you have to roll out. If a patient is coming with breathing difficulty, you have to roll out a, a pulmonary edema, cardiogenic pulmonary edema or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Okay, there is something called as Blue Protocol. Please go through that. It's a wonderful uh, uh, you know, paper by Dr. Daniel. Coming to circulation, so you can look at the cardiac activity, look at the cardiac tamponade, you can look at the hemoperitoneum, hypovolemic causes, and also vascular access can be detected. Cardiac examination, you have uh, uh, parastinal long axis, you have parastinal short axis, we have uh, a vehicle four chamber and subcostal view. These are the main four views we do in uh, uh, emergency department. There are other views also, but these are the frequently done. Okay, coming to IVC, so you know that whenever a patient is uh, having, uh, whenever a patient is I taking a breath, patient is taking a breath, uh, you will find that uh, the, the IVC is collapsing during during inspiration. If it is not collapsing, if it is plethoric, which means there is a, a increased flight rate pressure. So these are numbers. Okay, please don't go according to numbers. I am saying, uh, please uh, look into the clinical picture and then only uh, use your ultrasound uh, and measure and then say that these are the things. So if it is less than two centimeters and more than fifty percent collapse your right atrial pressure is approximately three, which is, we just take it as low uh, right atrial pressure. If it is more than two and less than 50% collapse, uh, the right atrial pressure is high. That's all you have to take. And there are other methods to uh, check fluid responsiveness. I'm not going to details of all those things. We will definitely have some uh, sort of uh, training for that to know all those things. Uh, so, if a patient is mechanically ventilated, the IVC is not going to be, IVC collapsibility is not going to be um, uh, useful. So, what you're going to do is IVC distensibility intakes. Okay. So, this is the formula for that. All right. Now, coming to how do you assess actually the, the whole scenario? You look at the lung, you look at the heart, and you look at the IVC and the kidneys. So, the heart is hyperdynamic. You can see that. The LV walls are kissing each other, the IVC is collapsing during inspiration, and kidneys are normal. Okay, so I know that this is a hyperdynamic LV, and this patient needs fluid. Okay, so somebody is coming with the B lines uh, in the chest, bilateral B lines, the kidneys looks like this, the particular particular medullary differentiation is lost. And if you have a patient like this, it may be acute on chronic renal failure patient. Okay, so uh, another case where you have bilateral B lines, the IVC is plethoric and the heart is not pumping. So it's a cardiogenic pulmonary. 
so you have to put your clinical skill into it uh, because it's not just don't see the ultrasound alone uh, this is a, a lung is normal you don't see any b lines here sliding is normal the uh, there is a right uh, ventricular dilatation okay that's a v shaped lv okay the lv is small and it is pushed so you can see that uh, the ivc is plethoric that's is pressure and then you see a DVT scan, you find a, a, a thrombus sitting there in the left femoral way. So what you're dealing with is a pulmonary embolism. Okay, so coming to the fast scan, the common areas you cover is, uh, first is the, it will roll out cardiac tamponade, subcostal view, and see for any uh, fluid around the heart. Here you can see fluid around the heart, and then you can see the RV, collapsing during uh, diastole. So it's a diastolic collapse of the RV. Feels like somebody is jumping on this RV. So that's this black thing, the whole thing is a fluid. Okay. So that's um, uh, the second view is basically the Morrison's pouch. Okay, the right hypochondral view. You can see the liver here, you can see the kidney here, you can see the whole fluid all, all around. So that's the fast positive. Okay, you can also see the other side for the spleen and the kidney, and you can see perisplenic area around the spleen. Okay, so free fluid. Coming to the pelvis, you can see the fluid. This is a, a uterus. You can see fluid around the uterus here. Okay. Okay, around the bladder also. That's a long. This is a transverse view of the bladder. You can see fluid, fluid collection here. Coming to disability, optic nerve sheet diameter can be actually checked uh, to know the intracranial pressure approximately, know the intracranial pressure. You can check the pupils. Also in neonates, you can actually see the midline shift also. So uh, how do you do it? The transverse, you can do a transverse scan of the eyes as well as the longitudinal scan. You have to make sure that you take two scans, not only one. So one is transverse, another one is uh, longitudinal. You have to take two, two views and then average the number of optic nerve sheet diameter. Okay, so what you're going to see is the cornea anterior chamber, just a deflection of or a artifact of lens may be seen, posterior chamber and the optic nerve sheet behind that. Alright, so this is how the ultrasound look like, so small thin cornea will be seen and you can see a, a small artifact here of the lens and then you can see black posterior chamber here and the black shadow here is the optic nerve, okay. So how do you measure it? Uh, you're going to take uh, the, the from the posterior edge, you're going to go three millimeter into the uh, optic nerve sheet. And then when you measure the optic nerve sheet, make sure that you are measuring from inner diameter to the inner diameter, not outer. It is inner diameter of the optic nerve sheet to the inner diameter of the optic nerve sheet. Okay. And then uh, the values you have to remember is remember it is as, it is as four, 4.5 and 5. Okay. So four is all children less than one year, 4.5 for all the children more than one year and anybody who is an adult, the, the value is, the cutoff value is five. So anybody who has a value of more than five millimeter in an adult, okay, is uh, taking it as positive. Okay, so remember four is the cutoff, 4.5 is for, uh, you know, for any children more than uh, one year and for adults it is five. Pupils can be uh, easily seen with ultrasound, if, especially when there is edema and not able to open it. You can find the small uh, pupils here, you can measure it also. And also if you can shine the dots on the other people, you can see the reaction as well. Okay, so <clears throat> that's a small, you can see black thing, that's a pupil. You can see the iris around. Okay. All right, the so midline shift, especially neonates, not for adults. If, if, uh, if they're seen in neonates, can be seen. You uh, can midline shift, can be seen. Exposure, you can do ultrasound from head to toe. I have told you the fractures, abscesses, nerve blocks, uh, foreign bodies, and vascular access. Everything we can do ultrasound. So soon the stethoscope is going to be go go away. But I don't use ultrasound and stethoscope anymore. Uh, that's it for the presentation. Thank you very much. I think uh, this lecture is not enough for you all you need to get hands-on training so we will definitely help you with nuls we have uh, ultrasound courses sonos school ultrasound courses as well thank you very much see you bye yeah uh
thanks uh, thanks to fabit for that uh, good presentation lot of pictures lot of videos to show the practical aspects of emergency uh, in uh, ultrasound in an emergency department <clears throat> we have the second speaker dr harish avdhani dr harish is a consultant from uh, emergency medicine department at narayana multi speciality hospitals from bangalore so he will be talking on roc curve and consort guideline so can we have his video please as ROC curve and consort guidelines. Myself, Dr. Harish, uh, welcome to Semicon 2022. So uh, today's topic is ROC curve and consort guidelines. Myself, Dr. Harish, uh, I'm a consultant uh, of emergency department at Narana Health Bangalore. So coming to today's topic of ROC curve and consort guidelines, even before we discuss those things, let's see what are the assessment of a diagnostic test. The how a diagnostic test can be assessed. So this is in the terms of sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, likelihood ratios, ROC curves, and then consult guidelines. Now, uh, even before we discuss about the ROC and the consult guidelines, I would like to discuss about the basics, which are sensitivity and specificity, which I believe is important for this topic of today. So uh, coming to sensitivity and specificity, even if we do that in let's say this table is the most important one which will give a brief idea about how a sensitivity and specificity as well as positive and negative predictive values work so sensitivity it's basically an ability of the test to detect the disease the proportion of the disease that was correctly identified whereas specificity ability of the test to detect that there is no disease and the proportion that correctly identifies as not having a disease. As you can see, if the test result is positive and if the disease is present, it's a true positive. Uh, FP is false positive when the disease is not there and the result says it's positive. So that's how we diagnose. Now, the important points are basically sensitivity and specificity. They are not affected by the prevalence of the disease. In order to increase the sensitivity of the test, uh, the specific city will become less I and mean, uh, sensitivity and specificity looks at uh, the presence and absence of disease uh, to determine the likelihood of the test in identifying the disease correctly uh, remember this uh, snout and uh, spin snout is basically sensitivity rules out whereas spin is specificity rules in the disease so there is no practical use when it comes to helping the clinician estimate the probability of the disease in an individual as they are identified as they are defined by the presence or absence of the disease and let's see now coming to uh, positive and negative predictive values positive predictive value is the proportion of the test positive results that are truly positive and similarly the proportion of the negative test result that are truly negative this is what the PPV and NNPV decides. Now, uh, predictive values take into consideration regarding the prevalence of disease. But as I told you, the sensitivity and specificity, they don't take into consideration regarding the prevalence. It just indicates the presence or absence of the disease. PPV and NPV looks at the subject from the point of view uh, of the test result being positive or negative and determines the likelihood of being correct. Now, this is clinically useful. Now, likelihood ratios, positive likelihood ratio, also known as likelihood ratio for a positive test result, is sensitivity divided by 1 minus specificity. It tells us how much more likely the patient has the disease if the test is positive. Similarly, negative. It tells us how much less likely the patient has the disease if the test is negative. Now, ROC curve. The ROC curve is basically a receiver operative operating characteristic curve that is a graphical plot that illustrates the diagnostic ability of a binary classifying system as its a discrimination threshold is varied the method was originally developed for uh, operators of military radar receiving rece uh, military radar receivers which was starting in 1941 uh, which led it to its name now the roc is it's a curve which plots the sensitivity versus false positive rate for several values of a diagnostic test by connection when they are uh, sensitivity is shown on y-axis whereas one minus specificity is shown on x-axis 
ranging from 0 to 1, same thing goes on y-axis as well. To produce an ROC curve, the sensitivities and specificities for different values of a continuous test me measure, they are first tabulated. These results in essentially in a list of various test results and the corresponding sensitivity and specificity of a test results of the test at that value. In medicine, ROC curves are a way to analyze the accuracy of diagnostic tests and to determine the best threshold or cutoff value for distinguishing between positive and negative test results. Then it illustrates the trade off between the sensitivity and specificity in tests that produce results on a numerical scale rather than as an absolute positive or a negative result. Now, so this is a sample ROC curve where you can see sensitivity on the y axis and 1 minus specificity on the x axis. Both of them they range for 0 to 1. Now, this 0 to 1, as you can see, the black line which comes in and shows the median curve. I'll come to let's see this. I think this will help you a bit more to understand. So, it's basically a true positive rate versus false positive rate. Now, random classifier is at the median, and uh, the more it is towards the perfect classifier, which is 1, uh, the better the graphical representation, which gives a better understanding of a test. Now, the ROC curve is basically indicates more towards the perfect classifier, and that's how it classifies the area. Now, classifiers are appearing on the left-hand side of an ROC curve near the y-axis may be thought of as a conservative. They make positive classifications only with strong evidence. So, they make few false positive errors, but they often have low true positive rates as well. Now, classifiers on the upper right-hand side of an ROC curve, which may be thought of as liberal, they make positive classifications with weak evidence. So, they classify nearly all positives correctly but often have high false positive rates. Now what is the use of this ROC curve? Determination of cutoff point at which optimal sensitivity and specificity are achieved. Now these are called the decision thresholds. Now area under curve which is visual and quantitative assessment of the diagnostic accuracy of a test that can be used for comparisons. Now this ROC curve can be used to generate the confidence intervals for sensitivity and specificity and likelihood ratios. Now the same advantages, now you have seen the uses, now let's come to the advantages. It's simple and it's graphical, represents the accuracy or the entire range of the test. It's very independent of the prevalence, test may be compared on the same scale. Now it allows comparison for the accuracy between several tests. Now, one of the challenges which help men, which is with the tests, is the results of the diagnostic tests that produce are uh, basically they distinguish the threshold of a positive test from a negative test. Now, the role of ROC in choosing the threshold cutoffs. Now, where should we hold the cutoffs in using the thresholds? Now, let's say we take an example. Of a troponin. Example troponin levels in diagnosis of MI. Several different troponin T plasma concentrations would have been chosen and compared against a gold standard in diagnosing MI, which could be an echo, a regional wash, a regional wall abnormalities. Now the sensitivity and specificity of each chosen troponin T level would have been plotted. Now the ideal cutoff is the one which picks up a lot of disease, it is highest sensitivity but has very few false positive, which is high specificity. One method assumes that the best cutoff point for balancing the sensitivity and specificity of test is the point on the curve, which is closest to the zero one, the point that is high up on the left hand side of the graph, resulting in a large area under curve method. There are other alternatives. Now, setting of a cutoff value which is too low may yield to a very high sensitivity, but at the expense of specificity. That is, a lot of false positive results can come up. Now, setting up a cutoff value which is too high would yield in high specificity, but 
the expense of sensitivity. So the best cutoff has the highest sensitivity and the lowest one minus sensitivity. Therefore, they are located on high upon vertical axis as far as on the left side. The same thing, discriminative values in test general. The greater the area, the more useful the test. The maximum possible area is in a perfect square, which is most of the times not possible. Now, the area under the curve, a 0.5 means the test is no better than the chance alone. It's a straight diagonal line, which is called generally the reference line. The uh, area under the ROC curve is a global measure of the ability of a test to discriminate whether the specific condition is present or not. Now, uh, paper body at L is an example illustrates the role of receiver operating curve, characteristic curve, in choosing the threshold cutoffs for newly derived troponin only, which is Tmax, which we call troponin only Manchester acute coronary score. The original Max, uh, which is Manchester acute uh, coronary syndromes score, used two thresholds to aid clinical decision making. A low threshold was set to rule out the diagnosis of a ACS and a higher threshold was used to rule in an ACS. Patients with the test results falling between these two thresholds would require further clinical observation. The Tmax uh, score system estimates the probability of ACS from 0 to 1. So AUC1 means the test has a perfect accuracy. AUC0.5 means the test is no better than a chance. So the higher the AUC, the more the accurate test. Now likelihood ratios, uh, these are basically the point on a ROC curve uh, which corresponds to the likelihood ratio for a single test value represented by that point. The slope between these two points on the ROC curve corresponds to likelihood ratio for a test result in a defined level bounded by two points. Now, welcome to the consort group. In the consort group, it's basically an international and uh, electric group comprising trialists, methodologists, and uh, medical journal editors. So, as you can see in this picture from uh, left to right, as I can tell you, uh, it's Mr. David Moher, Ken and uh, in the front row, it's Doug Altman. So all of these uh, are the medical journal editors and methodologists and trialists. This has become very much useful. See, any study design, like whether it's be a randomized control style or an observational study or a systematic review meta-analysis, these help in actually forming a guideline or accrediting of a study which helps in advancement of the medical field so each uh, test which has been proven to be useful in diagnosing a patient or diagnosing a case is all coming from most of these kind of studies now each study design needs to have a reporting guideline how they report it so most of the RCTs are being used in a consort study now consort what is consort consort is it's a protocol developed by a group of these researchers not only to identify the problems arising from conducting the rcts but also to report in a full and clear manner the results yielded by the research thereby facilitating the rcts reading and quality assessment now it's basically guidelines which are intended to improve the reporting of parallel group RCTs enabling the readers to understand the trial design, conduct analysis and interpretation to assess the validity of its results. Now it comprises of two things. One, which is a checklist, which is 25 item uh, checklist and the two, which is a flow diagram. Now I'll discuss with this flow diagram. There are two things which has come up. In 2010, they have a flow diagram and this 25 item checklist has been updated again in 2018. So initially when uh, we come to this 25 item uh, checklist, there are uh, some of the changes which has been made to improve the consort statement. Now the checklist basically focuses on how a trial was designed and how it was analyzed and how it is imprinted. 
the flow diagram displays the progress of all the participants throughout the trail now coming to explanation and elaboration document it explains and illustrates the principles underlying the consort statement author should report the sources of funding of the trail as this is important in information for the readers in assessing the trial studies have shown that the research sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry are more likely to produce the results favoring the product made by the company sponsoring the research than studies funded by other sources the level of info involvement of a funder and their influence in the design conduct analysis and reporting of a trial varies now see this this is a 25 item checklist which includes introduction methods and results discussion and other information so each study i um, mean each rct has to go through all these checklists which gives an idea whether the rct can be trusted whether the rct is good enough now the consort diagram which is a simple flow diagram it shows enrollment of the subjects their allocation to treatment and disposition status how the trial i mean how they are analyzed in the trial the layout depends upon the study design now as you can see it comprises of four components which is enrollment allocation follow-up and analysis enrollment basically eligibility of the patients which are meeting the inclusion criteria and then they are enrolled into the study now allocation to intervention each i mean all these are cities they are compared at parallel groups with other studies seeing how they are allocated whether the received uh, participants have allocated intervention or not if intervened did they lose i mean the next comes is a follow-up did they lose a follow-up and this is there any uh, intervention which has been discontinued and then it comes to analysis depending upon how these 2010 as you can see the flow diagram the eligibility and randomization allocation follow-up analysis depending upon these things once a study is followed in this manner it becomes much more easier the trial becomes much more transparent and same thing in 2018 they have updated uh 2010 statement uh, which has been updated in 2018 by consort spi which is social and psychological interventions was developed the social and psychological interventions are the actions which are needed through uh, they are intended to modify the process and system that are social and psychological in nature such as cognitions emotions behavior norms relationships and environments they are hypothesized to influence the outcomes of the interest now there are uh, noteworthy changes when compared to 2010 to 2018 uh, when you see uh, you can see specific trial design. when basically there are uh, some changes which has been made six a the distinction between primary versus secondary outcomes has been removed blinding has been changed to uh, awareness of assignment and masking now all these things are basically they are meant to be transparent and a detailed reporting of social and psychological interventions which in which as it is is needed to minimize the reporting biases maximize the credibility and utility of this research now the same comes 2018 checklist which is consort spi which is social psychological interventions which has been made in that also you can see there are some changes uh, when you see items 23 to 25 the other uh, information has been changed to important information which you can see over here important information which is registration protocol declaration interest stakeholder involvement how much do they involve uh, so these 2000 consort spi 2018 that are applicable to other type of trials as well missing data availability of trial data these kind of things the ultimate benefit of this collective effort should be better practices leading to better health and better quality of life um, the purpose of having these reporting guidelines in scientific research is basically to create a manual 
for the authors to follow and promote uh oh, we have just uh, uh, stopped that uh, lecture so let's move on to the third uh, speaker the third speaker is dr venugopalan uh, puvantham parambil he is a senior consultant and uh, director for emergency medicine at aster mems calicut he is also the regional faculty for india for the american heart association and the site director for the gw mem residency training programs so he'll be talking on GCS versus four scale versus the pecan rule. So can we have his video, please? Sir, we are having some technical issues. We are looking into it. Just bear with us for a minute. Hello. Uh, good morning and thank you for opportunity to present this very important and wonderful topic. Uh, and it is very useful topic for the postgraduates. That is the Glasgow Coma Scale, Four Scale, and Peak and Rule. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, Glasgow Coma Scale is conventionally we are using for uh, last many years. Just got uh, three component: eye opening, uh, uh, response to eye opening, verbal response, and motor response. We just got aggregate 15 points, and uh, uh, depending upon this point, you will also classify uh, classify the brain injury into minor uh, or minor or mild, moderate, or severe. But uh, in the recent years, in 2018, uh, in Journal of Neurosurgery, uh, this um, uh, GCS is uh, updated and thoroughly revised, and they, put, they made it that approach is simplified and corrected what are the liquidity it has got so far. So, uh, so according to the new approach, they made it in a simple four-level approach to assess DCS. The first one is you just uh, assess for the uh, check for the factors that are interfering for communication, ability to respond, uh, and, and and injuries. The second step in this is like uh, looking at ob you are observe first you check it then observe observe for eye opening content of speech and moment of right and left sides. Then the third step you stimulate you stimulate your patient uh, stimulate uh, for the uh, for the sound and the physical sound for the spoken and shouter request and the physical you do pressure on fingertip, trapezius, or suborbital touch. According to the three, the fourth step is the rate, whether, whatever the result you are go, you are uh, getting out of this assessment. This is the fourth simple four step assessment. GCS is the new one. And uh, one important thing like uh, you should, uh, previously you are, uh, as you are applying pain uh, to get the response. And hereafter, the, you should not apply painful, any painful stimuli. What you can do, you can do only a pressure to elicit the response. So the usual size to apply the pressure are the fingertip, the trapezius, or the supraorbital notch. And uh, how long you apply this pressure? You have to do 10 seconds maximum. And uh, you know, like uh, the one of the major drawback of the Glasgow Coma Scale uh, is there are so many comp confounding factors which mislead the results of the GCS. This include uh, drugs, particularly anesthetic, sedatives, neuromuscular blockade agents, etc., and also sometimes with the cranial nerve injury, intoxications like alcohol or drug, hearing impairment. A patient on endotracheal tube or on tracheostomy tube. Again, uh, sometimes patient with limb or spinal cord injury, dysphasia, pre-existing pre disorders like dementia, psychiatric disorders, ocular trauma, 
language and cultural related issue orbital selling all this will uh, will uh, are the some of the confounding confounding factors that are rendering one or more components of the uh, glasgow scoma scale in that case what you have to record you have to just put it nt nt means not able to test or not tested non test not testable so recently the journal of neurosurgery again added a few more things in the assessment of the gcs score one is like they added the pupillary reaction that is what is called the gcsp in gcsp what you can do that the pupillary reactivity score that's the prs is subtracted from the total uh, glasgow scoma scale total score so a gcsp gcs minus p is equal to uh, that is a gcsp here uh, that the GCSP is here, it is ranging from 15 to 1. So, in fact, uh, what you will you will do is you are looking at the unreactiveness to the pupils, unreactiveness to the light. So you can grade in like suppose that both the people are unreactive, you will give the score of two. If only one people is unreactive, you will give the score of one. And if the both the people are reactive, you will give the score of zero. So this way you have to add that GCSP. In addition to that, again, new new GCS system, they added age also, because that age is the one of the risk factor, uh, risk factor for the death after, uh, after traumatic brain injury. And uh, this uh, death rate is increasing when the age is increased. Similarly, all the ages, again, uh, the risk of death increase due to DCSP is decreases. And uh, so what is the most important thing is like uh, with, with, the, with the addition of the age along with the GCSP, uh, there will be there will be charts or the nomogram which shows the risk of death and also there are normal it's a separate normogram to predict that favorable outcome uh, in the six month period of the post traumatic injury so this is the one uh, one normogram which predict the mortality where you can see that age is pl plotted against gcsp uh, this another nomogram here this is the one which uh, predict that the six month uh, favorable outcome following a traumatic brain injury and also like and also combining like them to convey the information uh, graphically about the risk of mortality or the prospects of the independent recovery after head injury so uh, another thing what we have the, the the new recommendation added along with the gcs people reactivity in age ct scan finding so the ct scan finding is uh, uh, again like um, it is a simple extension of the prognostic chart that can be made by uh, statifying original charts into the CT scan grouping as in three group. That is the no uh, patients with no uh, CT scan finding, uh, or patient with one CT scan finding, or patient two or more CT scan finding. So this here, you again, they created that two sets of three predictive charts that's based on GCSP plus patient age and number of CT scan abnormalities. And these charts, there are also charts for no CT scan abnormality or CT scan, no, with one CT scan abnormality or two or more abnormalities. Uh, see, this is like uh, these charts are uh, predict uh, the favorable outcome, and also this will be helpful as to uh, us for deciding or the, for, as helping us for decision making and communicating the predictive information to the clinicians, uh, patients, and their caregivers. So. Uh, as far as again GCS is concerned, uh, when uh, the case is a pediatric, the ch in, in a case of child, particularly in infants and children, uh, this is slightly different, particularly the difference is seen in verbal response. This uh, gross reference, what you can see is in the uh, response is seen in uh, seen in the infants. 
uh, where you see like uh, we will assess that verbal response by smile co and coos or the cries and uh, cries and consonable or the persistent inappropriate crying or screaming or the grunts and agitated result or no response like that so the pediatric gcs is something different from the adult gcs now we are coming to the four score four score is uh, uh, is has got the four 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 system of scoring that include eye opening, uh, then eye opening muscle response, uh, motor responses, then brainstem reflexes, and uh, respirations. So, uh, so see the brainstem reflexes are again in the all all are the, the four skill measurings also there in the brainstem reflexes that's the uh, they look at into the pupil reactivity and corneal reflexes whether it is present or not and whether it is present in one eye and, and when the next grade, in, uh, grade is coming pupil or corneal reflexes are absent or both are absent or no reflexes are at all again coming to the respiratory responses they are looking at uh, regular respiratory pattern or chain stock breathing or irregular breathing or it triggers the ventilator or breath above the ventilator rate and apnea so something we have to know like uh, the basic difference between the gcs and the four scale in the gcs uh, you know like there are 3.3 level assessment or three parameters are assessing but in uh, in in four score there are four components are assessing which include eye response motor response brainstem response and respiratory system that is e4 m4 b4 and r4 uh, issue is like you know like the gcs has got a limited role uh, in patient on endotracheal tube or the tri or the tracheostomy or is this misleading or this, these are the confounding factors but definitely the four score can be assessed this kind of patients again uh, in icu send all gcs score is less uh, relevant uh, they are mainly using apache 2 score but uh, 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 but um, uh, but in see like uh, these are very uh, four scores are very useful in detecting patients with lock syndrome, particularly in ICU. Other thing, it is the GCS is well validated for the last 30 years, uh, but the four score had to be need more validations. And uh, finally, we are coming to the PCAN rule. PCAN rule is basically used to decide the CT scan, whether the CT scan is uh, required in, in a pediatric cases so the this uh, pecan uh, rules are again uh, is different for those children who are below two years and those who are above two years so in a simple version the pecan rule is um, a pig and rule is assessed by if suppose the baby is less than two years what you have to assess you can you look at uh, how the whether the three things you are look at whether there is a altered mental status or how the if the gcs is less than 15 or there is any palpable skull, skull fracture if this is there definitely that child is required or indicated for a ct scan but coming to an age above two years uh, the gcs and ams are same rather than looking at the palpable uh, palpable skull fracture you look for the any any signs of basal skull fracture if this any one of these are there again you should go for uh, ct scan can and if this is not there again then next uh, what you have to look at if the patient is less than two years you have to look at whether the loc is more than five years or there is any frontal hematoma is there any frontal hematoma or a non-reacting patient is not acting normally or there is a severe mechanism of injury if this any one of these is there yes you have to uh, put the patient on uh, patient on observation or uh, or the observation versus cts can be de decided if this is less than depending upon the physician experience uh, multiple 
or isolated finding worsening symptom or signs in the ED observation, or if the child is less than three months and the parental preferences. Uh, but if the child is more than two years, uh, what you will do, like you see that history of LOC, history of vomiting, uh, severe headache, or severe uh, mechanism, uh, severe mechanism. If this is the you decide uh, whether uh, like to be observe, observe or do the CT scan. The CT scan, whether to take a CT scan is again in a, in a, in a child more than two years, depending upon the physician experience, multiple versus isolated finding and uh, worsening symptoms, uh, signs and symptoms in ED observation and also parental preferences. So, uh, these are the four things I quickly explained. Thank you for uh, your patient listening. Any question you can ask now. Thank you. Uh, so we have the end of uh, Dr. Venugopal's presentation. That was a good presentation. We have the fourth speaker, Dr. Argya Mukherjee. Dr. Argya Mukherjee is a consultant, um, anesthesiologist, and pain and palliative care physician at Narayana Super Speciality Hospital at Howrah in West Bengal. So his topic is ultrasound guided pain management and procedural sedation. This is very interesting topic for emergency physicians and uh, let us hear from that. Can we have his video, please? Organizer for giving me this opportunity. I am Dr. Argo, consultant anesthesiologist and pain and palliative care physician. Ultrasound guided interventions for pain management can be done in acute as well as chronic pain management scenarios. Before we jump into the topic, let's check what are the prerequisites. First, consent. Informed consent to be taken after proper explanation of the procedure to the patient and their relatives. The pros and cons need to be discussed thoroughly before proceedings. Intravenous access to be done. Resuscitation drugs and equipment should be kept ready for emergency. Standard monitoring like blood pressure, pulse oximeter, ECG should be in place. These kinds of procedures can be done with local anesthetic like rupivacan or bupivacan. We prefer 0.2 to 0.5 percent of rupivacan simply because of its safer cardiac profile and large therapeutic windows. We typically use 5 to 10 centimeter B bevel stimulating needle. For intravenous sedation and anxiolysis, we use midazolam and fentanyl in sedative doses. First, a few words about ultrasound machine. We use linear or curvilinear probe. So we have to select probe first. Then we have to select the mode available in ultrasound machines. There are several modes like neuromuscular, vascular, abdomen, etc. We prefer nerve muscle type of mode. Linear probe has got a frequency of 3 to 12 megahertz and it is suitable for superficial structures. While curvilinear has a frequency of 2.5 to 7.5 megahertz and it is capable of scanning tissue in more deeper plane. There are short axis and long axis views and there are other probe like per vaginal probe, per rectal probe as well. We are not discussing it here. The views can be otherwise described in in plane view or out of plane view. When we use this probe, we can use it in a manner so that 
there are four cardinal movements of the frog one is translation second is angulation the third one is rotation and the fourth one is tilting we can use all these movements to proper visualization of our structures and this is the typical view you can see in a machine after you apply gel uh, to your probe now the second structure you you need to know is gain by adjusting gain you can change the screen resolution either by layer by layer like equalizer or as a whole here we are changing the gain layer by layer you can visualize as, as well as hear the doppler sounds and here you can see the calipers for measurement today we are going to describe some of these topics for different nerves plexus and fascial pain box the first one is brachial plexus block it can be done through various approaches indication is to produce analgesia in the lower part of arm and the whole forearm probe is to be placed just behind the clavicle parallel to it and the notch by the side of the probe is to accommodate the needle insertion and then you gradually rotate the probe slightly clockwise until you get this subclavian artery you can see at the center of the screen the subclavian artery by the side of the artery you will get the plexus that is the green area is brachial plexus below is the first rib and the pleural attachment to rib so that is your target area lateral side of the subclavian artery so next is suprascapular block suprascapular nerve block this block becomes handy in managing pain involving shoulder particularly the shoulder shoulder joint and tissues around it it can be blocked in two ways when you follow the tail of the brachial plexus we just shown there you find there is a small nerve there you can block there as well but you can block also in another way where the probe is placed above the scapular spine and you start scanning medial to lateral and you will find a notch and a angulation there and you can also find the suprascapular ligament the suprascapular nerve along with the suprascapular vessels are located there you have to put the needle lateral to the probe and place the drug around the nerve next is 
intercostal nerve block or intercostal block. There are several approaches for intercostal nerve block. In emergency, this is the most important block because you often get multiple refracture and flange chest patient. This is very useful in these kind of scenarios. Put the probe vertically on the back of the patient, one finger lateral to the midline and start scanning there. You can see some muscle layers there from above downwards. The above one is trapezius. The next one is rhomboids and followed by the erectus many group of muscles. And then you can slide the probe slightly more laterally and you will get these kinds of pictures. Here you can see at the center, there is a roundy structure, black structure, that is actually the shadow of the rib. And when it is these dome shaped structures is the dome of the uh, dome is becoming more flat then actually that is the transverse process so this is the above transverse process this is the lower on the right side there is a lower transverse process and in between that is the paravertebral space and you can see the vessels and nerve positions there this paravertebral space is actually continuous with the intercostal space. So when you put a large amount of local anesthetic like 10 to 15 ml of local anesthetic, it can cover actually the 3-4 intercostal area. The above are the attachments of intercostal muscle you can see and Below the more blackish area is the intercostal space and the highlighted area is the pleura. That is the pleura in the posterior axillary line. The probe position is similar in the vertical plane. But here the problem is that because of the scapula, you can see the only the 7th and onwards, downward space. That means 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th. Method. Here you can see the two ribs, similar structures, two ribs and the intercostal space in between and that is the intercostal space where you have to deposit drug. Next is erector spiny plane block. This block can provide unilateral analgesia to whole of the thorax and the abdomen. But here, first you have to identify the spine level. For that, follow the insertion of rhomboid muscle. The, this triangular, this is trapezius and this is rhomboid. And followed by, that is the erector spiny muscle. So here you can see these uh, rhomboids is at, more or less attached at the sixth thoracic vertebra. So that transverse process is T6. Now you can go upwards or downwards. The target plane here is more superficial. And you have to deposit a relatively larger volume, 20 to 30 ml of local anesthetic for one-sided block. And the target point here is between the periosteum and the erectospiny muscle. This plane will open up like a zip line as you inject a large volume. Coming to lumbar plexus block. This is a single technique by which you can block starting from the L1, L2 to L5, dermatome, myotome, and the nerves included are femoral, obturator, and lateral femoral cutaneous and related soft tissue structures and skin. Patient position is lateral decubitus and you put curvilinear probe on the flank. From there, you slowly move more on the posterior looking towards the lumbar spine. And there you can find this thing. This is called Samrock's view. 
that is the white line is the vertebral body and in from in front of that there is a aorta now the from the vertebral body you can see this is the transverse process and in front of the transverse process you can see the schwas shadow schwas muscle this is the schwas muscle and this lumbar plexus is actually embedded in this schwas muscle so you have to inject inside this plexus so needle will come from the behind yes from the behind and it is walking above or down the transverse process and that yellow dot is the nerve and you have to inject there sciatic nerve can be blocked at several levels here i shall show you how it is to be blocked in popliteal groove first identify the popliteal groove place the probe linear probe there and now you can identify the popliteal vessels popliteal vein and popliteal nerve the nerve is on the lateral side of the vein making nerve vein artery from lateral to medial orientation this block will cause analgesia at all aspects of the legs and foot except medial tibial portion supplied by the femoral uh, saphenous nerve branch of femoral nerve so that's all for today now you can ask any questions regarding this thank you Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Argya Mukherjee. We will uh, reserve the questions uh, uh, to the end of the session. Uh, that was a very good talk. A uh, lot of videos again showing us uh, the ultrasound guided uh, procedures, which is becoming very, very common now in emergency rooms. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Doctor, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Tausif Tangalwadi. Uh, Dr. Tausif is a former consultant and head of emergency medicine at Sundaram Medical Foundation, Chennai. Currently, he is the medical director at Noora AI enabled health screening at Bangalore, uh, Karnataka. So he has an interesting topic, which is tactical casualty combat care, uh, those guidelines. Tactical casualty combat care is a very well known uh, uh, workshop, which is there outside India. So let's see what uh, uh, this has. So over to you, Dr. Tausif. This will be a live event. Thank you, uh, Dr. Imran. It's a pleasure, as always, uh, seeing you, my good friend and brother in emergency medicine. It's been beautiful talks. So I must really commend uh, the people at Semicon 2022. The lectures have been fantastic. The topics have been uh, really chosen well. Uh, hopefully, I can also do justice in the 12 minutes that is allotted to me. Let me quickly try and share my screen. All right. I hope everyone can see this. Ah, there you go. So tactical combat casualty care is a topic given to me, and I must uh, thank Sudeep for bringing up such a wonderful topic. Uh, it's not something that we generally thankfully have to see, but in case we do, what do we do? That's the question. So war or conflict, yeah, the Afghan war, the Iraq war, Vietnam war, first Gulf war, Gaza death toll, India has had its Kargil war as well. All of this happen all around us, and they all come with a toll. The death toll has been very, very, very high across the world. And uh, luckily, as we've gone down the years, it has come down. We had 35 million people who lost their lives in you know, the uh, third Three Kingdoms War, World War, again around 35 million people. And then coming all the way down to, say, Germanic Wars, the Spanish conquest, all of that has reduced. So these are some of the wars with the annual death toll, which was the highest in the world. So a lot of people die in wars. Uh, luckily, as we have gone through the years, the number of people dying in wars has come down. As you see from 1946 to 2015, this has happened. People, less and lesser uh, people have died in wars, thankfully, or combat, as we call it. 
So again, another uh, you know statistic which is showing you the same thing. And uh, this is uh, what is happening now, though. After 9-11, people, number of people dying in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Pakistan even, has been high. So the world from going into a peace mode after 9-11 has gone into conflict mode again. But when we look at the US, they have definitely managed to reduce the number of casualties they face in war, irrespective of the conflict that is arising. So from the Spanish flu to the World War I and II, uh, of course, COVID-19 is right up there, but going down to Vietnam, Korean War, uh, Iraqi freedom, the Gulf War, all of this, the enduring freedom is in uh, Afghanistan, all of this, the number of American casualties have come down. So what is the US doing differently is the question. And that brings us to the question, are these deaths preventable? Probably yes, it's war. So yes, if you don't go to war, it will be definitely preventable. How did the US manage to reduce the number of casualties in this war? But most importantly, if you were recruited as an emergency physician in a conflict zone, would you know what to do? That's the most important question. And that's where we get to tactical combat casualty care. So let's talk about tactical combat casualty care. What is it? It's trauma life support and pre-hospital combat conditions. So you are in a war zone and you are the doctor on duty. There's fighting happening all around you. How do you pro provide trauma life support? And why? Because this reduces preventable deaths while maintaining operation success. Let's face it, the more number of soldiers who are not able to go back into the battle, the more, the more chances that the, the country that's losing those soldiers are going, is going to lose the war, or the team rather, let's not go into countries right now, they may lose the war, right? And who designed it? The United States military. So let's go back to a little bit of history about the tactical uh, combat uh, casualty care. It was first published in 1996 in a military medicine supplement. It was a joint uh, document by the United States Naval Special Warfare Com uh, Command and also the uh, Special Operations Medicine Group. And of course, they developed combat appropriate and evidence-based trauma care. So what is appropriate for war zones and what is the evidence that is stating it based on the patterns of previous conflicts is what they were saying. And this is continuously updated and published by the committee on TCC, that is tactical uh, combat casualty care. And they do it on a regular basis. And this comes under the Defense Health Authority. Now this currently is run by the Department of Defense of the United States, and it is conducted by the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians. So we are there, so we are there. We are running this course. It's good for us to know what to do, supposing one day, God forbid, we are in a war zone. So let's get down to business. What exactly is tactical combat casualty care? There are three objectives in tactical combat casualty care. The first one is to treat your injured combatants. So wherever you are, make sure your injured combatants are treated. The second, there should be no more casualties. No more people should die because of these injuries. And the third is make sure that the mission is a success. And that is why TCC is uh, TCCC is very, very important. I don't know how many Cs come there, okay? And there are three phases of care. Right? The first phase is care under fire. When you are actively facing bombardment with the bullets flying all around you, what are you going to do? Right? The second phase is tactical field care. So you said, okay, you've managed to get away from the firing zone, but you're still somewhere in the war zone. What, is the, what are the next steps that I must do? And then third is evac, right? So tactical evacuation care, what they call a stack evac. So when you are on a helicopter or, or a vehicle that's evacuating the, the injured person, what is the kind of care that you can give? So let's go one by one, care under fire. And you'd be surprised. The first thing here uh, that we have to do when we are under fire is to keep returning fire. Don't do anything else other than returning fire and ensuring that you don't get hurt further. If the person who's injured is also able to return the fire, continue to return the fire. The only intervention that you're allowed to do here is control life-threatening uh, hemorrhage. And then we can use tonicase here. So the uh, US Department of Defense says you must use tonicase early in this uh, situation. So this is probably the only situation where we use tonicase early rather than just give pressure. Okay, so that is that is the only intervention that you can do when you are under fire. Any other intervention must happen only after either enemy fire is suppressed or you move to a secure position. So that's a surprise. That's, that was the first time thing for me. So you don't treat. You just say control the hemorrhage and then keep giving, you know, returning back the fire, you know, keep shooting back at the enemy. Moving on to tactical field care. Now, once you've moved away from the scene of the crime or scene of wherever the conflict is happening, what can you do? Right, 
So this is care rendered by the first responders or pre-hospital medical care in the tactical zone. So wherever it's happening, but they're not under fire, but they're not at a hospital, what can they do? So we always know A, B, C, D. Here it's not A, B, C, D anymore. And very, uh, you know, typically and aptly for the army parlance, it is MARCH. We use the MARCH acronym. M stands for massive hemorrhage. In massive hemorrhage, you use your tourniquets, you use your hemostatic dressings, you use your junctional devices. If any of you doesn't, don't know about junctional devices, Google Jet. There's a nice video on YouTube, which, you can, which shows you where you can put a pelvic binder and then compress the femoral artery as well. Of course, you can use pressure dressings as well if there are people to hold it down. A stands for airway. So now here, here comes your A. So rapid and aggressive opening. You can use a cricothyroidotomy if you feel, you know, there's a lot of injury that's going on. If there's injury and not allowing you to get the airway, then yes, trike uh, early is important. R stands for respiration. So the B becomes R here. Here, the most important thing, it's trauma. So you recognize tension pneumothorax and try to do a needle decompression early. I think there's a movie called Three Kings, you know, Three Kings, I guess. Uh, so they do Mark, Mark Wahlberg has a, has a needle decompression done. I, I don't know how many of you have seen it. So you know, that's combat care. Then you come to circulation. So you do IV axis. Tranexamic acid early is very, very important. Fluid resuscitation. But here, blood and blood products are good. Crystalloids are bad. And if you don't have crystalloids, try and use, uh, sorry, if you don't have blood, try and use colloids. That's what uh, is recommended by the TCC, right? Uh, hypothermia prevention. So respect of the environment, keep your, uh, you know, casualty warm. That's what is recommended. So this is the MARCH acronym. Time's flying, so I'm going to quickly fly through the slides. Okay, so one, when you're done with the MARCH, you go on to continued assessment and management. And in this, there's a few things. You treat penetrating eye trauma, very, very important. You also assess for traumatic brain injury or head trauma. And then you treat burns, you splint any fractures that are out there. And then you also make sure you dress any non-life-threatening wounds. You've already dressed the life-threatening wound, you dress non-life-threatening wounds. So these are some of the other things that you can also do in tactical field care. But apart from this, you also have to do the following early and adequate analgesia. They usually use ketamine or oral transmucosal fentanyl is what the American military uses. Uh, you can then go on to early antibiotics, very, very important. So analgesia and antibiotics, the double A's for us. Reassess all your injuries and all the interventions that you've done and document the care that you've given because they're going to go somewhere else for definitive care. So you better write down what you have done. Then communicate with your tactical leadership and then package and evacuate the casualty. So that's very, very important. Then we go to your evacuation, your tachyvac. Now, tachyvac is very simple. You do the same thing that you were doing in tactical field care, but along with that, there can be some advanced procedures that is possible while evacuating. The problem, though, is not always you will have the facility to do these, right? Or you might not always have a medivac helicopter like in the US. You may have to do it on, on, in cars or you know, non-medical uh, vehicles as well. So that's very, very important. So this, in a nutshell, encapsulates tactical combat casualty care. But let's look at the advantages that it may give people. So there's clear leadership and guidance in really, really difficult circumstances. And then you also have synergy between medical and non-medical teams ongoing. And then you also have improved survival of casualties. And this can provide hope to a lot of countries and conflict zones, uh, definitely. What is the evidence? Uh, I'm going to show you only one research data from December 2011. Okay, this was done by uh, Kotwal et al. So they evaluated battlefield survival. They compared it with, you know, in, in the Afghan and Iran, uh, Iraq war is when they uh, did it, right? And they were made, they compared with Department of Defense data. And there were a total of 419 battle injury casualties. What I want you to see is this number. When TCC UC was used, there were only 10.7% killed in action depending, uh, uh, compared to the defense department rates of 16.4. And also the number of deaths came down drastically. So there's an absolute reduction of uh, risk reduction of four to 7%, which is fantastic, right? So that is one in favor of the TCC. So I just want to show you one evidence as well. So quickly, let's summarize up until my last two minutes. Uh, conflict zones are areas of highest impact for the practice of emergency medicine. I hope you'll all agree with that. Now, risk of deaths and casualties is exceptionally high and failure to respond leads to loss of life. And of course, the mission fails. The team that has more casualties is definitely going to lose. Whereas when you use TCCC, I think that's, that's enough C's, allows us to be combat ready and helps us to save lives. As emergency physicians, that's the highest place of practice or platform of practice for us. So replace ABCDE with March when you are in a combat zone. 
Okay, so where can I get more data? There's a website called deployedmedicine.com. And uh, there's a lot of these guidelines. That's a snapshot from the website as you get there. And you can also download the PDF on uh, TCC guidelines for medical personnel. I guess, okay, within 12 minutes that I've tried to complete. So thank you for the opportunity, Semicon 2022. And for all those who are listening, I hope that was a quick uh, nutshell or bird's eye view of uh, tactical combat casualty care. So many C's in it. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Imran, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Tosif. Uh, I know that tactical uh, casualty combat care requires airway as second. So hemorrhage control becomes first and airway is second in that. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll just uh, keep thank the Dr. questions Tosip. after this. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Tosip. Thank you very much for accepting the topic. Initially, when you distributed the topic, we are facing many difficulties in this topic. And I would like to thank you for accepting such a challenging topic and your presentation was excellent. It was excellent. Thank you, thank you Sarin. God Actually, bless. I also did not have an idea about how it is, what it is. Now I have an idea about it. It's a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. A pleasure as always. Yeah, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Indranil Das. Uh, I'm sorry, he is unwell, so he won't be able to join us. So we'll continue with our last speaker for this session on recent advances. Uh, this, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Sarvana Kumar. So Dr. Sarvana Kumar is a consult senior consultant and group head for emergency medicine at Mehta Hospital Chennai. He's the current unit head and general manager at Mehta's Hospital Chennai. And he is the National Secretary for the Society for Emergency Medicine India. So he'll be talking on a very important topic, communication in the emergency department and safety very good issues. Good all of you. Dear friends and colleagues, this is Dr. Sarvano Kumar, National Secretary for Society for Emergency Medicine India. And it's my pleasure to be here today with you all in this wonderful semicon event. I'm going to be talking about communication and safety and its medical legal implications in emergency department. There are multiple questions when it comes to medical legal issues in emergency department. For example, should I give a death certificate or not? Should I document DNR? Am I qualified enough to do a certain procedure in ED? Should I inform this particular thing to an attender or not? Should I treat this patient who is not paid? Should I continue to treat this patient who is not willing or the attender is not willing? How do I go about managing this child who is not accompanied by his parents? Should I reveal certain information to the police authorities? Am I breaching, breaching certain confidentiality? And how do I manage a sexual assault victims? There are multiple questions in our minds. And I congratulate the organizers of Semicon to include this topic as a part of the Semicon 2022, because this is what I call a learning which is not there in your textbooks. This is something which you are expected to practice day in and day out. Unfortunately, none of the books teach you about this. So that's the reason why Society for Emergency Medicine in India has come out with a program called Lawyer where we deal about all those questions in our mind in depth. And I'll talk about it a little later. But for today's talk, we're going to limiting ourselves to the importance of communication in an emergency department and also safety of patients in emergency department. <clears throat> and what is the medical legal implications of the same? So when we talk about communication in an emergency department, there are only four ways you're going to communicate. One is a oral communication with your patients. Number two is your documentation. Number three, which is your consent, is a bit more specialized form of communication. I'll talk about it a little later. And the fourth one is the privileged communication which you have with your patients, or it's a privileged relationship which you have with your patients. <clears throat> so let's deal about it one after the other. Clearly, when it comes to the proof of your oral communication, it is very clear. Documentation, in fact, a written documentation is a clear proof for your verbal communication. So let's be very clear. 
in a court of law for you to prove that you have communicated something with your patients a clear documentation is an absolute must so clearly we are not going to be focusing much on oral communications as you all know now that's not going to be valid in a court of law so let's quickly jump over to documentation so here is a question which comes to your mind when it comes to documentation should i treat the patient first or should i document first clearly this is settled very clearly in the court of law that in case of an emergency the treatment of the patient the resuscitation the first aid always takes priority before any sort of a documentation especially in an emergency department so you don't have to really worry that if a document is delayed is there going to be any implications of the same clearly not so this was well settled in the case paramanand patara versus union of india where the duty of every doctor in case of an emergency is clearly to provide the emergency care and that duty is clearly as per law is defined as total absolute and paramount it's very clearly defined order where every doctor be it from a private sector or from a public sector when he sees an emergency case he is supposed to provide emergency care which is his total absolute and paramount duty i'm going to take you through a short ed scenario to understand the importance of documentation especially in ed a 70 year old patient with shock in emergency room there was a cardiac arrest there was no return of spontaneous circulation clearly it's a failed uh, resuscitation effort the doctors tried their best unfortunately the patient didn't survive and attenders have raised a case in this particular incidents because so this is alchemist hospital where they said we didn't evidence any bill for atropine and we assume that's not used in resuscitation that's not documented anywhere so we assume the cpr or the resuscitation is not appropriate and they raised a negligent case against the emergency doctors interestingly in this case the doctors are found not guilty because clearly they have documented in the case sheet that acls protocol was followed during resuscitation and using atropine is a part of acls protocol so a mere miss entry or when they forgot to raise it in the bill it doesn't mean negligent so the courts have actually uh, said it's not negligent that's because the documentation was very very clear that an acls protocol was followed during resuscitation here is another case which i want to tell you guys as well this is a case of acute coronary syndrome it was a cardiac arrest and the doctors have tried resuscitating could not at the end of resuscitation once the patient was declared dead the case sheet was documented which i am sure most of us do routinely in our emergency department here the case was alleged such that the time of documentation on the time of death declared which we all know at the end of resuscitation you sit and write your notes we enter the time when you start your notes and clearly you also know the time of death it's almost very uh, similar to the same time we enter that and the attenders alleged that no resuscitation was carried out as you can see from the notes the time of notes entry and the time of declaration of death is same and the courts clearly ruled there is no negligence here in this praveen gandhi vs uh, singla case in 2014 the national consumer commission where the courts have clearly said it is only possible for the doctors to enter the notes after providing treatment and during such documentations they have entered the time of when they actually return those documents and time of death it doesn't mean that no resuscitation was provided and this documentation was done after providing first aid or after providing resuscitation which is the right thing to do so the doctors were held not negligent so clearly you can see from these two cases courts are also understanding and they also know in case of an emergency the patient takes priority sometimes we do miss writing certain notes we do delay writing certain notes so it doesn't mean but that we can avoid these notes completely but however please ensure that whenever you complete your resuscitation you put your notes immediately 
So this is what I wanted to re-emphasize when it comes to documentation in ED. The documentation can follow management. Courts are generally lenient on formalities, but never on management. And emergency treatment is absolute and paramount. So coming to the privilege communication here, I want to discuss a case with you. Assuming this is a case which was brought to the emergency department with fever for evaluation. And as a part of evaluation, you have found out that the patient is HIV positive through your test. The fiancé who is accompanying the patient wants to know the report. The question here is, can we disclose this or not? Here you may think about privileged communication. This was an exact similar case in Mr. X versus Hospital Z. Whether to disclose certain information to the wife or parents or relatives. <clears throat> Not so much parents, but clearly yeah, in certain cases, yes. And here the doctor actually went ahead and disclosed the HIV status to the fiancé and because of which the marriage got called off. And now the patient has raised a complaint saying the doctor has actually breached his responsibility because this was supposed to be a privileged information which only he is supposed to know and now he has disclosed that and because of which his marriage is now stopped. The courts clearly opine that any communication which may harm others or in other terms any information which has an implication of the close relative the doctor is free to disclose. So the doctor was held not negligent. As the courts have opined, right to privacy is not absolute. Lawfully restricted for prevention of crime, disorder, or protection of health or morals, or rights and freedom of others. In this particular case, if the doctor has not disclosed, there is highly likely the fiancé uh, would have contracted HIV. So that's a reason why the doctor disclosed the information. And clearly courts have not held the doctor responsible for the same. So we need to understand when we shall disclose information. You can disclose any information with consent. Whenever there is a court investigation, whenever there are other doctors involved in the care where you want to share certain information for clinical diagnosis and proceeding, it's a legal duty to disclose if it's a notifiable communicable disease or in case of an MLC if the court asks for it. For research and education purposes, you can disclose this information, but without revealing any identity which might lead back to the patient or with consent. For example, a photograph, but covering the face is completely allowed or with the consent. And obviously with insurance companies. And when it comes to HIV information, it's very clearly settled that it's up to the doctor's discretion. So let's quickly move on to the next form of communication, which is consent and emergency. As we all saw through permanent Katara, which is your Union of Indian case, consent uh, is necessary, but clearly the treatment for emergency patients is much more important than the consent. The doctor is duty bound in case of an emergency, and no formalities, including consent, is necessary if it interferes with the first aid or management. So clearly, in case of a life-threatening emergency, you can proceed by treating the patient first, even without a consent. Let's be very, very clear. This is in case of an emergency in a life-threatening situation, you can proceed treating without a consent. It's been well settled in many cases as well. One good example is Thomas versus Elisa case, where the doctor said, we didn't operate in appendicitis, for example, because the patient has not given consent, but the courts have actually ruled doctors negligent because a burst appendix is actually an emergency where patients need not, or where doctor need not take and consent to operate to save a life. So let's quickly move on to some of the issues with regards to patient safety during emergency. We all know any patient being transferred internally or externally, example by an ambulance specifically, needs to be accompanied. This is one interesting case uh, in Tamil Nadu, Dr. Sakti Vises, Krishna, 2012. This was a critical patient who needs transfer to another hospital. Unfortunately, there was no ambulance available. The doctor has sent the patient by ambulance, sorry, by a taxi. He didn't write any transfer notes. It was a dire emergency. And the doctor, in fact, accompanied a doctor, in fact, went in his own car um, behind the taxi till the patient reached the other hospital. So uh, the attenders alleged negligence here, saying the patient should have been shifted by ambulance and there is no notes. So no treatment was provided. Interestingly, 
courts have ruled out that it's not negligent because at least here the intent to see that patient reaches safely to another hospital is there because the doctor has accompanied or in fact went in another car behind and unfortunately he didn't did, he didn't get an ambulance and there was no time to write a transfer notes because it was an emergency and this was not something which you can handle in that particular situation or a hospital so he has taken his best efforts at that point in time to the move the patient to a better hospital so clearly you can see there's an intent of the doctor to provide the best possible care at that point in time and in this situation the best possible way is to move him to the best hospital and he also tried his best to accompany so that there's no untoward incidents on the way which proves that he is for the patient and he wants to treat the patient so the doctor was held not negligent so these are one of cases where i'm trying to tell you that when it comes to emergency the courts are extremely lenient because they know it's not going to be state forward and you cannot expect a state consent or a documentation so this is another patient look at this scenario so you have a case of rta head injury pneumothorax uh, you have diagnosed intubated treated unfortunately the patient dies and post mortem reveals a shattered liver you have missed a case of blunt abdominal injury in an emergency situation what do you think are we liable for the same it was again well settled in many cases that error of judgment is not negligence more the emergency the more the possibility of error only reckless disregard to the patient's interest and greater deviation from the accepted practice constitutes negligence so in case of an emergency error of judgments do happen we might misdiagnose but that's not considered negligence so what do you infer from all this information i have given you so far is generally courts are much more lenient when it comes to emergency situations but clearly it does not mean that we take it for granted we still need to get a consent until unless it's a dire emergency where you are not able to get a consent please proceed and you do have to document but that's after you provide appropriate emergency care so in summary emergency treatment is much more important than documentation of course documentation is also important but after emergency care your proof of communication is only documentation document once the emergency is being managed clearly more than the consent the life saving act is much more important so you have acted in the interest of the patient to save the life without a consent you are spared but if you have waited delayed treatment because you didn't get a consent then the courts might consider that as a negligence privileged information kindly think before you disclose there are certain informations and in certain situations you can disclose and always provide first aid before safe transfer of these patients i think with this briefly we have touched about the communication part and safety part in the given time but clearly this is a huge area or a subject of interest to many of us so what i suggest or request or recommend is clearly all the residents like you have to undergo this training program in law er so that you can understand these case laws much more in deeper and also the logic behind any of these uh, decisions and judgments and also there are many many areas in emergency department we face when it comes to medical legal issues this particular course will give you a detailed uh, knowledge on the same with this let me stop my lecture and best wishes to all of you thank you so much Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sarvana, for that uh, excellent talk on medical legal issues. It is strongly recommended to learn about medical legal issues in the emergency and also to do the lawyer course. So this brings us to the end of the recent advances session, and we will immediately start the next session on trauma as we do not have any time for uh, discussions. So the next speaker, uh, uh, the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Mabel Vasnayak. So Dr. Mabel Vasnak is a senior consultant and head of emergency medicine at uh, Manipal Hospitals, Bangalore. She is the past national president of the Society for Emergency Medicine India. And she is uh, the former head of emergency department at St. John's Hospital in Bangalore. So her talk is on pathophysiology of hemorrhagic shock and the role of permissive hypotension. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Mabel Vasnak.
Uh, do we have a video? Good morning. For the next 10 to 12 minutes, we talk about the pathophysiology of hemorrhagic shock and the role of permissive hypertension. Now, hemorrhagic trauma is what we commonly see in our emergency departments. So, um, let's start with the case. This is 24, five year old pedestrian who was knocked down by a four wheeler, conscious, writhing in pain. Abdomen was distending and swelling in the right thighs. So what is your diagnosis? I'm sure you all will all say it's hemorrhagic shock. Yes, it's trauma with hemorrhagic shock. So what happens in hemorrhagic shock? In hemorrhagic shock, there is bleeding, right? So because there is bleeding, there is hypotension. There is reduction in tissue perfusion below that necessary to meet metabolic needs. And what does that lead to? Inadequate perfusion causes an oxygen debt. And that leads to all the problems that we see due to hypertension and in trauma. Okay. So my topic is hemorrhagic, is uh, pathophysiology of hemorrhagic shock, which I'll deal with in brief. And then I'll go on to permissive hypertension. Okay. So um, we all know the cardiac output is heart rate into stroke volume. And the, so the stroke volume is dependent on the preload, myocardial contractility, and the afterload. And that determines the cardiac output by and large. Now, in hemorrhagic shock, the thing that is affected most is preload. Okay? So, if you look at the hemodynamic profile of hemorrhagic shock, the preload is decreased, and the afterload, which is the resistance, is increased. But the contractility, the oxygen delivery, and the systemic oxygen consumption are all increased and you have the oxygen balance, which is decreased, okay? Oxygen delivery, contractility are all decreased. The oxygen consumption is increased and the oxygen balance is decreased, okay? So what happens in response to this hypotension? And in uh, the baroreceptor reflex comes into play and the, detect the, the baroreceptors will detect changes in the arterial pressure so because of that, the brain, the medulla will then react and you have the heart rate, which is adjusted and you see tachycardia. And that is why you have tachycardia, which is the first manifestation of hypotension in a trauma patient. So before there's actually hypotension, there will be tachycardia. Now, the main aim is to increase shunting of blood to the heart and the brain. So what happens? There is a progressive vasoconstriction of the skin, the muscle and the splanchnic bed. So as long as possible, the body would like to maintain adequate perfusion to the heart and the brain. Now, what are the parameters that we have to measure shock? The first is we need to measure preload. So we have the CVP, which is which would take long to insert. So right now with point of care ultrasound, we can see the IVC, see the IVC is collapsing. And uh, you, what is important is also the preload, not only knowing what the preload is, but the preload responsiveness guides fluid therapy. So as your IVC keeps filling up, you know whether you have to give fluids or not. Then you have the afterload, which is the BP and the mean arterial pressure. And what is mean arterial pressure? It's the diastolic blood pressure plus one third systole minus diastole. And the contractility is the cardiac index or stroke volume. And how do you measure that? The cardiac index is the stroke volume into heart rate over body surface area in meters square and it's generally 2.2 into 2.5 liters per minute per meter square and the monitor will measure it in shock this if the stroke volume if, is if the cardiac index is less than 1.8 then you can say the patient is in shock however if you're already given the person inotropes then if the uh, cardiac index is less than 2.2 then you say the person is in shock now, what are the common clinical indicators to tell you that there's decreased organ perfusion? Simple things like urine output, if it's less than 0.5 ml per kg body weight per hour, change in mental status and tachypnea. So, how do you measure tissue perfusion? The first is oxygen delivery, which is the cardiac output into the oxygen saturation into your hemoglobin grams per liter, okay, into 100. So, more than 600, you have better outcomes. Normal venous saturation is 65 to 75. It's more than 80 in the presence of flow, of flow delivery. And that indicates tissue inability to utilize oxygen. 
early correction. So you need to correct your venous saturation. Early correction has a better outcome. And the oxygen debt that we talked about earlier is due to an imbalance between the supply and the demand. Now, lactate levels as well as base deficit are very important to determine and to quantify the shock. So lactate is actually an indirect measure of oxygen debt and the normal value is anywhere between one to four. Now, if the value is more than one, as it increases, it correlates with the magnitude of shock and lactate levels more than five tell you there's this increased mortality. Now, what's important is if the body's able to clear lactate within 12 hours, that's good. But if the body is not able to clear lactate within 12 hours, it's predictive of multi-system organ failure. And if the body is not able to clear the lactate within 24 hours, then that is a predictor of survival. Okay. So basically, here's your, then the next thing is base deficit, which is a very sensitive measure of inadequate perfusion. A normal range is minus three to plus three. It correlates with the blood loss. And if you have a worsening base deficit, you know that there's ongoing bleeding and the volume replacement that you've given is inadequate. So, as the base deficit increases, your mortality also increases. Now, shock index is important, which, which is a bedside measure. It is heart rate over systolic BP, normal is 0.5 to 0.7. If it's more than one, you have volume loss and left ventricular dysfunction, and there's higher mortality as the shock index increases. Now, what is the cellular response to shock? So when there is blood loss, you, you know that you have an inadequate perfusion, which leads to cellular hypoxia. Initially, you have aerobic metabolism, but that aerobic metabolism in the presence of inadequate perfusion will then become anaerobic metabolism. You have lactic acid production, cellular edema, acidosis. Okay, so this is your cellular response to shock. Now, what are the evolving treatment concepts in hemorrhagic shock? In hemorrhagic shock, you have this triangle which is hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. That is called the triad or the trauma death triad. Okay. So hypothermia is defined as core temperature less than 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And what does it do? It decreases the coagulation factors and it increases your platelet dysfunction. Okay. So moderate to severe hypothermia occurs in less than 10% of trauma. Now acidosis is an Second is acidosis. Now, acidosis is an ongoing marker of severe physiological derangement. So what do you get with acidosis? You have a decreased cardiac contractility, decreased cardiac output, vasodilatation, decreased blood pressure, decreased hepatic and renal blood flow, altered hemostasis, and myocardial depression. So it correlates with the depth of shock and the degree of tissue injury. So that's the second part of the triad. And the third is coagulopathy. In trauma, coagulopathy starts early. Studies have shown that nearly one third trauma patients are coagulopathic on arrival itself. Okay. So, in a trauma patient, if the value is more than 1.5, you can assume that the patient is coagulopathic. So, it's a current treatment approach in traumatic bleeding. Again, you address each of those three parameters. So, acidosis, you correct with fluids, hypothermia, you correct using warm IV fluids and warm covers, and coagulopathy has to be corrected using cryoprecipitates platelets. FFPs and RBCs. There's no role for whole blood, but only blood confidence. Okay. So, um, yeah. So this, in it looks like a busy slide, but I'll quickly go through it. This is the trauma coagulopathy theory. Okay. So when there is hemorrhage due to trauma, you have shock. So trauma itself will cause inflammation and it's more with someone with pre-existing diseases. Then as you resuscitate a patient who's having hemorrhage, you will cause dilution, you will cause hypothermia will be caused, shock leads to acidosis, fibrinolysis, activation of coagulation factors, factor consumption, and then you get the acute coagulopathy of trauma and shock. Okay. So uh, the next part I told you, I'll have to I'll be speaking about permissive hypotension. So it's also, so there's something called damage control resuscitation which consists of permissive hypertension, hemostatic resuscitation, damage control surgery. I'll only be talking about permissive hypertension. Now, what's permissive hypertension? It is restricted fluid administration to avoid popping the clot. What do I mean by popping the clot? See, when a patient has bled, you assume that there is some clot formation. 
So if you give increased fluids and increase the blood pressure, whatever clot has formed will be popped. So that's um, so what does perm what do you do when you say permissive hypotension? You accept a limited period that is around less than two hours of suboptimal end organ perfusion to achieve hemostasis. In that time, you would stop the bleeding and achieve hemostasis. And you titrate this hypotension to the mean arterial pressure. Okay, so um, there was a start, there was in uh, 2000, in that is last year, in uh, 2021, there was this um, study that was done, which analyzed, it was a review that was done, a review of all the studies done for, uh, to study uh, permissive hypertension. And what did they find? So they found, they, they studied, uh, I mean, they reviewed the multiple studies and they found that there, the key to hypertensive desuscitation is providing sufficient fluid to prevent cardiovascular collapse and to perfuse organs. So you don't want cardiovascular collapse. You want the organs to be perfused, but you give only enough fluids to keep your MAP in control. Okay. So you don't give increasing amounts that would cause an increasing bleeding and wash out the clots. So what does permissive hypertension do? It limits blood loss while maintaining adequate perfusion. And they found that it positively impacts outcomes in actively hemorrhagic patients. So they found that the benefits, that it had benefits. The benefits were that it was safe. It had a decreased mortality rate when compared to normal tens of resuscitation in hemorrhagic shock. And they also found that there's decreased blood loss, hemodi decreased hemodilution, ischemia, and hypoxia in tissues if you use this permissive hypotension. Now, your mean, the mean arterial pressure of 50 to 60 was taken as a resuscitation target. They've said, the study said that below uh, this fatal hypoperfusion below 50 and you pop the clot above 60. So 50 to 60 was taken as the target. Now, a few of the studies that were reviewed, I'll just go through in brief. And one was this study by Bickel um, who found that if the EMS gave fluids, there was a 60% survival, whereas with no fluids, there was a 70% survival. And uh, this study, the same Bickel study, was more specific because it only included patients with traumatic torso injuries. So they compared comparable populations. Uh, they found that delayed resuscitation had an increased survival rate and decreased length of hospitalization. And it was suggested that aggressive fluids before surgical intervention and hemorrhage control would increase blood loss and disrupt clots. And that they, therefore, they felt that permissive hypertension was the way to go. Now, um, there was another study done by Morrison, which was done in the operation theater, where there were two arms. One had a map of 50 and the other arm had a map of 65. And their results also that said that hypertensive resuscitation is safe. And they found that one of the main differences between hypertensive resuscitation and normal intensive resuscitation was the coagulopathy, decrease in the coagulopathy. And, um, and they also found that the number of deaths due to coagulopathy bleeding in the first 24 hours after injury was significantly lower in the hypertensive group. Now, coming to geriatric patients and patients with traumatic brain injury, it has both geriatric and traumatic brain injury patients known to be at a greater risk due to hypertension, from periods of hypertension, blood loss, and long resuscitations. So, application of permissive hypertension is not recommended in these populations at this time. Now, so to summarize, the goal of permissive hypertension is defined as a map below normal, that, and it is to decrease blood loss, prevent disruption of formed clots, and decrease deep bleed injuries, it involves a decreased fluid administration while still maintaining tissue oxygenation. Metabolic complications are found to be limited. And resuscitation strategies are a, have to be a balancing act. They are a balancing act between limiting hypotensive shock while preventing additional bleeding with an increase in blood pressure. Okay? So to conclude, you have to assess for coagulopathy early, small volume resuscitation techniques, correct acidosis and hypothermia, and stop the bleeding. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, Imran, can I say a few words? 
Yeah, please. Okay. So that was about um, uh, permissive hypertension and uh, pathophysiology of hemorrhagic shock. If you'll have any um, questions, I guess if Imran gives us time for questions, I'll take that later. Yeah, so just that's it. Yeah, thank you Thanks so much, yeah. Dr. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Dr. Mabel. Yeah, that was a very, very good talk on balanced resuscitation, which we must all follow. Uh, let's move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Kushro Bhajan. Dr. Kushro Bhajan is a senior consultant and head of emergency uh, department uh, at PD Hinduja Hospitals, Mumbai. Uh, he is the past president of the Maharashtra State Chapter for the Society for uh, Emergency Medicine India. Uh, and he'll be talking on management of shock in trauma. So over to you, Dr. Kushra. Thank you so much, Imran. I'll just uh, start my screen sharing. Congrats to the Semicon for arranging such a lovely conference and uh, thanks Mabel for making uh, shock understood uh, in a much better way. Uh, I will take the next 10-12 minutes in understanding the management of shock and trauma because you've now understood the pathophysiology so beautifully. I'd always like to start with a wise quote, an unacknowledged trauma is like a wound that never heals over and may start to bleed again at any time. And this is so true in management of trauma. And therefore, we always need to search for and stop the hidden bleeding because we would have lots of distracting injuries in a trauma patient. My objective, though it looks long, I'll try to finish on time, is hemorrhagic shock, grades of shock and its clinical implications, the blood pressure, what happens to it in hemorrhagic shock, the SSR, a term which I just coined, which is search, stop and resuscitate, in trauma shock, which would include EFAST, X-ray, CT scans. Uh, I'll talk about fluids and blood uh, transfusions and hypotensive resuscitation, which has been already spoken beautifully about, the MTP, the DCR, the lethal triad, and then finally the slide on non-hemorrhagic shock. We know that the golden hour came by Adam Cowley, and the two main uh, conditions which kill somebody in trauma is airway control, uh, and also shock. And therefore, I will start with two big sentences which are very important. Trauma shock is always hemorrhagic shock unless proven otherwise. And the SSR, that is search, stop and resuscitate, is a very good approach to manage trauma shock. Coming to circulation, we use very nice uh, 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 upbeat uh, sentences and that is one on the floor, four more. So if you see blood on the floor, we know that there are four hidden sites in which a patient can exsanguinate while bleeding in trauma. And you can lose up to two liters in a unilateral hemothorax, up to four to five liters in a hemoperitoneum, up to 1.5 to two liters in a pelvic fracture, and almost up to one, one and a half liters in long bone injury. The classification of hemorrhagic shock has also been evolved in the newer update. And earlier, as you can see in the light pink, we have been having classes of 1 to 4 from 15% blood loss to 30% to 40% and above 40% where the patient would probably die. So we, they have been including heart rate, blood pressure, pulse pressure, respiratory rate and urine output. But the newer one is more clinical oriented and that is looking at the mentation of the person, the Glasgow coma scale, the base deficit and most importantly, the need for blood products. So in class one, we would only monitor and probably give some fluid. In class two, we would be possibly giving a blood transfusion. In class three, definitely. And in class four, we would need a massive transfusion protocol. And why is it so important to understand and classify shock? Because in grade one or class one and two, it may not be very easy for us to understand and identify shock. And then it would be too late by the time we diagnose it in three and four. Also, classification of shock has an impact on mortality and management. So in class one to class four, as you can see, the mortality can increase from 7% to 51% and the need for blood transfusions from, can go up from as low as one to two units to almost 20 units in class four. 
what happens to the blood pressure this is a very common question we should all know and the first answer we get is blood pressure drops but that's not the right answer initially the diastolic blood pressure is the first to rise narrowing the pulse pressure the initial systolic blood pressure may be high and then finally when the class 3 post shock sets in you may have hypotension coming to the search and we need to understand that we have two or three things as adjunct in our armamentarium you can do an x ray where you can see a hemothorax here never do an x ray to diagnose tension pneumothorax which is clinical diagnosis and you can also do a pelvic x ray to know this as an open book fracture you can do a fast examination which is a four quadrant examination in the right upper quadrant between the liver and kidney left upper quadrant between the spleen and kidney and the pericardial would be the areas which we would look for we can even take a probe upwards and look at an e fast which would tell us a massive hemothorax or even a tension pneumothorax which is a non bleeding uh, condition the next step as i said would be stop so no point in just searching but we need to plug it and therefore if you have a tension pneumothorax or you have a massive hemothorax we are talking of bleeding so a massive neurothorax would warrant an ic if there is a cardiac tamponade and a hemothorax we might want to do a resuscitative emergency thoracotomy for victims with penetrating trauma and those who present with a pulseless electrical activity as regards the abdomen if the fast is positive we will have to send the patient to the or or the ot uh, or the uh, cat scan depending upon the stability of the patient an unstable patient will always go to the or and never to the cat scan in cases of pelvic bleeding we would first reduce the bleeding by doing an early pelvic binder and all this bleeding happens in the retroperitoneum and therefore a fast will not pick this up but we would need a ct scan and finally an angiographic embolization or a direct surgical control is needed to stop these types of internal bleeding coming to resuscitation which everyone loves to want uh, to know and that is a normal dictum again of giving 1 liter of warm crystalloid and that could be normal saline or ingers lactate there is newer evidence in the last 5 7 years where this warm crystalloid is probably replaced by warm balanced fluid and that can be one topic of discussion again once we've done our initial resuscitation later on we could use albumin also but there is very little evidence to prove that and we might use hypertonic saline in traumatic brain injury once we see a patient with trauma and we want to resuscitate them we must put two large 18 gauge peripheral accesses once the line is in we must always collect blood immediately for blood group cross match hemoglobin uh, coagulopathy maybe even a tick early resuscitation with blood and blood products is recommended now especially in class 3 and 4 shock and that would definitely reduce the chances of dilutional coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia which we would be probably causing by giving excessive iv fluids and not blood so the earlier dictum of 2 liters of warm crystalloid has now been taken over by 1 liter of warm crystalloid and as i mentioned if there is a massive transfusion protocol then we might want to follow the 1 is to 1 is to 1 protocol and i'll touch upon that in a bit once we have given 1 liter of warm crystalloid or balanced fluid we must look at the three types of responses one is a rapid responder who will sustain the response or a transient responder who will Im initially improve but later become uh, again hypotensive and tachycardic and then there is a non responder so obviously depending upon the response we would understand how much the bleeding is and sometimes in a non responder it might even prompt you to looking at the non hemorrhagic causes of shock which i again will touch upon towards the end hypotensive resuscitation i'm not going to talk about but mabel has beautifully explained that and the question always asked here is are victims of bleeding victimized by attempts of fluid resuscitation and yes uh, if we give too much fluids we maintain organ perfusion uh, by fluid resuscitation <coughs> excuse me but by hypotensive resuscitation we are decreasing the risk of re bleeding and popping the clot
massive transfusion protocol, the newer definition is that if one needs 10 units of blood transfusions or PRBCs within 24 hours or more than four units in the first one hour, then that would warrant a massive blood transfusion. In pediatrics, it's a little different and there are various definitions for that. What is important is not only go by the definition, but understand which patient would need a massive transfusion protocol. MTP can never be done without a damage control resuscitation. And this is a nice chart which I have written, uh, shown in one of my uh, uh, chapters, which I've written in a book. And here you need to do monitoring, you need to do antifibrinolytics, you need to do a transfusion therapy of 1 is to 1 is to 1, which is an RBC to FFP to platelet ratio. And we need a surgical anatomical control. VHA basically stands for Vistoelastic Hemostatic Assay, which is nothing but the text. And this slide has again been shown where damage control resuscitation has three components, permissive hypotension, hemostatic resuscitation, and damage control surgeon. I would take you to two good articles, that is the prompt and the proper, and these have shown that the mortality decreases if we actually do the one is to one is to one protocol. And then the CRASH-2 trial should also be mentioned where the mortality decreases if we have given one gram over 10 minutes of tranexamic acid given within the three hours of injury and repeat one gram over eight hours in the hospital setting, three doses in 24 hours. TEG is always very useful if available and it will actually tell you which are the components which need to be replaced and it is extremely useful because it not only gives you the R time, the K time, but it tells you what should be given at what time and what products are needed. And we cannot complete our talk without talking about the lethal triad, which again has been spoken about, and there is 90 to 95 percent mortality if there is acidosis, coagulopathy, and hypothermia. And my last slide here, which would be that we always, always should, though we know that hemorrhagic shock is always to be considered in trauma unless proven otherwise, we have to keep our eyes and mind open for any non-hemorrhagic shock which would complicate the issue and that is a tension pneumothorax where we would need uh, intercostal drain finally and a cardiac tamponade where we might need a pericardial drain or even a, a thoracotomy and a neurogenic shock where there will be bradycardia and this can occur with any head injury or spinal cord injury and here we need to use vasopressors very aggressively and early and then septic shock which might develop a few days later. This is a age old uh, diagram or a protocol and you may follow any protocol or device one for your patient but remember you need to individualize. But this highlights the difference between a traumatic brain injury and a non-traumatic brain injury and here you can see that without traumatic brain injury, we need to keep a systolic blood pressure between 80 to 90. But if there is traumatic brain injury, for obvious reasons, we need to keep it above 120. Also, side by side, as mentioned earlier, we, besides giving fluid resuscitation, we need to do a coagulation management along with the one is to one is to one or even another protocol, uh, treat and prevent the acidosis, prevent hypothermia, and use tranomyxic acid judiciously. So my take to home, I don't like taking messages home. So I will take these messages to my ER or EMS. Time is life. Trauma shock is always hemorrhagic unless proven otherwise. Circulation with hemorrhage control is the dictum. Avoid hyper resuscitation. One liter is now better than two liters. And the answer here is less is more. Avoid the lethal triad of hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy may consider the use of tranomyxic acid in hemorrhagic shock, the three to three rule. Uh, you give one gram three times and within the three hours of the trauma after controlling the bleeding and the MPP and DCR should be instituted early whenever required and appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kushrovizan, for that uh, excellent talk. Again, you're highlighting the need for balanced uh, resuscitation. So uh, those were very good take-home points. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So shall we move on to the next speaker? Uh,
the next speaker is dr devendra uh, dr devendra richarya dr devendra is a consultant and head of emergency medicine at reliance industries uh, limited he is the editor in chief of the textbook of emergency medicine including intensive care and trauma and he has uh, written two editions of that textbook so dr devendra will be talking on uh, trauma in pregnancy so over to you dr devendra good morning everyone uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh, on this forum for the topic trauma in pregnancy uh, with this presentation you will be able to cover the chapter trauma in pregnancy chapter resuscitation in pregnant women and from the textbook of emergency medicine second edition 2022 which is going to release soon next month pregnant trauma patient present to ed are few but why we are discussing it here because of it is associated with the high morbidity and mortality all women of child bearing age after the trauma must be considered pregnant until proven otherwise it is a challenging situation because of complex pathophysiology of the pregnancy and dealing with two patient mother as well as fetus er physicians should have sound knowledge of the anatomical and physiological changes that is happening during the pregnancy and they should be also anticipate the potential injury pattern which is occurs in the pregnancy this must involve the trauma team in the emergency medicine specialist obstetrics and neonatologist during the management of the trauma uh, pregnant patient as far as etiology is concerned the trauma is the leading cause of non obstetrical uh, maternal mortality and approximately 7% of all pregnancy more often in the third trimester and most frequently this is caused by the domestic violence and the traffic accidents other form the injury which happen uh, during the pregnancy is penetrating injury slip falls burning unintentional poisoning suicide and the homicide the first we will uh, go through the pathophysiology which is the uterus is the main intrapelvic uh, remain intrapelvic up to the 12 week of the pregnancy then it starts enter the abdomen reaches the umbilicus by the 20 weeks and it touches the costal margin by the 34 to 36 week as you can see in the left side of the picture and because of its anterior position of the size the uterus is the most frequently injured organ in the blunt trauma abdomen the whole blood volume of the mother passes through the uterus every 10 minutes but during the maternal shock the blood flow is redirected to the maternal central circulation away from the uterus and this can lead to the fetal distress while the mother remain in the compensated shock with no obvious vital sign in the derangement the anatomical and the physiological changes knowledge it is essential for the emergency physician the knowledge of physiological and anatomic changes in the pregnancy and their clinical impact on symptoms and manifestation of the traumatic injury are important in the management on the right side of the table uh, you can see there are various changes as well as in the airway breathing and the circulation during the pregnancy uh, the most important is uh, the cardiovascular uh, system the supine position of the pregnant uh, trauma patient increases the risk of inferior vena cava compression so that 20 to 30% reduction in the cardiac output and this compression and this changes disappears on the compression with the tilt of about the 50 15 to 30 degree of the right side there are various clinical presentation of the different time of the trauma the blunt trauma of the uh, is the most common cause of the injury either due to the domestic violence or due to the motor vehicle crashes so complication can include uterine rupture uterine contraction premature delivery placental abruption which is the most common cause of the fetal loss from the blunt trauma fetal maternal hemorrhage and direct fetal injury as well the penetrating injuries carries the high risk of fetal mortality than the blunt trauma and most stab wounds require extensive exploration the domestic violence is the most common type of trauma to the pregnant woman 
and domestic violence should be considered in any injury in the pregnant woman and each emergency department should have written protocol for the sexual abuse assessment though the burns are rare in severe burn both the mother and fetus are at risk of insensible fetal loss hypoxia and the sepsis so in case of the uh, uh, over the 60% of the mother's total body surface area cesarean section should be considered as soon as possible falls with the progression of the pregnancy the increased joint elasticity and weight gain in the pregnancy may contribute to the balance problem and falls occur mostly in the uh, third term trimester and preterm labor placental abruption fetal distress fetal hypoxia uterine rupture or even fetal death in pregnant women can occur let's come to the evaluation in the management of pregnant trauma patient the priority must be uh, on the mother so fetal evaluation should be done after the primary survey of the mother is completed conditions such as placental abruption fetal trauma fetal maternal hemorrhage rs uh, rh iso immunization and preterm labor should be evaluated employing a multidisciplinary approach that include a trauma surgeon obstetrician and neonatologist may be beneficial let's come to the abc the airway the risk of aspiration is uh, are higher because of laryngeal edema mucosal congestion and decreased airway diameter so uh, uh, this has to be taken care of and oxygen saturation should be kept 95% and because of the elevation of the diaphragm if it is needed uh, the chest tube insertion should be done above 1 to 2 intercostal space higher than the typical fifth intercostal space uh, maternal hypo hypotension should be treated aggressively and with the crystalloid fluid blood product and if massive transfusion uh, transfusion is required then always consider 1 is to 1 is to 1 formula use of vasopressor is discouraged in the resuscitation because they reduce the fetal uh, blood flow and tranexamic acid is safe for the fetus in the um, severe mortality uh, severe bleeding uh, the uterus should be positioned to the left side either manually or providing a 15 to 30 degree uh, tilt to the right side of the patient uh, the it is already explained uh, it causes uh, it relieve the pressure on the inferior vena cava uh, card, whenever there is a cardiopulmonary resuscitation is required pregnant cardiac arrest can require a multidisciplinary approach chest compression ventilation defibrillation technique are unchanged cardioversion is considered safe in pregnancy the obstetric and neonatal team should be involved in if possible and if the gestational age is over 20 week the uterus should be positioned to the left side uh, resuscitative hysterectomy in over 20 to 24 week of the gestation in the cardiac arrest so suppose if the spontaneous circulation of the pregnant cannot be achieved within the 4 minute the newborn should be delivered by the cesarean uh, within the next minute so within 5 minute of the cardiac arrest the delivery should be done with the resuscitative hysterectomy the cardiopulmonary resuscitation should not be uh, hampered and it should be continued without the interruption the chances of spontaneous circulation increases when blood flow is redistributed centrally to the mother away from the fetus therefore early resuscitative hysterectomy is recommended to increase the survival of both the mother and the fetus let's come to the secondary survey once patient is stabilized then head to toe secondary survey should be conducted and various uh, questions should be asked uh, pertaining to the history the Uh, code should be questioned like uh, complication of the pregnancy obstetric history dating method uh, estimated due date and event details various physical examination should be done like uh, vaginal examination should be included laboratory test ultrasound ct mri should be performed let's come to the fetal monitoring which is called the cardio tocographic monitoring ctm the pregnant patient should be observed in emergency and fetal monitoring is beneficial under the multidisciplinary team in the observation unit 
this may require the admission for for the prolonged observation and during this observation any vaginal bleeding uterine tenderness or contraction should be noted these finding may be adversely affect the pregnancy cardio tocographic monitoring should be started soon after the trauma to the pregnant and it should be uh, done minimum of the 6 hours the monitoring parameter should include fetal heart rate vaginal bleeding uterine tenderness significant maternal injury and rupture of the amniotic membrane if present initial patient ctm should be done for 4 to 6 hours if no maternal obstetric symptoms are observed and ctm is reassuring traumatic complication to the fetus can be ruled out with the high sensitivity on the other hand if these features are present like significant abdominal pain uterine tenderness vaginal bleeding contraction rupture membrane abnormal fetal heart rate pattern high risk mechanism of injury the ctm should be extended for the 24 hour and uh, pregnant female should be observed for at least 24 hours and uh, uh, most importantly under the obstetrical and the neonatal uh, instructions uh, if ctm findings are non conclusive ultrasound can assist in the diagnosis of abruption and uh, that evaluate the fetal well being and with the help of a fetal ultrasound we can directly visualize the heartbeat gestational age presentation uh, amniotic fluid volume placental integrity biparietal diameter abdominal circumference femur uh, femur length uh, which can be essential for planning of the delivery if it is considered the maternal health should always be take priority uh, priority over intervention uh, for the fetus to summarize the whole chapter the management of the trauma in pregnancy needs awareness of the anatomic and physiological changes the most common cause of trauma are domestic violence and uh, motor vehicle crashes all patient of the child bearing age should be considered pregnant until proven otherwise and managed accordingly consultation with the obstetrician and neonatologist is recommended in patient with gestational age if it is more than 23 week after the sterilization the fetal heart rate should be evaluated and monitored for at least 4 hours with obstetric consultation and in high velocity trauma observation should be extended for 24 hour thank you so much thank you for, uh, so much for listening thank you all yeah thank, thank you dr uh, devendra uh, let's move on uh, to, to the next speaker the next speaker is dr sudhakar reddy Dr. Sudhakar Reddy is an emergency physician and the president of the Telangana State Chapter of the Society for Emergency Medicine India. And uh, he'll be talking on pelvic fracture and its uh, management. So over to you, Dr. Sudhakar. Thank you, Dr. Imran. Uh, this is Dr. Sudhakar Reddy, President Semi Telangana Chapter. Today I am here to talk on uh, pelvic fractures and management. Uh, coming to introduction. Uh, pelvic fractures results from very high energy trauma and are true orthopedic emergencies. Usually compound fractures of pelvis having mortal rate greater than 50%. The principal immediate risk is massive hemorrhage and exsanguination if associated with thoracic and abdominal injuries which occurs in 10 and 20%. And uh, pelvic fracture associated with the bladder and urethral damage is more common whereas rectal and vaginal injury is rare. And coming to mechanism of pelvic injuries, there are two types of mechanism, which is the low energy injuries and high energy injuries. The low energy injuries, it may result from sudden muscular contractions in athletics, a low energy fall or straddler type injury. And coming to high energy injuries, it may result from a motor vehicle accident, but a strain struck mechanism and motor, motorcycle accident fall from height and crush mechanism. And coming to clinical features, uh, history plays a key role to get the diagnosis. So determining the mechanism of injury is important when assessing the trauma patient and ask the patient about the location of the pain and last urination, defecation, present bladder sensation and last solid or fluid intake. In addition, determine the time of last menstrual cycle and the presence of the pregnancy. 
Yeah, sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Sudhakar. We are unable to see your slides. Uh, yeah, they are not moving. Yeah, it's stuck on the first slide. Is it okay now? Sir, is it okay? Uh, uh, no, we can't see the second slide. Wait, wait, wait. Now, sir. Uh, yeah. Can you click on full screen, please? Now it's okay. Yeah, yeah. We can see. Yeah. You can click on slideshow start. The tab slideshow. Yeah. Yeah, we can say now. Yeah, thank you. This side how to move up. Yeah, okay now. Sir, is it okay? We can see, we can see. Yeah. So, so let's start again. Yeah, you can continue, please. You can continue. Yeah. Uh, uh, coming to uh, today, I'm here to talk on uh, pelvic fractures. Coming to introduction, pelvic fractures result from very high energy trauma and are true orthopedic emergencies. Usually compound fractures of pelvic having mortality rate greater than 50%. The principal immediate risk is massive hemorrhage and exsanguination if associated with thoracic and abdominal injury, which occurs in 10 to 20%. And uh, it is associated with bladder and urethral damage is more commonly, and whereas rectal and vaginal injury is rare. And coming to mechanism of injury, there are two types of mechanisms, which is low energy injuries and high energy injuries. And low energy injury, it may result from sudden muscular contractions in young athletics and a low energy fall and strategy type injury. And coming to high energy injuries, it may result from motor vehicle accident, pedestrian struck mechanism, motorcycle accident, and our fall from height and crush mechanism. And coming to clinical features, uh, the history is very important to get the diagnosis, especially determining the mechanism of injury is important when assessing a trauma patient. Ask the patient about the location of pain, last urination, defecation, present bladder sensation, and last solid or fluid intake. In addition, determine the time of last menstrual cycle or the presence of the pregnancy. And coming to physical examination, signs, of symptoms, signs and symptoms of bony pelvic injury vary from localized pain, tenderness, and inability to bear weight to pelvic instability and severe shock. Uh, unexplained hypotension may be the only sign of a major pelvic disruption. For a patient with a serious high energy mechanism of injury, examine for abdominal tenderness, perianal, perineal and pelvic ecchymosis and lacerations and deformities. And do not perform comprehensive pelvic manoeuvre in a patient with shock or an obvious pelvic fracture. Movement of unstable fracture can worsen the injury and may lead to further blood loss. And manual compression of the pelvic pelvis should be performed only once during the trauma survey, which is very important in trauma pelvic trauma patients. And uh, if any unstable patients or unstable patients are when the mechanism of injury could suggest pelvic fractures, you have to perform first. And coming to imaging, X-ray pelvis based on stability of patients and CT is more sensitive than plain radiographs. Additionally, if a uh, pelvic fracture is identified on the plain films, a CT should be ordered to evaluate for additional fractures or instability. Contrast enhanced CT is important in the, in the to find the ligamentous injury and contra, contrast excavation, pelvic hematoma, and intraperitoneal bleeding, and perform fast to identify intraperitoneal bleeding. Coming to classification, pelvic fractures pattern. There are two classification. One is tiles classification, and uh, second is Eng and Burgess classification. Coming to tiles classification, again there are three variants: type A, type B, type C, and the, each type is having sub sub-variants, uh, which is again three types. Uh, type A, again, uh, it is stable fractures. Type B, which is partially stable fracture. Type C, which is complete unstable fractures. And coming to Eng and Burgess classification, which is very important in pelvic trauma um, uh, fracture types. Uh, there are again four types, lateral compression fractures, at anterior posterior compression fractures, the vertical shear fractures, and mixed pattern. 
coming to lateral compression fractures there are again three sub variants type 1 type 2 type 3 coming to type 1 1 in type 1 sacral compression on side of impact and transverse fractures of pubic rami uh, for this treatment is bed rest pain control and followed by protected weight bearing type 2 that is crescent or iliac vein fracture on uh, side of the impact type 3 which is lc1 or lc2 injury on side of impact and contralateral open book injury and coming to a uh, anterior posterior compression fracture which is in this symphysial diastasis or longitudinal rami fractures uh, we will see in coming to type 1 in apc fractures um, in type 1 slight widening of the pubic symphysis and anterior sacroiliac joint and stretched but intact anterior sacroiliac joint and sacro tuberous and sacro spinous ligaments and intact posterior sacroiliac ligaments for this you have to uh, give bed rest and pain control and followed by protected weight bearing coming to type 2 apc fracture uh, widened anterior sacroiliac joint disrupted anterior sacroiliac joint um, sacro tuberous and sacro spinous ligaments intact posterior sacroiliac ligament treatment is open reduction and internal fixation coming to type 3 apc fracture complete sacroiliac joint disruption with lateral displacement and disrupted anterior sacroiliac joint and sacro tuberous ligament and sacro spinous ligaments and disrupted posterior sacro ligament also treatment is open reduction and internal fixation coming to vertical shear fractures in this symphysial diastasis or vertical dis displacement anteriorly and posteriorly usually through sacroiliac joint occasionally through the iliac vein and sacrum may have a fracture of the ipsilateral transverse process of l5 treatment is open reduction and internal fixation coming to mixed pattern it is a combination of other other patterns like uh, lc and vs being the most common in these all these uh, hemorrhage is more, more um, severe hemorrhage we will see in vertical shear fractures and urethral damage is more common in uh, um, anteroposterior compression and uh, bladder rupture is uh, more more common in uh, lateral compression fractures coming to avulsion and single bone fractures there is iliac vein fractures single ramus or uh, pubic of ischium fracture ischial body fracture sacral fractures pubic fracture anterior superior iliac spine anterior inferior iliac spine ischial tuberosity fracture the, uh, the treatment is analgesic and rest and followed by op based um, follow up treatment coming to establer fractures establer fractures are usually secondary to motor, motor vehicle collisions the fracture force is either transmitted laterally through the hip or posteriorly through the femur as with a knee versus dashboard mechanism however these fractures may be subtle and result in necessary careful inspection via radiography via radiography ct is more sensitive than radiography in detecting establer fractures coming to pelvic trauma management a uh, trauma patient with uh, hemodynamic instability and unstable pelvic fractures you have to do atls resuscitation like pelvic bender application and fast examination if there is any major bleeding in in past or patient unresponsive to resuscitation uh you directly shift to the patient operative room for laparotomy or pelvic packing or external fixation if there is no bleed in the fast go for major um, bleeding in uh, ct if there is any bleeding in ct go for angiography and pelvic arterial embolization then shift to the operation theater for laparotomy or fixation if there is no bleed again you have to shift for operation for external fixation if there is any major major injuries coming to pelvic pen penetrating trauma management so done a initial assessment through uh, trauma bay if there is patient is hemodynamical stability go for body scan and if required go for definitive surgery if there is any arterial blus go for embolization and stunting and if there is patient is hemodynamical instability you have to perform fast for fast is positive you have to uh, control the damage through laparotomy then followed by resuscitation then followed by definitive surgery if fast is negative then pelvic packing and you have to plan for reboa and uh, damage control laparotomy and resuscitation and definitive surgery and coming to pel pelvic binder application a pelvic binder is used to reduce reduce the hemorrhage, hemorrhage of a pelvic fracture and important to position this correctly over rated trochanters and pubic symphysis only for 20 to 40 hours you have to apply safe but less effective in elderly and safe in pregnancy the pelvic binder application in usually in a common man or in uh, er we can see that picture and other picture is showing um, the extreme left is the correct correct method of application of pelvic binder and coming to management 
patient with pelvic fractures are at risk of massive hemorrhage given possible disruption of pelvic vasculature the classical lecture tried is hypothermia coagulopathy and acidosis initiate massive transfusion protocol if patient is unstable and hemorrhage control angiography angiography embolization external fixation preperitoneal packing and resuscitation endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta and followed with the definite treatment of pelvic fractures occurs once the patient has been stabilized and after all associated injuries have been addressed all pelvic fractures require orthopedic consultation even in the most stable patients and uh, admits when warranted coming to complications of pelvic trauma there is there are urogenic injury rectal injury ruptured diaphragm nerve root injury and uh, pelvic fractures can also have long term effects like chronic pain sexual dysfunction and uh, persistent functional disability and thank you thank you for giving the opportunity to semicon team and west bengal chapter thank you all Sir, is it audible? Yeah. yeah, you can stop the sharing now. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Sudhakar, for that uh, very good talk on pelvic fractures. Uh, the departments which are closer to the highways and the outer ring roads of different cities have a lot of trauma which comes, and it's very important that everyone know about it, including managing uh, pelvic fractures. So thank you, Dr. Sudhakar. Uh, so we know on. Yeah, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker and uh, the last speaker for this session on trauma. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Atano Bhattacharya. Dr. Atano Bhattacharya is a senior consultant and the head of uh, Department of Emergency Medicine at Apollo Hospitals in Bilaspur, Chhattisgarh. So he'll be talking on a less discussed topic on penetrating eye injury and orbital cellulitis. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Atano. Uh, I think uh, I have uh, the slides already out there. Can the slides be, please be started? Good morning, everybody. I am Dr. Ebi Bhattacharya from Apul Hospitals, Bilaspur. Today, we are going to discuss penetrating eye injuries and orbital cellulitis. But before I proceed further, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues and friends from so my West Bengal chapter and the organizers of uh, Semicon for having given me this opportunity to speak on this occasion. So let's uh, see the penetrating eye injury and orbital cellulitis. Well, there is a standardized classification of ocular trauma and terminology, which is known as Birmingham Eye Trauma Terminology System. Here you can see the eye injury is divided into closed lobe and open lobe. On the open lobe, there is a laceration and rupture on the laceration is further divided into penetrating injuries. You have inter, uh, intraocular foreign bodies and perforating injuries. Penetrating injuries, as per the definition, is a single laceration of the eyeball, that is sclera and cornea, usually caused by a sharp object. So there has to be a full thickness, single laceration on the uh, sclera and cornea. Coming to the etiology, penetrating ocular injuries are from any sharp or high velocity objects. Male is to female ratio is 4 is to 1. Younger age groups, uh, usually in the 30s, are more vulnerable because of uh, the high risk behavior. Uh, more frequent locations are the home and the workplace. Uh, common sharp objects being stick, needles, knives, scissors, screwdrivers, and nails. Certain uh, high risk professions include carpenter job, garage work, welding, and machine work, farming. About 40% of ocular penetrating injuries would have intraocular foreign bodies present in them. What are the effects of penetrating eye injury? Well, it can cause a mechanical effect leading to laceration of cornea, conjunctiva vitreous hemorrhage, globe rupture, retinal detachment, and intraocular foreign bodies. Infections can occur. The organisms can gain direct entry through the wound and can cause corneal abscess, orbital cellulitis, purulent iridocyclitis, or end ophthalmitis. Sympathetic ophthalmitis can be a complication of penetrating eye injury, visual loss, and uh, annucleation can occur. What are the signs and symptoms of penetrating eye injury? Pain, blood or double vision, foreign body sensation, redness, lacrimation, and photophobia. And uh, if you come to the signs, it would be peak pupil or there could be a teardrop pupil. As you can see in this picture, there would, could be a subconductual hemorrhages, hyphema, Iris deformities, lens disruption, 
the shallower flat anterior is chamber vitreous hemorrhage is uh, written in tears and hemorrhages and foreign body uh, up in the eye and you can see the hyphema uh, hyphema occurring in this uh, eye what history would you like to elicit in case of penetrating eye injury you need to have a visual accuracy uh, prior to the injury you need to have uh, a nature of the injury whether it is life threatening injury time and circumstances to the injury suspected intraocular foreign bodies as there are some uh, which are inert as some which would uh, cause a, a major reaction use of protective eyewear prior treatment or evaluation of injury past ocular history should include ocular diseases refractory history previous ocular surgery ongoing ophthalmic medications medical history should include diabetes mellitus uh, hypertension immunosuppression medications the patient is on drug allergies and the status of fitness immunization while evaluating a penetrating eye injury you should always look for whether it is an isolation or it is a past of systemic trauma if it is a part of a systemic trauma you need to evaluate the risk and stabilize the abc before proceeding for eye evaluation while examining the eye you should always look for visual acuity because final visual acuity would depend on the initial visual acuity externally you should look for asymmetry lacerations ecchymosis Uh, lid abnormalities bone deformities fractures exophthalmos anophthalmos capitis foreign bodies remember for that you should not check ocular motility and intraocular pressure in case of penetrating eye injuries because it could lead to secondary injuries more so it is left for specialist to do the job pupillary examination should include a size uh, shape symmetry direct and consensual reflex and presence or absence of afferent pupillary defect anterior segment should include irides conjunctival surface iris lens capsule look for hyphema and intraocular foreign bodies diagnostic tests need to do in case of uh, uh, penetrating eye injury is slit lamp examination and serial test serial test we use a fluorescent dye to check for Uh, aqueous leak from the anterior chamber. If a plain X-ray would be required to look for orbital fracture and intraocular foreign bodies, sonography could be a useful diagnostic tool in case of uh, detecting the retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, intraocular foreign bodies, choroidal detachments, posterior vitreous separation, vitreous incarceration, incar and presence of intraocular mass. a ct scan would be required for looking into the extent of orbital fracture or the exact location of the foreign bodies mri for evaluating of soft tissue optic nerve evaluation to look for laceration or revulsions other investigation which is required would uh, depend on whether they, this is an isolated injury or there is a previous history of any particular diseases or this there is multiple injuries to the system what management would you like to do in case uh, of management in the ed you need to stabilize the patient if at all it is required uh, or there is a polytrauma in such cases followed by protecting the eye from further damage by using a eye shield or a cup administer systemic analgesics uh, a prophylactic broad spectrum systemic antibiotics may be have to be given anti emetics needs to be administered to patient who had nausea or vomiting uh, tetanus prophylaxis needs to be given keep the patient nil by mouth because the patient may need a surgery careful documentation of all your findings has to be there and for definitive management there would be a surgical repair where there could be a globe exploration and repair plus minus vitrectomy what are the do's and don'ts of penetrating eye injury don't uh, treat eye injury first in an unstable patient don't flush the eye with any other liquid except saline and warm water don't remove any attached foreign body from the eye don't rub or put pressure on the eye remember that a 6 by 6 vision does not rule out serious eye injury reassurance to the patient and advice against rubbing the eye has to be given always evaluate both eyes use moist pad and loose bandages if injury is severe for small penetrating injury cover it with shield or cup prevent secondary infection and injury and give a early specialist evaluation complications of penetrating eye injury in the anterior segment you, as you have seen in the picture uh, there is a iris prolapse acute hyphema traumatic glaucoma zonal lens injury lens injuries 
uh, traumatic uveitis, bacterial fungal, and ophthalmitis, sympathetic ophthalmia, and intraocular foreign body. Post posterior segment uh, penetrating eye injuries could lead to vitreous incarceration, retinal detachment, traumatic endophthalmitis, and optic nerve injury. With this, we end the penetrating eye injuries, and orbital cellulitis is one of the part of uh, penetrating eye injuries. So let's go into the orbital cellulitis. What is orbital cellulitis? It's the infection of the soft tissue of the orbit without an abscess formation posterior to the orbital septum. The uh, the uh, pre to the orbital septum would give rise to periorbital cellulitis. Orbital cellulitis does not involve the globe itself. What are the etiopathogenesis of orbital cellulitis? There are certain predisposing factors like age, sex, race, laterality, and season. Roots of infection. Usually, there is an extension of infection from periorbital or intraorbital structure. Paranasal sinuses are one of the culprits, and the most common being that model sinus. Direct inoculation into the orbit can occur, like in penetrating eye injuries. Endogenous source sometimes can give rise to orbital cellulitis, uh, like sepsis. What happens? The pathogen reaches orbital tissue, and as it is a closed area, there is a localized infection. Swelling occurs. The swelling impinges on the ocular muscles and nerves and spreads along it to the surrounding tissues and orbit and even beyond it. It is usually caused by the bacteria, but it could be because some fungal infections also can occur, mostly in case of diabetics and immunocompromised patients. More than 15 years of age, if there is an infection in the form of orbital cellulitis, it is usually a polymicrobial infection. What are the symptoms and signs of orbital cellulitis? Red eye, pain, blurred vision, double vision, eyelid swelling, nasal condition, sinus headaches, tooth pain, supraorbital pain, and hyperesthesia, and of course, fever. If you look into the signs, you would find that there would be ophthalmoplasia, limitation to the uh, extraocular muscle movement, chemosis, proptosis, pupillary response, which is abnormal. A decreased visual acuity, and uh, if there is involvement of pineal nerves 3, 4, and 6, it may suggest a cavernous sinus thrombosis. Differential diagnosis, well, trauma, cellulitis because of insect or animal bites, retained foreign bodies, allergic reactions, orbital inflammatory syndrome, retinal hemorrhage, tumors like retinoblastoma. What diagnostic test would you like to do? We would like to do a complete blood count. A blood culture may be needed if there is a suspicion of sepsis and if there is associated meningitis suspension, especially in children, you may have to do a lumbar puncture. Other tests include an X-ray of the sinuses and surrounding areas. A CT scan on MRI of the sinus and orbit is very helpful. Here you can see the paranasal sinuses are hazy and there is a collection out here. So is here in an MRI. If there is any drainage from the nose or eye, you may have to do the culture. So as the throat culture may be required. What complications would you have? Well, the ocular complications would be blinding, exposure, keratopathy, optic neuritis, and central retinal artery occlusion. Orbital complications would be subperiosteal abscesses and orbital abscesses. If there is an extension to the temporal operative region, there would have a temporal operative abscess. If there is an intracranial extension, we would have a cavernous sinus thrombosis, meningitis, and brain abscess. Very rarely, there could be generalized sepsis or pyemia occurring from pyema occurring from. Uh, orbital cellulitis. Well, what is the management? Usually, all patients of ocular cellulitis would require hospitalization. For control of pain, analgesics would be required. Antibiotics in the form of uh, second or third generation. Cephalosporine, which needs to be continued for 14 days. If there is a suspicion of a gram-positive organism, including MRSA, you need to add vancomycin. If it is a gram-negative organism, our artapinam may be added. If antibiotic fails, the vision is compromised, the large abscess is there, or intracranial extension. A surgical intervention may be required to decompress the orbit, drain an abscess, or open infected sinuses. With this, we come to an end of the topic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there is some echo. Uh, technical team, there was an echo. Yeah, it's now gone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Atanu Bhattacharya, for that uh, talk. So uh, we have come to the end of the sessions on, uh, on trauma management. So we had very good lectures in the morning on recent advances and then on trauma. So we'll take a very short uh, two-minute uh, break before we start the third session on pediatrics.
So the technical team has a short video. So yeah. we'll take about two minutes break now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Imran. Uh, on behalf of Society for Emergency Medicine, West Bengal chapter, uh, there's an invitation for our next academic uh, event. That is the Eastern Zone Emergency Medicine Con uh, Conference, which will be held in 2022 in Kolkata. I would like to ask our technical team to play the video, please. Thank you. I invite personally to all the faculties to be part of this upcoming conference and make it a grand success. Thank you. Over to Dr. Imran again. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Avishek. Uh, I welcome you all again uh, to day two of Semicon 2022 organized by the West Bengal chapter of the Society for Emergency Medicine in India. Uh, today is day two and it's been going on very well. So let's start the next session on uh, pediatric uh, emergency medicine. So the next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Shweta Tyagi. Dr. Shweta Tyagi is a senior consultant in emergency medicine at Paris Healthcare in Gurgaon. She is the president of the Maharashtra State Chapter of the Society for Emergency Medicine in India. And uh, she'll be talking on pediatric emergency ultrasound protocol. So over to you, Dr. Shweta Tyagi. Uh, can we have our video, please? Thank you so much, Dr. Imran. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Shweta Tyagi. Welcome, all of you, to Semicon. I would like to express my warm regards to the entire organizing committee of the Semicon to put up this brilliant uh, two-day uh, course, a rapid revision course for all the residents across the emergency departments. Uh, so today uh, in my talk, we will be discussing about pediatric emergency ultrasound protocols. So before we actually uh, go out and discuss Topic, what is important to understand is the uniqueness which is involved in the emergency department and in the children. Just one second. Yes. So, uniqueness of the ED is 
that our environment is often hectic, chaotic, with frequent workflow interruptions, working under pressure to be quick and accurate, wide fluctuations in patient volume and distractions from large number of not so sick patients. At the same time, children are unique because anatomically, physiologically, developmentally, there are characteristics which make them more vulnerable. The medications and equipments have to be weight-based. And then these are critically, uh, managing a critically ill child in the emergency department is like a high stake and a low frequency event. So obviously, as always, it is much more performance under pressure, which is expected from an emergency physician in this scenario. Now, what are the opportunities of point of care ultrasound in the emergency department for pediatrics? So when you have a baby on board, then if it's a pediatric trauma or a child with respiratory failure, child with circulatory failure and child with undifferentiated shock. So when you have any one of this situation, then definitely there is an opportunity for focus in emergency department. Kids are not small adults, and suddenly sick and seriously injured children cannot wait for care. So focus in pediatrics is a quick, convenient, dependable diagnostic tool, and more so in critically ill patients. Rapid interpretation of results can give clues to possible etiology, narrow the differentials, and helps formulate definitive therapy. It also provides real-time procedural guidance, and definitely there is no exposure to ionizing radiation, and it reduces the overall costs. Now let's go through a few case scenarios. So if you are in the emergency department and you have a 10-year-old female child with alleged history of road traffic accident, so has presented to ER with polytrauma, so our ABC assessment, airway appears uh, to be, you know, there is an impending fear of compromise. The child is tachypneic around 38 per minute. There is respiratory distress and the blood pressures is barely 60, 40 with a tachycardia of 150 per minute. So obviously this is a very sick child. Now, apart from following your ATLS protocol, there is a indication of using focus in this patient. So when you are coming to the circulation, the breathing and the circulation part of your primary assessment, that has to be augmented with incorporating EFAST in the patient assessment. So the extended focused assessment with sonography in trauma is done to look at seven places, that is, your right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, the subcostal region, the pelvic region, and the lung ultrasound. Now, checking at these places, what we see is the presence of occult bleeding. And if that is present, then the management of the patient changes. So I will show you and take you through the uh, views of the extended fast. So this, if you can see the first right upper quadrant view, there is free fluid. So this is a positive fast in the Morrison's pouch. Similarly, this, if you can see the left upper quadrant, splenic laceration and the positive fast. The next view is that is pelvic. We can see the bladder and extravasation here across. So this is again, a type of positive fast. This is the lung ultrasound, essentially normal. You can see the proper lung sliding. So normal lung sliding. So you've ruled out pneumothorax in this patient. Then the pericardial or the sub sub cephoid view where you can see the rim of fluid across the heart. So this is a pericardial space and you can see the fluid. So this is definitely a pericardial tamponade and you can see the strain which is there by, um, you know, which is pressing on to the ventricle and leading to the collapse. So this is a positive fast again. 
So integrating the eFAST in the initial management of stable trauma patients is, uh, according to this article in Annals of Intensive Medicine, hmm. Intensive Care, so it can definitely uh, be associated with physical examination and it can provide all the information which is necessary. So it is, it reduces the cost and it also reduces the radiation which uh, the patient gets exposed to. Uh, but the question is, can we rely on the uh, can I request the technical team to mute the mic? when we are talking oh, about the management of blunt abdominal trauma. So there are a few caveats in that. That is, past examination has low sensitivity. That means in hemodynamically stable patients, a negative fast without a CT scan can result in missed intra-abdominal injuries. No. So we need to understand that. So if you think that the patient may have any intra-abdominal injuries because of your examination and the history, that is the mechanism of injury, then go ahead and get a CT scan if the patient is stable. Now, in hemodynamically unstable patients with clear physical findings on examination, that means you feel that the patient has intra-abdominal injury, patient is hemodynamically unstable, and when you do a fast, it is negative, but this should not distract you from taking the patient to exploratory laparotomy. Because if you feel that the patient has blunt trauma abdomen, and the patient is negative on fast, still in hemodynamically unstable patients, patient should go to a um, o OT. So this is what uh, I mean to say when we say that fast has low sensitivity. So clearly the limitations of fasts are that the injury to retroperitoneum or diaphragm cannot be seen well, Uncooperative patients, obesity, bubble gas, subcutaneous air, this all can interfere with the image quality. It's difficult to distinguish blood from ascites or urine, and definitely it is insensitive for detecting bubble injury. So while we are using the eFAST in the emergency department, we have to be aware of these limitations. And in the light of these limitations, the interpretation of eFAST should be done in the ER. So now let's come to the next scenario. That is, we have a five-year-old male child with fever and multiple episodes of vomiting. Now the child appears, the airway appears to be patent. There is tachypnea, uh, the respiratory rate is around 40 per minute, respiratory distress, and blood pressures are around 70, 40, and the heart rate is around 160. So what are we looking at here? This can be anything, impending respiratory failure, it could be circulatory failure or shock, and the patient could be in sepsis. Now, when we are evaluating such a critical child in the emergency department, definitely the role of focus comes in. And the protocols which are available for that are RUSH protocol, that is rapid ultrasound for shock and hypotension, blue protocol, bedside lung ultrasound in an emergency, and the false protocol that is fluid administration limited by lung sonography. So I will take you through all these protocols and we will see how to use these protocols in this sick patient and get the differential diagnosis and uh, treat the patient appropriately. So coming to the RUSH protocol. So when we say RUSH protocol, we have evaluation at three levels. That is the pump, the tank, and the pipes. Considering the pump, there are three things we look at. One is the subsephoid view to rule out tamponade, pericardial effusion and tamponade. Then you see the left ventricular contractility to understand whether it is a hyperdynamic uh, contract. Uh, I mean, the, the, the heart is uh, hyperdynamic in contractility or the ejection fraction is low. Then the third thing we see is the RV strain pattern that is mostly because of the pulmonary embolism. So um, whether the RERV is dilated. 
So these three critical things are ruled out when you check for the pump. Then when you come to the check of the tank, then we see the IVC, inferior vena cover. We see if it is normal or it is plethoric or it is um, collapsing. So that gives us the uh, status, the fluid status uh, of the patient. Then in the tank assessment also comes fast. That is, you look at all the fast windows to rule out any leakiness in the, uh, in the uh, tank. Then you have evaluation of B lines. That is, in the lung ultrasound, you look for the B lines, which gives us the clue to interstitial edema, that is, pulmonary edema. So uh, that is the evaluation of curly B lines. And then you look at the lung ultrasound to check for pleural effusion and pneumothorax. So pneumothorax is basically ruled out by absence of lung sliding. So this is how you would evaluate the tank. Um, pipe evaluation uh, includes evaluation of aneurysm, that is abdominal aorta aneurysm, and evaluation of deep vein thrombosis. But considering in children, uh, these two things are very, very rare, so they can be omitted. So, the RASH protocol can be used Pediatrics this is what uh, is uh, even mentioned in the POCUS uh, Pediatric uh, Clinical Care article, which was published in the JAMA Pediatrics. So we can use this entire protocol for the evaluation of the pump and the tank and rule out the obstructive, cardiogenic, uh, septic, and um, the hypovolemic types of shock. Um, these are few images which I will like you to see. So this is what I was talking about, the right ventricular strain. You can see the thrombus in the right ventricle and this uh, D sign where there is right ventricular dilatation and the septum is getting deviated to the left side, which is called as the McConnell sign. So this is a very um, sensitive and specific for pulmonary embolism. Then uh, talking about the left ventricular contractility, this is the four chamber view, the ultrasound appearance. When you eyeball, you can see that this is the normal left ventricular um, contractility. You can appreciate when it becomes hyperdynamic and also this is how it will be when it is a low EF, low ejection fraction. So you can definitely make out that the heart is not beating appropriately and will not be able to generate enough um, systolic, uh, that is in, enough stroke volume. Now, this are the images of inferior vena cover. This you can see is normal with the respiratory variation. Here is the kissing IVC, where both the walls of the IVC are almost touching each other. So this is suggestive of dehydration, that the patient is hypovolemic. So maybe because of the uh, low intake of fluids or loss in, um, in view of you know, uh, uh, vomiting, loose motions. So the patient definitely needs refill of their volume status. So fluids have to be administered to this patient. Then this you can see is a plethoric IVC where there is hardly any, um, you know, compressibility of variation in compression um, due to the respiratory uh, cycles. And that is what is suggestive of a cardiogenic type of, uh, you know, uh, picture cardiogenic shock. So this patient will not benefit with fluids and will require vasopressors or inotropes for the management of hypotension. All right, so now coming to the 
second kind of protocol that is the false protocol and this is for, again for the evaluation of circulatory shock now when we are putting up these uh, protocols the first initial kind of shock which we try to rule out is obstructive shock so the the same thing what i discussed in rush protocol so the three things which it rules out in obstructive shock are tamponade re right ventricular dilatation that is to rule out a pulmonary embolism and a pneumothorax by ruling out the uh, by checking the lung sliding sign so if the lung sliding sign is absent then a pneumothorax is ruled out so after you have ruled out the obstructive shock the next uh, phase is to rule out a cardiogenic shock so checking for pulmonary edema so you look for b profile the curly b lines if there is no cardiogenic edema or pulmonary edema then the next step is the hypovolemic shock so obviously your lungs will have a profiles and then you because your patient is dehydrated and hypovolemic you start off with fluid administration now once your fluids have been administered you eventually reevaluate the patient and see if your a lines are getting converted to b lines and this will usually happen uh, when there is distributive type of shock that is septic shock so your a lines will eventually change into b lines and that means there is increased leakiness and patient is going into pulmonary edema so this is when we have to be careful with fluid uh, resuscitation and if a lines are getting converted to b lines then we need to go lower less aggressive on fluids and it put up vasopressors and inotropes to uh, manage the hypotension of the patient so this is how the false protocol works now we will see some of the pictures again so this is the normal pleura the pleural line and if you can see this is the normal lung sliding the lung sliding sign which is normal this is absence of lung sliding and if you say absence of lung sliding then this is suggestive of pneumothorax when you put in an m mode on this then you have two things that is the seashore sign or the barcode sign so the seashore sign is the normal lung so you can see it like this this is the ocean this is the plural line and this is the sand so if there is presence of seashore sign then that on the m mode this is normal and when you have the barcode sign then that is uh suggestive of a pneumothorax so why we are uh, worried about pneumothorax because if it is a tension pneumothorax that can be a type of obstructive shock and we need to quickly relieve the tension pneumothorax by needle thoracostomy followed by tube thoracostomy because the pneumothorax the tension pneumothorax itself uh, works like an obstruction and hence it uh, creates the positive pressure and impairs the venous uh, inflow and that is why the stroke volume gets affected so unless and until the obstruction is relieved the patient's um hypotension will not improve then this is the other um, image which i am showing you here which shows the curly b lines this is what i was talking about the curly b lines comet shaped so this is suggestive of pulmonary edema so if your a lines that is these are called the a lines the horizontal lines so first in a dehydrated patient you see a lines you have given fluids and if these a lines are getting converted to these b lines that means the patient is going into pulmonary edema and we need to be careful with fluid resuscitation and switch to vasopressors so that is how you will apply the false protocol now this is one more thing which i would like you to see this is called the shred sign so you can see these shreds here and uh, here again it is uh, shown very clearly so this is also uh, said as c uh, profile and this 
is actually for consolidation or pneumonia. So if your patient has this, then that means the patient is having pneumonia. All right, now coming to how to be apply the blue protocol. The same things, uh, blue protocol is only meant for the lung ultrasound. That is, it is a bedside lung ultrasound in emergency. So here we are just looking at the lung ultrasound. So you see the lung sliding. So if the lung sliding is present, then you look for B profile. So if B profile is present, you know it is pulmonary edema. If it is A profile, that means only horizontal lines, then you look for the thrombosed veins. But in children, it is unlikely. Um, so if there are thrombosed veins, then it is suggestive of pulmonary embolism, which you can further check with the right ventricular strain. Then if the veins are free, then you will look for the C sign, that is uh, the consolidation and the shred sign. So if that is present, then the patient has pneumonia. If that is absent, then it can be because of um, the acute exacerbation of asthma. Now, if the lung sliding at the first instance is absent, then this becomes a pneumothorax. So that is very clear. And if the lung um, sliding is absent and there is B profile, then in that case also it is suggestive of pneumonia. So we are able to rule out these important diagnoses uh, that is pulmonary edema, pneumonia, pneumothorax, asthma, and pulmonary embolism by just looking at the lung sliding sign and the A, B, and C profiles on the lung examination. So this can be really helpful in the emergency department to get us the differential diagnosis so that appropriate treatment can be initiated. This I have put up for you to understand that what is the sensitivity of doing a cardiac scan and the chest scan in pediatrics. So it's up to, you know, 87% to up to um, around 87 to 94% specific in the lung ultrasound. So it is quite good and it is recommended that we incorporate this in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, few more things which I would like to add up in the ultrasound is that we have head injury patients and ultrasound also provides accurate diagnosis in that. So we can rule out a skull fracture. So visualizing the hyperechoic bone cortex beneath the hypoechoic soft tissue and periosteum. And this is how, uh, you know, the fracture will look like. The suture lines will appear symmetric and will be regular and will lead to a fontanel in young children. So we can follow it up uh, like that and differentiate the suture line from a fracture. A fracture is usually jagged and irregular and it might be also displaced. So this will help us um, differentiate and understand. There's orbital evaluation also which can be done. So this is how when the eye cannot be opened, especially if there is an injury and raccoon eye, so examination of pupils is not possible. So by ultrasound, we can check the pupillary response very accurately. And also optic nerve sheath diameter. This is something uh, which uh, is very, very uh, easy and very uh, predictable. So this is the optic nerve sheath, the black the black area here, and it is measured three millimeters posterior to where the optic nerve sheath engages with the retina. And any ICP greater than 20 mm Hg, that means your optic nerve sheath diameter is greater than 5 mm Hg. So that is how you will be able to, you can measure this diameter, and this diameter can help us predict the presence of intracranial uh, hypertension and whether the, the patient requires management for the same. So in upper limit for normal uh, ONSD in children less than one years is 4.5 mm. 
and 4 mm in children less than one year of age. So this definitely can be a very, very important um, uh, point uh, while we are managing patients with um, raised intracranial tension, maybe because of trauma. So to summarize, we can have a focus assessment of critically ill child and I would recommend that we make a protocol for our department by uh, you know, incorporating the bedside echo, chest ultrasound, and also to add up the orbital and the intracranial part of it. And this kind of documentation can help streamline our evaluation and give us valuable information to uh, predict what the differential diagnosis is and appropriate management can be initiated. So kids are magic and miracles. They hope, make wishes, and genuinely believe that anything is possible. They survive wars and recover in the most amazing way because they believe. So in pediatrics, anything is possible. Children are very, very resilient. So quick diagnosis and appropriate treatment in the right time can be life-saving for these small uh, miracles which add so much value to our lives. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sweta Tyagi, for the uh, good talk. You brought our focus to pediatric emergency medicine. Yeah. Can I request to mute the mic, please, all others? Uh, technical team, please mute the mic. Of yeah, thank you. Uh, we will quickly move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Sandeep Gore. Dr. Sandeep Gore is a senior consultant and director for emergency medicine at Fortis Hospitals uh, Mulund in Mumbai. He's also the vice president for the West Zone. Uh, for the Society for Emergency Medicine in India. And uh, he'll be talking on pediatric seizures. So over to you, Dr. Sandeep Kore. Dr. Sandeep, you're mute. Please unmute your mic. Okay. Uh, is, uh, are my slides are visible? Yes, yes, please. You can go full screen on your slides. Yeah, just, just give me one minute. Is it visible man, right now? Full screen? Uh, no, you have to share your presentations. We can't see your presentation. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can see now. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, First of all, uh, th uh, thanks to uh, Society for Emergency Medicine India and Society for Emergency Medicine West Bengal chapter for organizing such a wonderful conference amidst the COVID. And uh, they haven't stopped academics in spite of rising cases of COVID all across the India. And also nice to uh, give a talk while uh, Imran, my friend Imran is a moderator here. He has been a uh, moderator for many of my talks. And I'm always happy to be uh, him as a moderator for my talks. So uh, basically, uh, they have uh, the topic which has given to me is the convulsing child means pediatric uh, seizures. Actually, the pediatric seizure or any seizure is a vast topic, and it's difficult to cover in 12 minutes. But I thought uh, we should discuss the emergency medicine doctor's business only. What we should do when the convulsing child comes to emergency department in the most evidence-based manner.
Okay. Now we'll understand certain terminologies. I will be talking uh, the basic aspects of the um, uh, this uh, convulsing child while treating the emergency department, but the basics are uh, most important when we deal any emergencies. Now, what is impending status epilepticus? A continuous or intermittent seizure that persists beyond five minutes without neurological recovery. This is a new terminology and that is called as impending status epilepticus. Another status epilepticus, a clinical or electrographic seizure that persists for 30 minutes or longer without full neurological recovery in between. So here the linings are very important, clinical or electro, uh, electrographic seizures. Electrographic seizures are important because non-tonic-clonic seizures, uh, status epilepticus is also a common presentation, especially a seizure patient comes to emergency department and after a tonic-clonic episode, if he is not re regaining full uh, consciousness and orientation and the post ictal state is prolonged, in that condition, we have to do the electrographic monitoring of the patient to rule out the uh, non-tonic-clonic seizure. So these clinical or electrographic seizures, this is a very important wording in this particular definition. Now, the refractory status, status epilepticus. A continuous or repetitive seizure lasting longer than 60 minutes despite of treatment with standard benzodiazepine and another standard anticonvulsants in adequate dose. Here, adequate dose is important. Means we are giving a lorazepam or whatever we are, if we are giving a fast many time, we have to deliver any benzodiazepine or any anticonvulsant in adequate dose. And despite of this uh, one uh, uh, benzodiazepine and one uh, standard anticonvulsants, if, uh, even after giving in adequate manner, if the seizure is not getting um, uh, aborted in 60 minutes, then we call it as a refractory status epilepticus. Now, the malignant status epilepticus. Yes, uh, this is also a common presentation, especially I, we encounter two malignant status, epile status epilepticus uh, patient in this COVID uh, pandemic. Both are COVID encephalitis and they are uh, they presented as non-refractory uh, status epilepticus and despite of uh, uh, aggressive treatment with anesthetic agents, the patient were seizing. So the, these malignant status epilepticus also a very common presentation to emergency department and we have to treat it in a very aggressive manner. Any status epilepticus or any convulsing child if coming to emergency department, if not managed pro uh, properly, the mortality can raise from 5% to 30%. So right intervention at right time is of paramount importance while dealing with status epilepticus patient in emergency department. So what is a key point? Status epilepticus can be convulsive or it can be non-convulsive. So the concept one should understand is non-convulsive status epilepticus. Suppose a patient came to emergency department with generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Generally, one, you, after one episode, in 10 to 15 minutes, the patient will regain full consciousness. But what, what if if patient is in altered sensorium for more than 30 minutes or 40 minutes? That gives us a clue about non-convulsive status epilepticus. And in this case, whenever there is a prolonged post ictal state is there. Or after the seizure, if patient remaining uh, in post ictal state for more than 50, 20 to 30 minutes, that time we have to do the bedside EEG of the patient and we have to look for the electrographic feature for the seizures. And if, are, if they are there, we have to manage that aggressively by giving anticonvulsants. And this is a very uh, important point. One should understand why delivering the uh, patient care in a convulsive child or any adult also. So while dealing, the, while delivering the care, we have to take a focus history also. What we our emergency doctor should ask, is there any pre-hospital administration of the medications, any previous history of epilepsy, precipitating factor prior to seizure means any fever or any trauma, any current medications. For a patient with prior status epilepticus, what are the uh, treatment response? Other active medical diagnosis, if patient having a hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, and hypocalcemia. Means hyponatremia can present as a, a status uh, epilepticus. Hypocalcemia can cause the seizure. Hypoglycemia also can have seizure. So we have to look for this metabolic parameter as a point of care testing in emergency department. If any abnormality is there, we have to correct it very much aggressively. And of course, we have to take the history of allergy also. Clinician should. Uh, also identify signs of head trauma if there are any signs of head trauma means any bruises or heads means if there any 
localized swelling on the head. You, uh, you, are there any signs of sepsis or meningitis? Or uh, yeah, they have to find out the seizure characteristics, how it's a partial or generalized polypolyxia. So investigations. So investigations, which investigations we should do? While managing any convulsing child, the first important thing is that you should do the blood sugar level. We have to maintain the blood sugar level more than 100. If hypoglycemia is there and ongoing seizures are there, that will cause grave neuronal damage. That is called as hypoglycemic irreversible neurological damage. So after oxygen, which another thing is important while managing the status epilepticus and convulsing kind is to check the sugar and correct it if there is any abnormality. Another important investigation is electrolytes, especially sodium and calcium. Hyponatremia as well as hypocalcemia can precipitate a seizure. So if any abnormality in this thing, we have to address that this thing. If patient is on any uh, anti-epileptic drug, then we have to send the levels of that particular drugs in the blood. And if we are suspecting any uh, poisoning, any substance, then we have to send a urine and blood toxicology uh, uh, report also. And if post menarcheal females are there, we have to do the urine pregnancy test also. So these are the key blood investigations, five blood investigations one should do in a convulsing child if it presented to emergency department. So what should be the goal of the therapy? Because if we know the goal, then only we can uh, give the goal-directed treatment. So primary goal of the therapy is to stop both clinical as well as electrographic seizures. So clinical seizures means the tonic-clonic that we can see the muscular tonic-clonic seizures that, that we have to stop as well as electrographic seizures means EEG. On EEG also that seizure should stop. This is very important. This thing, as soon as the tonic clonic, uh, the clinical seizure uh, subsided, we have to do the EEG and verify that electrocardiographic seizures also subsided. And this is a very key point, and um, one should not miss this particular thing. So, management always attention should be given to the airway, breathing, and circulation. And one should administer the high flow uh, oxygen. And very important, blood sugar should be checked and hypoglycemia should be treated with IV dextrose if indicated. After the oxygen, which is important thing is that blood sugar while managing the convulsive child in emergency department, this is very important. Then after that, drug regimen. The drug of choice will be if IV access is there, the lorazepam will be the drug of choice and those will be 0.1 mg per kg IV. If there is no IV access, then we can give injection dizepump, dizepump, uh, 0.4 ml per kg per rectally, or per, rather uh, this midazolam, delivering the midazolam is quite easy, 0.2 mg per kg IM once, and maximum we can give up to 10 mg. So midazolam we can give IM intramuscularly. So lorazepam IV, uh, if IV access is there, first try should be lorazepam. If IV access should not be there, then we should opt for midazolam, and if, uh, or we can give for per rectal dizepam also. And after giving this uh, this particular benzodiazepines, if a seizure is continued after 10 minutes, then we have to repeat the dose of lorazepam again. And if IV axis is not there, that time we can give paraldehyde, 0.4 ml per kg per rectally. We have to uh, mix it in the same volume of uh, olive oil and we have to give the paraldehyde is a very effective anti-seizure medication. And benefit of it over the benzodiazepine is that it doesn't cause it's respiratory Depression. So, parallel head should be there in emergency departments. Suppose a seizure is continued despite of these two doses, uh, one dose of lorazepam or two doses of the lorazepam, uh, 20, uh, despite after 20 minutes, if seizure is there, by the 20 minutes, if patient in emergency department, he should have IV or intraoxious uh, access. So, here very important. In 20 minutes, patient is in emergency department. If you can't take the IV access, you have to opt for intraosseous line. And intraosseous access means equipment to take the intraosseous access should be the, available in every modern emergency department. So after that, we have to choose for a drug regime, either first, either phenytoin or, um, uh, or a phenobarbiton. If patient is on phenytoin, then we can directly go for a phenobarbiton. And if it's a new onset seizure, then we can go for phosphenitoin or phenytoin uh, or uh, phenytoin uh, in these things. And despite of this uh, phenytoin also, phosphenitoin also, if seizure is continued after 40 minutes, then we have to look for the rapid sequence intubation. And one has to do this rapid sequence intubation with 
injection thiopental sodium that should be given 4 mg per kg and while intubating this patient a senior emergency department doctor should be should be always there uh, to uh, make uh, this make the system on full proof now uh, there are many this uh, uh, means there are there are many schools of thought which anti epileptic epileptic drug one should use phosphenetine valproate or levetiracetam which is more effective among three is so this beautiful study which is published in new england journal of emergency medicine in 2019 is a very important study that is called as established status epileptic treatment trial and this established status epileptic treatment trial shows that phosphenetine valproate levetiracetam are equally effective and they have similar rate of adverse effects so one can go ahead with any of these things but since we have been using phosphenetine in our emergency department for more than 10 years we opt as a phosphenetine as a drug of choice initially but one can go ahead with valproate as well as levetiracetam so this is a flow chart this is the last part of this my presentation and this particular flow chart is there whatever i discussed now in last 6 7 slide or all these slides it comes into the one flow chart i hope everyone can see if a seizer patient seizing patients come to emergency department give the high flow oxygen and don't ever forget the glucose i am insisting again and again to check blood sugar level in con convulsing child okay if hypoglycemia is here sugar level is less than 100 we should give the glucose and maintain it above the 100 and if his seizure is iv axis is there one could should go with injection lorazepam if it's not available then we can give injection midazolam 0.2 mg intramuscular then if it's still seizing then we can go ahead with injection lorazepam again we'll wait for another 10 minutes if it's continuously again it's a seizing then if patient is on a prime we should take the phenobarbital and 20 mg per kg iv or if uh, this new onset is there one can go ahead with a, a phenytoin and after we delivering when we are delivering either phenytoin or phenobarbital we should make sure that as we should in all a senior emergency doctor in this thing because it's uh, it, uh, if uh, it is it's uh, looking like a status epilepticus then we have to prepare for rapid sequence intubation so if the patient is continuously seizing for 40 minutes despite of giving this thing then one should has to uh, intubate the, do the rapid sequence intubation with high pental sodium 4 mg per uh, 4 mg per kg iv so this is the um, evidence based protocol for managing the convulsing uh, child in emergency department thank you thank you yeah thank you dr sandeep gore you can stop sharing the your slide uh, that was a good talk on uh, pediatric seizures so both clinically as well as from exam point of view the uh, pediatric seizures are uh, uh, are very important uh, let's move on uh, the next speaker is dr firoz torgal dr firoz torgal is a senior consultant and chief of emergency medicine and he is also the deep deputy medic chief, deputy chief of medical services at manipal hospital yashwantpur bangalore so he is here to speak on uh, cru bronchiolitis and foreign body aspiration so over to you dr firoz thank you for joining uh, thank you sir uh, dr firoz here uh, first of all thank you uh, society for emergency medicine india west bengal chapter for giving me this opportunity I uh, hope my slides are visible. Just I need a confirmation before I start. Hope my slides are visible. Yeah, visible. It's visible. Okay. Uh, so coming to the uh, topic here. So my topic is croup, bronchiolitis, and foreign body aspiration. So uh, croup is a common uh, primary pediatric viral respiratory tract illness. it's uh, also called as laryngeal tracheitis laryngeal tracheal bronchitis so it is a most common etiology for uh, hoarseness cough and onset of acute strider in febrile children symptoms of coryza may be absent mild or marked in croup the vast majority of children with croup recover without consequences or sequel croup manifests as hoarseness seal like barking cough inspiratory strider variable degree of respiratory distress 
morbidity is secondary to narrowing of the larynx and trachea below the level of glottis that is subglottic region causing the characteristic audible inspiratory strider the etiology mainly is the viruses causing acute infections and croup spread through either direct inhalation or contamination of hands the most important viruses playing an important role is para influenza viruses types 1 2 and 3 out of which it constitutes about 80% of the croup cases 66% of the cases are para influenza viruses type 1 and 2 and type 3 is known to cause bronchiolitis and pneumonia in young infants and children so other infectious causes of croup may be enterovirus adenovirus human bovirus rhinoviruses the epidemiology gender male to female ratio for approximately is around 1.4 is to 1 and primarily a disease of infants and toddlers and croup has a peak incidence from uh, age of 6 to 36 months that is still 3 years the prognosis for croup is excellent and recovery is almost always complete the majority of patients can be managed successfully as outpatients without the need for ip hospitalization vary widely among uh, rates communities from 1.5 to 30% and typically averaging to 2 to 5% only the complications in the croup are rare less than 5% of children who were diagnosed with croup required hospitalization less than 2% of those who were hospitalized were intubated death occurred in approximately 0.5% of intubated patients a sec complications of croup mainly the second secondary bacterial infections may result in pneumonia or bacterial tracheitis the main pathogens bacterial pathogens involving staphylococcus aureus morex zella catarrhalis hemophilus influenza etc so croup usually begins with non specific respiratory symptoms that is rhinorrhea sore throat cough fever is generally low grade but can exceed 40 degrees celsius within one or two days the characteristic signs of hoarseness barking cough and inspiratory stridor develop often suddenly along with a variable degree of respiratory distress symptoms are perceived as worsening at night with almost ed visits occurring between 10 pm and 4 am symptoms typically resolve within 3 to 7 days but can last as long as 2 weeks physical examination of croup has wide variation most children have no more than a croupy cough and or cry some may have strider only upon activity or agitation others have audible strider at rest and clinical evidence of respiratory distress the westley score evaluates the scoring systems the westley score evaluates the severity of croup by assessing the following five factors with a score range of 0 to 17 according to the westley score the factors are strider retractions air entry cyanosis and level of consciousness alberta clinical practice guideline working group divides based on the degree of severity based on the clinical presentation as mild moderate severe and impending respiratory failure the differential diagnosis for croup being airway foreign body diphtheria inhalational injury laryngomalacia viral other viral infections bacterial trachitis epiglottitis etc peritonsillar abscess So croup is primarily a clinical diagnosis with the diagnostic clues based on presenting history and physical examination findings laboratory result results rarely contribute confirming this diagnosis the complete blood cell count is usually non specific pulse oximetry is helpful to assess for the need of supplemental oxygen support and to monitor for worsening respiratory symptoms abg measurements are arterial blood gas measurements are like hypercarbia and hypoxia are less evident initially the radiography plain films can verify a presumptive diagnosis or exclude other disorders causing strider and hence mimic croup a lateral neck radiograph can help detect clinical diagnosis such as aspirated foreign body esophageal foreign body congenital subglottic stenosis epiglottitis or retropharyngeal abscess a child with croup has a steeple sign the steeple sign or the pencil sign of the proximal trachea evident on this anterior posterior aspect of the x ray so this is a steeple sign seen on a radiograph in croup the management urgent care or emergency department treatment of croup depends on the degree of respiratory distress 
keep young children as comfortable as possible monitoring of heart rate respiratory rate respiratory mechanics pulse oximetry efficacy of cool mist or humidification therapy is still questionable those with severe respiratory distress or compromise may require 100% oxygenation with ventilator support initially with a bag mask valve device cornerstone of treatment in the urgent care clinics or emergency departments are corticosteroids and nebulized epinephrine steroids have proven beneficial from mild moderate and severe degrees of croup in the straightforward cases of croup antibiotics are not prescribed as the primary cause is viral typically these patients initially would have had moderate to severe croup scores requiring inpatient care and observation a single dose of dexamethasone is effective in reducing the overall severity of croup if administered within the first 4 to 24 hours after the onset of illness the long half life of dexamethasone often allows for a single injection or a dose to cover the usual symptoms duration patient given a single dose of prednisolone 1 mg per kg were found to have made more return visits than those who received a single dose of dexamethasone of 0.15 mg per kg nebulized racemic epinephrine is typically reserved for patients in the hospital setting with moderate to severe respiratory distress heliox is a gas containing a mixture of helium and oxygen with not less than 20% of oxygen delivery to the patient is via nasal cannula face mask or hood equally effective in moderate to severe croup when compared with racemic epinephrine so the discharge criteria is like healthy color good air entry baseline consciousness of the child and the medication summary is current cornerstones in the treatment of croup are corticosteroids and nebulized epinephrine they are proven beneficial from mild to severe range of croup and res- nebulized racemic epinephrine so these are the references so i quick i quickly switch on to bronchiolitis in pediatrics here acute infectious inflammatory disease it is an acute infectious inflammatory disease of the upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract that result in obstruction of the small airways occur in all age groups larger airways of older children and adults better accommodate mucosal edema severe respiratory symptoms limited to young infants 90% are aged from 1 to 9 months rare after 1 year of age boys are affected more than the girls major concern not only the acute effects of bronchiolitis but the possible development of chronic airway hyperreact hyperactivity that is asthma infants are affected most often in this case bronchial swelling in bronchiolitis the airway becomes obstructed from swelling of the bronchial walls so the etiology main etiology is again a uh, viral a respiratory syncytial virus which is isolated agent in 75% of children younger than 2 years and highly contagious and the other human pneumonia virus para influenza influenza and rhinoviruses are the mycoplasma pneumonia are the other viruses the risk factors for developing being low birth weight lower socio economic groups parental smoking crowded conditions chronic lung diseases congenital heart diseases and less than 3 months old etc so the pathophysiology being acquisition of infection necrosis of respiratory epithelium less than 24 hours proliferation of blood cells excessive mucus production which leads to non ciliated epithelium cell regeneration and then impaired secretion elimination removed by the macrophages causing lymphocytic infiltration which causes to obstruction due to inflammatory cells causing debris and fibrin mucus edema fluid and then bronchoconstriction and not due to bronchoconstriction recovery with bronchiolar epithelium regeneration happens after 3 to 4 days only so the clinical presentations as coryza dry cough progressive breathlessness feeding difficulty which can be seen as tachypnea tachycardia hyperinflated chest sternum prominent and liver displaced are the clinical signs which we can detect in the emergency departments which can cause cyanosis or pallor including respiratory distress so differential diagnosis for bronchiolitis being aspiration syndrome asthma pertussis pneumonia investigations full blood count showing lymphocytosis neuropharyngeal swabs chest x-ray 
hyperinflated lung due to airways obstruction and trapping and local atelectasis can be seen blood gas analysis in severe cases is helpful ecg and echo to rule out any cardiomegalies or cardiomyopathies the chest radiography revealing lung hyperinflation with hyperinflated diaphragm and bilateral atelectasis in the right apical and left basal basal regions in a 16 year old infant 16 day old infant with severe bronchiolitis support you viral provide a uh, adequate fluid and then to maintain a hydration and monitor for apnea in infants is important humidified oxygen delivered via nasal cannula determined by pulse oximetry and then nebulized bronchodilators ipratropium salbutamol often used and then the prognosis is recovery usually happens within two weeks half will have recurrent cough and wheeze following adenovirus infection there might be permanent airway damages which needs to be monitored so coming to foreign body in pediatrics which is the uh, topic foreign body injection most common is the coin injection that is 31 to 46 percent foreign body injection age from six months to three years 99 percent of blood foreign bodies would pass spontaneously through the gi tract and only six to five to six percent of cases require surgery 10 to 20 percent of patients undergo endoscopy with one percent undergoing surgical management the physician therefore must always consider the possibility of a foreign body injection in a child with sore throat dysphagia increased secretions and drooling especially if the child is ill appearing so unique mechanisms of injury with button batteries like lithium batteries involving which causes pressure necrosis hydrolysis and liquefaction necrosis including chemical burns they carry greater morbidity and mortality and should prompt consideration of immediate removal the majority of objects pass within four to six days but some may take up to four weeks larger than two centimeter in diameter or longer than five centimeter of length greater than three centimeter in infants sharp or toxic bodies and more than one magnet gi consultation and endoscopic removal is advised due to their high potential for obstruction at the pylorus duodenal sweep and ileocecal valve so how to approach the history and event trying to understand the witness what is the foreign body what is the shape and what are the symptoms that are developed and what is the illness that the child has presented with plays an important role ask for asymptomatic at the time of presentation and the duration of days and look on for the radiographs x-rays and ct the common site being in esophagus proximal esophagus at the level of the crico pharyngeus muscle in line with the clavicles on x-ray thoracic inlet that is 77 percent we can see the foreign body being here in the esophagus the mid esophagus at the level of the aortic arch and the lower esophagus that is two to four vertebral levels above the gastric coin or button battery x-ray can be detected easily on the x-ray lateral and ap trachea or esophagus coins with the edge alone showing are lodged in the trachea but not always so when it comes to the foreign body ingestion i would just like to zoom this witnessed or suspected button battery ingestion if it's esophageal otherwise if the patient is stable immediate endoscopic removal active bleeding or clinically unstable endoscopic removal in or with surgery is advised if evidence of any esophageal injury admission i iv antibiotics and subjected for observation consider ct angiography to exclude aortic injury consider mri of chest to determine proximity of injury to aorta no significant injury of surrounding tissue or proximity of the aorta then esoph esophagogram to exclude leak before advancing diet as tolerated and in case it is demonstrate to injure injury close to the aorta continue npo antibiotics and serial mris for five to seven days until injury seen to reduce the aorta in case of a gastric or beyond less than five years of age and button battery injection being more than 20 millimeters consider assessment of any esophageal injury 
and endoscopic removal if possible within 24 to 48 hours if is facial injury is present admit npo iv antibiotics and consider ct angiogram mri of chest and if it is more than 5 years of age and or button battery the is less than uh, 20 millimeters in diameter may consider outpatient observation only repeat x-ray in 48 hours and then may repeat in 10 to 14 days if the button battery is less than 20 millimeter if failure to pass in stools endoscopic removal if develops gi symptoms or not passed stomach by time of x-ray at the time prescribed above so when it comes to a coin injection it is again we can divide into esophageal gastric and bowel and when it is the esophageal symptomatic drooling the look at the symptoms and if it is uh, the child is having a respiratory compromise consider endoscopic removal asymptomatic endoscopic removal within 24 hours consider glucagon if distal esophageal coin or endoscopy not readily available in case of gastric no endoscopy needed consider stra straining stools laxatives repeat x-rays after two weeks endoscopic removal if not passed within two to four weeks repeat x-ray clinical observation in case of small bowel clinical observation endoscopy and then surgical removal if symptomatic so this is the mechanism of uh, proposed algorithm for ingestion of sharp and pointed objects in children uh, main being the ct to understand where exactly it is and the management based on the symptoms and the radiological findings so uh, this physical examination especially in the foreign bodies being uh, coughing strider then biphasic strider prolonged expiratory wheeze a bronchi and equal breath sounds should alarm that the foreign body is in the airway obstructing the airways management when it comes to the main management depends on stable and unstable and then if it's unstable abc stabilization and then radiographs to find out where exactly is the location and then to understand before that whether it is a radio opaque or radio lucent foreign body what exactly is the foreign body as well bronchoscopy if Another one of the following is positive, like history, physical examination, radiography, bronchoscopic evaluation is warranted on the basis of positive history alone. The role of beta 2 agonist remains unclear and elevation of discomfort. Expelling foreign body could be life threatening, not a replacement of bronchoscopy. So this is an X-ray which is showing in the inspiratory view and the expiratory view. So right side, dead lung trapping that is obstructive emphysema due to partial obstruction of the right main bronchus. The left side deflates during expiration, but the right side cannot deflate. Mediastinum shifts towards the unobstructed side when the obstruction becomes complete. Then complications such as pneumonia or atelectasis can short. So this completes uh, my uh, presentation. And in case during the foreign body, if the child is collapsing, we go back immediately for the uh, AHA protocols of uh, removal of the foreign body and if the child becomes unconscious it is again opening the airways and continuing with the CPR to revive the child. So thank you. Uh, this completes my presentation. I uh, sincerely thank uh, uh, Imran sir and Society for Emergency Medicine India West Bengal chapter for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Firoz, for this uh, good talk. And we have the last speaker right now, which is Dr. Raghu Kondle. Dr. Raghu Kondle is the head of clinical services, uh, emergency medicine and intensive care medicine at Narayana Medical College Hospital in Nellore. He's also the president of the Andhra Pradesh State Chapter of the Society for Emergency Medicine in India. And he'll be talking on pediatric CPR and post uh, resuscitation care. So over to you, Dr. Raghu. Yeah, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I thank Samikon for giving this opportunity to talk about this topic. And it's a wonderful session of nearly almost uh, accompanying uh, 800 delegates. So pediatric uh, arrest or pediatric post-cardiac uh, arrest care, we hardly encounter, and it will be a difficult task comparing to the adults. And most of the pediatric arrests are secondary to the uh, respiratory rather than the uh, cardiac where we see in the VF or VT in the adults.
is rs is nothing but the cessation of blood circulation resulting from the absence or uh, ineffective cardiac mechanical activity which further leads to the respiratory failure and shock so we need a rapid and systematic intervention is the key for the outcome of this rs so the pathways to the cardiac arrest in children mostly it will be the hypoxic or the asphyxial or the sudden cardiac arrest which we rarely see and the precipitating problems we have divided into respiratory circulation and sudden cardiac arrest so the respiratory which first initially starts with respiratory distress then respiratory failure then cardio pulmonary failure and cardiac arrest the circulation which directly leads into shock and cardio pulmonary failure and cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac arrest which this suddenly rarely we see in the reserve pulseless vt or the vf leading to the cardiac arrest so this is a algorithm of the log we see the first thing is for any rs is prevention then as soon as the rs we notify then we activate the ems so till the ems comes the high quality cpr we start so so once the team comes they will be with the advanced station we ship the uh, patient to the ed department then the post cardiac rs care will start and then the the last thing recovery we will see in the later on this week so for anything for the rs for to check first make the scene safety if it is in hospital or outside as if the in hospital so see that the security people uh, take care of yourself because other than attendants will be mobbing outside the hospital see the scene is safety then so if you are uh, alone you activate the ems either through the uh, 911 or if you know the local hospital if you are two people then one can take care of the patient and one can activate the uh, cpr so once you are near to the child so the thing is look listen feel look for any chest rise and chest fall and listen for any gush of the air from nostrils and feel for the breath from so look for the pulse this is the brachial uh, pulse we see and if there is no pulse so we start the chest compression if two people are there we do a thumbing circling technique if a single person is there for thing so we do either a two finger technique or the child is uh, like a big child then we can do a one hand cpr with giving support with the other hand so as we all know the pediatric uh, algorithm so this is the for the single rescuer for the scene safety then checking the responsiveness then activate the nearby then so if the patient is having a normal breathing and pulse is felt so you should monitor till the ems comes and if the patient is not breathing then if it's a witness rs then start cpr uh, by before uh, then activating the before uh, act, starting the cpr then activate the ems so once the ems comes if they have got the aed uh, so connect the aed if it is shockable rhythm press for go for the shock if it is a non shockable rhythm you continuing your cpr if no normal breathing only the pulse is felt and if or if the heart rate is less than 60 with the pure uh, signs of perfusion then take it as a cardiac arrest so continue rescue breathing uh, for every 2 minutes till your help comes so this is the same thing with the two rescuers is nothing but the, uh, the if you two rescuers are there uh, so we check the pulse after every 2 uh, minutes and only thing we changes here uh, if two people are there it is 15 is to 2 single rescuer as there is 30 is to 2 so the pediatric uh, arrest so, so this is algorithm so start cpr this is the high quality cpr then begin mask and ventilation then attach the uh, monitor or the defibrillator is available then if the rhythm is shockable is it the vf or vt you can go for the shock and then start your cpr then if the rhythm is shockable then again shock then you can give your adrenaline here after the second cycle then after uh, second cycle if there is again it's a shockable rhythm then shock then drug again you can consider your 
anti or the mix if there is a non shockable that the acetol or pea then start cpr and if you are secure here i i will and it can be iv or io then you can give the uh, adrenaline to iv iv after 2 minutes then after 2 minutes if it is a uh, rhythm is non shockable again go for your cpr to the so meanwhile you have to check your hs and t so which are with the reversible causes which can be your hypovolemia hypoxia hydrogen ion acidosis hypoglycemia or hypo or hyperkalemia or hyperthermia and the t's which are the tension pneumothorax cardiac tamponade toxins thrombosis and uh, which can thrombosis can be a pulmonary or a coronary so the drugs delivery if you are secured uh, the routes can be iv io or et so we have the uh, naval previously in the 2015 but as the vasopressin is deleted so we have only left the lean so the drugs can be given are the lidocaine epinephrine atropine and naloxone so epinephrine dose is 10 times it can be iv or io other drugs which are only 2 to 3 times if it is an iv or iv so routine use of atropine in the pediatric rsi is not recommended the patient can be shocked so less than 10 years that is one year so larger adult paddles can be used if it is less than 10 kg small infant paddles are used so the placement of the pad is a anterior posterior pad placement if only large electro pads are available so the initial dose for shocking will be 2 joules per kg if the child needs a second shock so we can escalate to 4 kg on the second attempt and do not increase maximum than 9 uh, 10 kg 10 joules per kg so 9 joules per kg was the best uh, attempted shock which was published and the special circumstances we have to take care of the trauma so trauma again when you receive the child again you should uh follow the receiving the child in a uh, initially from the scoop then the uh, suture then the c spine has to be uh, maintained then if the child is in shock again the trauma protocol should be followed by the initial fluid resuscitation then if required a colloid or if again going to the, the patient is not reverted then the blood products again the next uh, second second sensors will be a drowning then anaphylaxis then poisoning congenital heart disease and pulmonary hypertension so in anaphylaxis the special child will be in vasodilatation so initial resuscitation with the fluid then if not resuscitating then again you can add your adrenaline infusion or subcutaneous so coming to the post cardiac arrest care so which was included in the 2020 guidelines so uh, So the advanced resuscitation, then the post cardiac arrest care, which will be started in the ED. So if the child any requires any uh, intervention in the cardiac or in a cath lab, it can be addressed sent to the cath lab. Or if the child needs only the intensive care unit, it will be transported to the intensive care unit, and the child will be monitored till the recovery of the care. So for the post cardiac arrest care, we need a systemic approach assessment and a support of the respiratory cardiovascular and the neurological uh, systems so targeted temperature management is critical in this recovery phase and the primary focus on on causes of early mortality and late morbidity has to be on this so so we see this diagram so the early uh, first 20 0 to 20 minutes will be the immediate thing for the recovery phase from 20 minutes to 6 hours we call it as a early um, recovery from 6 uh, hours to 12 hours we take it as a intermediate recovery from 12 hours to 72 hours we take it as a recovery phase and from uh, recovery uh, phase that is 3 days to 1 week or the disposition we take into the rehabilitation so from the first 20 minutes to the intermediate so the limit will be ongoing injury and the organ support will be taking care in this part and from the 72 hours to the 
recovery take we take into the prognostic uh, prognostication of the child how the child is recovering and how we pro take prognostication into the consideration and how we take into the attenders and lastly from recovery to the uh, rehab uh, disposition rehabilitation takes part so in this part we have to take care of the providing adequate oxygenation and ventilation so supporting the tissue perfusion and cardiovascular function and avoiding hypotension and correct the meta acid uh, base and electrolyte imbalances maintaining adequate glucose concentration you should prevent either hypo or hyperglycemia and providing target temperature and avoiding hypothermia and ensure adequate analgesia and sedation if the patient is on ventilator so once there is a primary injury so we see that there is a prevention of the secondary injuries it can be a hypo or hyperglycemia hypo or hypothermia hypo or hypotension or hypo hypoxia or hypercardia so these all account for the secondary injury of the child so the phases of the cardiac arrest post cardiac arrest the first phase will be the immediate uh, post cardiac arrest management so that we see the early management from the 20 minutes so some be taken to the early uh, six hours so which accounts for the ab airway breathing circulation stabilization so once the airway breathing stabilization is done and the roc is attained so the second phase starts so where we taken uh, into account of the multi organ support care which will be done in the intensive care unit so the goal will be restoring and maintaining organic perfusion and function and preventing the secondary organ re injury it can be a cardiac the lung the liver the kidney and identify the treat uh, treat and cause for the acute illness so what is the cause for the arrest and how to get on from there and neurological intact survival is important even though if the child is surviving if there is no uh, vegetable state it doesn't serve the purpose and the child so if it has you have uh, received the rosc and the center where you uh, treat it doesn't have uh, intensive care unit and a safe transportation of the child is very important so you need a systemic approach for this thing so the primary assessment secondary assess assessment and the diagnostic assessment so the post cardiac arrest the monitoring so the general monitoring will be your oxygen saturation so targeting oxygen saturation to 92 to 94 and the uh, the child should be under continuous monitoring so if you have a uh, capnography it should be maintained then arterial blood gas the if you have the facility and put an intraarterial line when possible uh, you can take the abgs blood glucose again prevent hypo or hyperglycemia cardiac telemetry continuous if it is available ecg and temperature continuous so see that the patient doesn't have a hypothermia or hypothermia see, see that the patient will be in the normothermia so you have various gadgets like the use of gel bladder and rectal temperature monitoring so see that the child has a urine output of 2 ml per kg and blood gas if you have a thing seeing the ph pao2 and pco2 and see your lactate levels are maintained and monitored so the blood glucose electrolytes creatinine complete blood count coagulation profile venous oxygen saturation cvp monitoring if you have chest radiography on the ventilated patients for checking the tube or for the dope and additional hemodynamic monitor monitoring if it is have and echocardiography will give some uh, clue neurological monitoring uh, so seeing the gcs and eeg if you are institute is there uh, so and serial neurological examination for the prognostication child to the parents eeg continuous if you have a thing and lastly imaging to the patient doesn't improve if you want to rule out any bladder if you want to prognostic the patient is a in a vegetative state so respiratory system i advise maintaining adequate oxygenation maintaining saturation of 94 but see that the pain there's no need of any 100% saturation adequate ventilation and maintaining the pco2 appropriate to the clinical condition and physical examination labs analgesia sedation if the patient is on ventilator and as far as required uh, avoid neuromuscular blockade and coming to the car uh, cardiovascular restoring the maintaining intravascular volume 
and treat MI that if it is diagnosed and uh, avoid any arthemias, adequate systemic perfusion and adequate SpO2 and PO2, adequate HP concentration and reduce the metabolic demand. So once the patient is reverted after the ROC, you see that the patient again go into the shock. So maintaining a inadequate uh, intravascular volume, decrease cardiac contractility and increase or decrease systemic or pulmonary vascular resistance. So the parameters to optimize systemic perfusion. So for the preload, so for increasing the contractility, so we can use inotropes or inodilators. So simultaneously correct the hypoxemia, alkalite, acid balances, correct the hypo or hypocalcemia, and if the child is in the poison, treat the poisonings accordingly. And for your afterload, that is a systemic vascular resistance. So here you need your vasopressor or vasodilators. So for the rate, heart rate, you need the chronotropes. The patient is having bradycardia. Anti arthemic if the patient is having arthemia, and simultaneously correct hypoxia and pacing if the patient is in the heart block. So, optimize the ventilation and oxygenation titrate of FIO2 accordingly and assess for and treat persistent shock, identify and treat the contributing shock, uh, factors for shock. So, you can consider around 20 ml per kg. Uh, if the patient is not having any cardiac complications in jelly, the patient is having a cardiac complication, you can reduce the uh, fluid up to 5 ml per kg bolus. So go according to the contributing factors that your HSNT is. And if the child is in the hypotensive shock, uh, so initially you can go for your epinephrine, dopamine or norepinephrine. If the patient is in normotensive shock, you can go for your dopamine, dopamine or epinephrine and mildenone. So for hypotensive shock, the medication is the, which can be used, IV or V. So we prefer for uh, 0.1 to 1 mics per kg of epinephrine. Uh, so the next uh, drug of choice will be a dopamine 10 to 20 mics and norepinephrine 0.1 to 2 mics per kg per minute. And dopamine, it can be 2 to 20 mics per kg, dopamine 2 to 20 mics per kg, and low dose epinephrine 0.1 to 0.3 mics per kg per minute. And milrinone loading of 50 mics per kg or 10 to 60 minutes and infusion at the rate of 0.235 or 2 to 0 0.75 mics per kg per minute. So the maintenance fluid requirement, so less than 10 kgs, it's only 4, pen, uh, 4 ml per kg per hour. And 10 to 20 kgs, 40 ml, or plus 2 ml per kg per hour for each kg between 10 to 20 kgs. And more than 20 kgs, we can give 60 ml per hour plus add 1 ml per kg per hour for each kg above 20 kg. So the neurological man monitoring, so see that the patient has an adequate brain perfusion. So see that the patient is not in shock. Always try to see the patient in normal glycemia, not hypo or hypoglycemia. Maintaining the target uh, temperature, treat raised ICP by monitoring the pupils if required in neuroimaging, and treat seizures if required in, and uh, AEDs. So the target uh, temperature, which is very crucial in the post uh, ROIC, so see that we prevent a hypo or hypothermia, and treat fever aggressively. Do not rewarm the temperatures between 32 to 37 degrees. As, so we are maintaining between 32 to 34, and for non thermia we are maintaining with 36 to 37. So out of hospital competence in infants and children, the hypothermia, so we should have to maintain with 32 to 34 degrees for two days, and non thermia 36 to 37 degrees for the next three days as for the guideline. So in hospital post ROC competence patients and children, there's inefficient evidence for hypothermia as for the new guideline aggressively treat hyperthermia, monitor and treat complications of hypothermia. So this algorithm gives uh, full uh, details about the thing. So what is the mechanism of injury, clinical symptoms, monitoring the treatment interventions and prognosticate factors. So the pre-event and the cardiopulmonary event or the post-cardiac arrest syndromes. 
so the injury uh, injury injury mechanisms it can be a brain injury or a myocardial dysfunction or a systemic uh, ischemia or a reperfusion or a it can be a persistent or precipitating uh, pathology so as the time is not budding i will skip this slide so the summary of the whole topic is early identification rapid and a systemic intervention so as so so we have the rrt and the code blue so the child has to be identified in the rapid response team rather than going to the code blue so focus should be on the prevention of arrest as the outcomes are poor in the child so early recognition of impending respiratory failure and shock and stop the progression of the shock or the respiratory failure prioritize your airway and breathing although the sequence will be your cab as the child mostly will be your arrest will be secondary to the respiratory compression only in cpr in outside uh, outside hospital cardiac arrest dynamic monitoring is uh, to assess the effectiveness of your resuscitation systemic assessment and support of organ systems will plays a major role in the intensive care unit avoid hypo or hypothermia and target temperature management control is required in this and prevention of arrest then managing a arrest and lastly the covid-19 child and infant cpr nothing is changed except you are maintaining your uh, wearing your pp kits and uh, following the same resuscitating guidelines so thank you and as the topic was a little bit lengthy i could have skip one of this major algorithm so any doubts it is open for the discussion now yeah thank you uh, dr uh, raghu for that uh, uh, talk so this brings us to the end of our session on pediatric uh, emergency medicine so the morning session had recent advances trauma and pediatrics as our talks very very good talks uh, have uh, completed unfortunately we don't have any time for discussion as we need to move on to the next session so i would like to thank all of you for listening but keep in touch so that we can uh, continue with the next uh, uh, session please grab a coffee and sandwich and please stay connected with us so over to you dr abhishek uh, thank you uh, uh, such a long marathon session thank you dr imran for moderating the entire session now we'll have a, a lunch break for 10 minutes a walking lunch session and um, at uh, 1:40 sharp we will again start with our next session thank you till then
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Semicon 2022 post lunch session. Uh, now we will start our session 11, which will be uh, on uh, toxicology, pathophysiology, and pharmacodynamics. In this session, we have some good speakers, and it will be moderated by Dr. Naga Nischal. He is the head clinical services and consultant emergency medicine from Cloud9 Hospital. Over to you, Dr. Naga. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek. And uh, good evening to all of you. Um, I know we are a little behind schedule. I request all speakers to stick to your time. That's 12 minutes so that uh, students get the ma maximum amount of the time that we have. Um, post lunch, Toxicology is a challenge. You know, post lunch session is a challenge, and then you're talking about toxicology. But I'm sure the speakers that we have lined up are very good in keeping us all awake. Um, without any delay, let's move ahead. And the first speaker for the this session would be Dr. Ajay. Dr. Ajay is a consultant and HOD Department of Emergency Medicine, NH. Uh, Narayana Super Specialty Hospital, Raipur, Chhattisgarh, and is also the president of Semi Chhattisgarh State Chapter. Dr. Ajay, welcome to Semicon. Please go ahead. Please start. And I request all the speakers to keep an eye on the timer, please. Dr. Ajay, all over to you. Please unmute and you could start. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Nishal. Yeah, we can see your slides. Good afternoon, my dear friends. So in the very first topic under toxicology, we'll be discussing a very important topic, which is paracate poisoning. In my 10 years of experience in emergency medicine, I have seen around 15 to 20 cases of patients with paracate poisoning, but unfortunately, none of them survived. Paracate is a rapidly acting non-selective herbicide, which is relatively inexpensive and easily available in the market. There is no antidote available for paracate poisoning patients. Even a one small, tea, uh, one small teaspoon or a one seep can is enough to kill a patient. Paracate is a bioparidyl compound, which after absorption from the gut, get concentrated inside many cells and subsequently undergoes redox cycling, which is repetitive enzyme mediated cycling between paracate and paracate radicals. 
the by the byproduct of this redox cycling is a superoxide radical redox cycling also consumes nadph which is a cell's key antioxidant defenses because of this generation of superoxide radical and consumption of uh, antioxidant defense mechanism it leads to oxidative stress this oxidative stress causes cell damage via lipid peroxidation mitochondrial dysfunction necrosis and apoptosis and subsequently triggers a pronounced secondary inflammatory response over a period of hours to days the patient goes into multi organ failure the organs which are most affected are those with high blood flow oxygen tension and energy requirements like lungs heart kidneys and liver paracet is a highly polar and a corrosive substance it is rapidly but incompletely absorbed from the gut after ingestion it get distributed rapidly into other tissues with a maximum tissue level reached after 6 hours after the ingestion paracet is very actively taken up by the uh, cell membrane transporters like spermidin or putrescine and it's get highly concentrated in the lung kidney liver and muscle tissues the elimination of paracet from the body is through kidneys most ingested paracet appear in the urine within 24 hours in case of minor poisoning but in case of severe paracet poisoning the kidney function is significantly reduced thus leading to much slower elimination from the body in case of severe paracet poisoning the patient should do not die within 24 hours and because the kidney is damaged grossly there is apparent terminal elimination half life can exceed up to 100 hours if you go into the history the diagnosis of paracet poisoning is mostly based on history and clinical examination of the patient we need to know the formulation strength and the dose which has been ingested by the patient even a 10 ml can cause significant illness but if it is more than 30 ml of ingestion of 20 to 24% paracet concentration uh, concentrate it is mostly lethal if the patient is a known case of kidney disease and if he is he is uh, older than 50 years the outcome is even worse on examination there can be painful mouth or the patient may complain of pain with swelling along with nausea vomiting and abdominal pain there can be a burning skin sensation which is very typical of paracet poisoning mostly in cases where there is topical exposure is there respiratory complaints if present they indicate systemic poisoning and mostly uh, if respiratory complaints are present the patient have fatal outcomes if we uh, while examining the patient we can see the mouth and pharynx for necrosis inflammation or ulceration which develops very rapidly in case of paracet ingestion the patient may be severely dehydrated because of uh, vomiting if we look uh, we should look at the respiratory rate as well as saturation and oxygen has to be given only if the saturation is below 90 uh, below 90% because too much of oxygen unnecessary if given can increase the toxicity of paracet poisoning the heart rate and blood pressure should be monitored if the patient is having a progressive refractory hypertension then uh, we can expect a early death for the patient in uh, in chest examination the patient may be dyspneic tachypneic and there can be bilateral crackles because of alveolitis or there can be subcutaneous emphysema because of mediastinitis the extent of lung involvement also determines the outcome if it if the lung involvement is too much the patient will have a fatal outcome abdominal examination the patient may have pain and the abdomen can be diffusely tender in case of topical uh, topical contact the patient can have non specific dermatitis and in case of uh, ocular exposure or ocular contact the patient may develop corneal ulceration certain investigation which needs to be done are like serum electrolytes which can be altered because of vomiting diarrhea the patient may be having aki and multi organ dysfunction in case of renal function test if there is a aki it suggests significant poisoning and it can be because of acute tubular necrosis or volume depletion and if aki is present it uh, the patient will have increased mortality a study was done which showed that a serum creatinine increase of less than 0.034 mg per deciliter per hour over 5 hours the patient has high chances of survival but if the increase is more than 0.049 mg per deciliter per hour over the 6 hours then the patient Uh, very high chances that the patient will die the blood gas analysis will show transient alkalemia in initial uh, duration followed by acidemia which can be respiratory plus metabolic mixed picture if there is a persistent hypoxia again the outcome will be fatal 
uh, arterial lactate of more than 4.4 millimole per liter, the outcome is again not good, it is worse. If you do a chest radiographs in early phase uh, within hours or within week, it will show bilateral infiltrates or there are uh, signs of pneumomediastinum. But if it is in case of late presentations like uh, several weeks or over months, there can be reticulo interstitial infiltrates or there can be pulmonary progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So this is an x-ray on my left side, the x-ray it is showing the alveolar infiltrates, whereas the right side is the CT scan which has done after one year of uh, paraket poisoning which shows pro uh, progressive pulmonary fibrosis in the patient lungs. There are certain specific tests which can be done to diagnose paraket poisoning, but this test is not very readily available in most of the labs. A urine paraket testing can be done within if within 12 hours of uh, ingestion, if it is negative, there are chances, 100% chances of survival. But if it is positive, then the mortality is 40%. A serum paraket concentration quanti uh, quantitative analysis can also be done and a proud foot nomogram can be used to correlate the serum paraket concentration with the mortality chances. If the quantitative paraket concentration is uh, facility is not available, then a qualitative serum paraket testing also can be done by a diet, uh, dithionide test. If there is an equivocal color change, the mortality is around 50%. But if, it, but if there is a definitive color change, the mortality is 100%. The management depends on the amount ingested as well as the time since exposure. Initial resuscitation is, is a standard ABCD approach as for all emergency patients, except oxygen administration, which has to be given only if the saturation is below 90%. Initially, if the patient uh, presents early, then two to three liters of isotonic crystallates can be given to compensate for the volume loss and dehydration. Larger volumes may be needed in case of delayed presentation. If there are signs of systemic illness, then adv advanced treatment modalities like uh, intubation, mechanical ventilation, hemodialysis can be used, but these are not of much value because if the patient has signs of systemic illness, the, mostly the patient may not survive. For gastrointestinal decontamination, we can use activated charcoal at a dose of 1 gram per kg with a maximum dose of 50 gram. Even fuller's earth can be used at a dose of 2 gram per kg, maximum dose of 150 gram. Uh, because of rapid absorption and high toxicity of paraket poisoning, GI decontamination is not very much useful with delayed presentation. A gastric lavage and a forced MSCs are contraindicated as per any corrosive poisoning. In case of early presentation, an NG tube can be inserted and aspiration can be done before administration of charcoal. In case of topical exposure, it should be washed with soap and water as soon as possible and up to a uh, duration of 15 minutes. If there is ocular exposures are there, then the eye should be rinsed for at least 30 minutes with isotonic saline followed by consulting an ophthalmologist for corrosive exposure to the eye. There are certain specific treatments are available, but it can be of benefit only if it is initiated very in the very early phase of poisoning. Uh, if it can be initiated within four hours of ingestion, a hemoperfusion can be of benefit if it is done for can be done for four hours. Even intermittent hemodialysis or hemofiltration can also give benefit to the patient. Dexamethasone at a dose of eight milligram IV every eight hourly for the first seventy two hours can be given. In cases of severe poisoning, dexamethasone can be given up to five weeks. But many studies has been done, which has shown that this anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive ther uh, therapy are of not are not of much benefit for the patient. For antioxidant therapy, we can also use acetyl cysteine, sodium salicylate, deferoxamine, vitamin C, and vitamin E. Uh, this can be given uh, for possible benefit and low toxicity of these agents. If the patient is having a high chances of mortality based on the history, prognostic test or clinical signs of deterioration and as there is no antidote or effective therapies available in such cases where the mortality is very high, palliative care is advised. These are my references. Thank you. Great. That was uh, good timing and sparing some time for the discussion. I think we'll go and take questions collated at the end of the talks, Dr. Ajay. 
So I request you to stay around so that you can take questions. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Ram Mohan. Uh, could you please bring up his slide? Yeah, Dr. Ram Mohan uh, is consultant and working with us is part of SEMI team Tamil Nadu. Uh, Dr. Ram, do you have your video or are you on the on the link? Dr. Ram? Dr. Avishek, do we have his uh, recorded video by any chance? Uh, we'll skip to the next speaker sure. by the time Ram joined us. Sure, sure. I think uh, I called him. I think he's held up with a patient. So let's move on to the next uh, class. The next speaker would be Dr. Naveen Puttam, Assistant Professor, Department of Emergency Medicine, uh, Arapudai Vidu Medical College and Hospital, Puducherry. Secretary Semi Puducherry chapter. Dr. Naveen would be speaking on TCA overdose. Um, Dr. Naveen? Dr. Naveen, are you there in the session or have you sent a record? Mm. Dr. Avishek, uh, have you got his uh, video or uh, do we have his, because I have messaged all of them. Yes, yes. we will uh, play the video of. Please, please. Today we are going Dr. to uh, discuss about uh, tricyclic antidepressants. But before that, I thank West Bank College chapter for giving me this opportunity to present in Semicon uh, 2022. And I, I hope all the students uh, get benefited from this uh, Semicon 2022 for the further examinations and preparations. So today we are going to discuss about about TCA tricyclic antidepressants. And I'm Dr. Navin Putam, Secretary of Semi Pondicherry, and I'm working in Department of MNC Medicine, Arbadavidi Medical College, Puducherry. So coming to the topic uh, TCAs, there is always a debate going on in TCAs whether it's accidental uh, overdose or it's a deliberate suicidal attempts. So we'll be discussing about uh, the further things in the coming slides, but mainly we are going to discuss about the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics in this uh, today's slide. So coming to the topic of TCAs. So as we discuss whether it's accidental or it's a deliberate poisoning of TCAs. So coming to the overview, we'll just uh, run through the history, structure of the molecule, drug-related complications, clinical use, the mechanism and clinical toxicity, but the main and foremost thing we are going to see about the uh, pathophysiology and pharmacokinetics. The complicated investigations and treatment is just as follows. And the main, uh, main and the last thing is the both the take home message. Okay, so what we are going to do? So coming to the history, the most important thing is history taking from the patient as well as the witness and the persons who are in the home. So with this, we will know about whether the uh, patient is has been taking the drugs because of an accidental consumption or due to suicidal tendencies. So first and foremost, as we do in ER, we'll check the ABCs and assess the GCS of the patient, which is first and foremost very important. So coming to the history, when was it taken? The time of consumption is very important as it differs and of admission of the patient or to see for an observation of the patient. So how much quantity? Quantity again comes into a very main picture or how much quantity they have taken. So past medical history and why the patient has consumed drug history or a psych, uh, psychiatric disorder, past history of the psychiatric disorder or and to assess the mental health of the patient. So the drug related death is due to mainly because of the pharmacological activity because of its complex nature and low therapeutic index and general availability. So coming to the structure of uh, TCA, has three aromatic rings and it is supported by the aminopropyl side chain. Okay, coming to TCS, we have various uh, amount of drugs where we have seen where amitriptyline is most commonly used. Okay, other drugs you have been uh, know like uh, imipranamine. So other drugs we'll be discussing in the subsequent slides. 
So coming to the clinical use, it's used for depression and obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit disorder, panic and phobia disorders, anxiety disorders, eating disorders, and coming to chronic pain or neurological um, neuropathies, peripheral neuropathies, and uh, some headaches and migraines also sometimes will be used. So coming to the mechanism of the drug toxicity, at first, if it started in a higher therapeutic dose, then the problem comes. Or when it is combined with the other drugs, or whether there is a mixed formula of the drugs where they we prescribe one and the pharmacist gives one more, so that again comes into a complication. So whether there is a medical problems due to this, and uh, coming to the neurological pain or neuroleptic malignant syndrome, okay. So coming to the pharmacokinetics which we are going to discuss, it is highly lipophilic, and the foremost thing is highly protein bound by a larger volume of distribution crosses the BBB that is blood brain barrier and it peak plasma levels it's about two to six hours so this is why we wanted to know what time of consumption was it taken okay so that's why in the history taking we have to know what time and how much the patient has been consumed hepatic metabolism and elimination and the half life it becomes it is like 24 to 72 hours and since it has low therapeutic index so the elimination will be and rapid absorption in the blood and the metabolization will be happening in the first pass metabolism will be happening in the hepatic by hepatic metabolism. So like we already discussed amitriptyline is most common drug where it takes around 31 to 46 hours for elimination. So coming to pharmacological actions. So, so what is the actions it does? So postsynaptic blockade of the histamine receptors, muscarinic receptors, alpha adrenaline receptors and serotonin and alpha and um, alpha receptors of the GABA receptors, dopamine receptors. So what all it inhibits? So it inhibits the norepinephrine reuptake and serotonin reuptake and uh, there will be sodium potassium channel will be inhibited. So coming to antihistamine effects, there is a potent inhibitors of the peripheral and central postsynaptic histamine receptors. CNS sedation will be there. Okay. So coming to anti muscarinic symptoms, that all the, those are all the clinical symptoms where you will find in a patient. So patient will be in agitation, in delirium, confusion, amnesia, hallucinations, slurred speech might be there, ataxia, and sedation. So coming to the peripheral, we'll see dilated pupils. Patient will be having a blurred vision, a tachycardia, typical finding in an ECG, hyperthermia, hypertension, or hypotension. There will be decreased uh, secretions, dry skin, and there will be urinary retention and increased muscle tone or tremors, so which can lead to seizure or rhabdomyolysis. Okay. So coming to uh, drug with anti muscarinic effects like TCA, antihistamines, antipsychotics, uh, Parkinson drugs. Okay, these are the few things which will be like anti muscarinic activity. So coming to the inhibition of alpha adrenergic receptors. So inhibition of the postsynaptic and central and peripheral alpha adrenergic receptors much affinity towards alpha 1 than alpha 2 adrenergic receptors sedation will be there meiosis and pupillary constriction orthostatic hypotension and reflex tachycardia will be present so coming to sodium channel uh, blockade uh, so first, first we'll uh, discuss about the sodium then we'll come on to potassium channel blockade so sodium channel blockade again because of tca there will be cardiotoxicity there will be prolonged phase zero of the action potential, like phase zero, one, two, and three, four. So delayed depolarization, a conduction abnormalities, and decreased contactility and hypotension is a typical feature in sodium channel blockade. So coming to potassium channel blockade, there will be it blocks a myocardial potassium channel, which inflects the potassium ions during depolarization. So there will be QT prolongation will be there in the ECG, and tosser or deep point is might occur sometimes. So GABA A GABA A receptors antagonist. So it will be inhibition of the postsynaptic GABA A receptors, which can cause seizures. Okay, that's because of the sodium channel blockade and central anticholinergic effect and biogenic amine activity. So coming to the toxicity, again, this is very important. The toxicity is more than 10 milligram per kg. Okay, this happens, and pediatric patients are more susceptible to anti-muscarinic symptoms, right? And the plasma levels, when we check, it should be more than 1000 nanogram per milliliter. Again, 
the problem is don't treat the patients with plasma levels treat the patients with symptoms okay and their clinical features what you see like anti muscular and symptoms which you see so complication as you can see in the picture there will be seizures will be there and rhabdomyolysis altered levels of uh, consciousness anti muscarinic symptoms ventricular dysrhythmia sometimes pulmonary edema aspiration uh, and which can cause pneumonia hyperthermia rhabdomyolysis so coming to differential diagnosis see the ecg is very typical in our tcs so in differential diagnosis there will be carbamazepine our uh, class 1a class 1c of uh, anti arrhythmic there will be wide qrs and right axis deviation rad is nothing but right axis deviation anti muscarinic activity false positive sometimes and serum level we have to monitor so propranolol or cocaine lithium hyperkalemia also has wide qrs and right axis deviation so we have to see accordingly and diagnose so coming to investigation serial ecg should be taken so you can see in this uh, slide where we have marked here so there will be one avl there will be s wave and there will be wide qrs widening will be present okay so serial ecg should be taken serum electrolyte should be taken rft serum drug level should be monitored and abg with the uh, according to the gcs of the patient so coming to the um, electrocardiogram of the tca sinus tachycardia you can see in this ecg there will be in the uh, tachycardia is present and right axis deviation is pr uh, present prolongation of uh, pr interval and widened qrs complex and there are t wave changes also is there and av block you can see this is another pr prolongation nothing but then av block is present okay so coming to treatment as we all do at first you have to stabilize the patient see for abc again d for decontamination this all routine things which you all know e for ecg monitoring whole is catheter uh, because to see the color of the urine okay and uh, gastric emptying and check for uh, cbg ibg and take a his proper history after stabilizing the patient so gastric contamination is nothing but uh, gastric emptying absorption of the toxin in the gut and uh, irrigation of the bowel lumen enhanced elimination so dysarrhythmia it's uh, very important which you treat sodium bicarbonate hyperventilation lidocaine should be given and synchronized cardioversion max sulfate and overdrive pacing should be done so if you see in this with sinus tachycardia which all, which we already seen in the ecg sinus tachycardia prolongation of pr qrs or qt intervals av block also is the point is again you uh, treat with max sulfate and synchronized cardioversion or give overdrive pacing if it's an av block okay so contraindications don't give uh, if it's an arrhythmia don't give again give class uh, a and uh, class c e anti arrhythmics which will worsen the ecg and the patient so anti arrhythmic agent should be avoided calcium channel blockage should be avoided so coming to bicarbonate in qrs complex more than 100 try to give bicarbonate hypotension due to refraction to the fluid therapy and ventricular dysrhythmia ectopy okay so keep at p maintain the ph around 7.5 to 7.55 so if the patient goes for seizures okay and the most important two drugs mefloxibine and amoxicillin gives the most prone to cause seizures so qrs complex more than 100 there will be risk of seizures okay so benzodiazepam is a treatment of choice so in this seizure we never try to give phenytoin or phenostigmine to tca induced seizure so secondary effect due to seizure again metabolic acidosis a hyperthermia rhabdomyolysis and renal failure right occur so coming to hypotension you give crystalloids Uh, more than 10 ml per kg cvp candle where you measure the cvp whether we have given adequate fluids or patient still needs any fluids uh, sodium bicarbonate and again in this norepinephrine should be the first choice of the vasopressin not dopamine okay so if it's patient having still refractory hypotension overdrive pacing or aortic balloon pump assistance should be given so coming to disposition uh, check for 6 hours like uh, the patient is asymptomatic and after ingestion after 6 hours you can just keep them for observation but uh, do the routine investigations so asymptomatic with some co existing medical conditions like past history of uh, psychiatry uh, medications or psychiatry illness so you have to admit if it's symptomatic obviously you're going to admit and uh, treat the patient so discharge the patient once all the investigations and all the medical history and the patient mental status is normal it after 12 hours so you can discharge 
So discharge gravity are obviously normal ECG, normal uh, mental status, and resolution of the symptoms. So take home message: TCS has three Cs. Okay, our coma, convulsions, cardiac dyspnea should be treated first. Serial ECG monitoring, sodium bicarbonate therapy, benzodiazepines, no phenytoin in the TCA induced seizures, hypotension, and the vasopressor of choice will be first. Anyway, you will be giving fluids, and later you'll be uh, starting on uh, noradrenaline, then dopamine. So treat the secondary complications of the toxicity. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Navin. Um, try. TCA is always a challenging one to manage, and it's always a challenge to manage any kind of a poisoning which is so volatile. So without any delay, let's move on to our next speaker, um, Dr. Aparajitam Mitra, Associate Consultant, Emergency Medicine Department, Ruby General Hospital, Kolkata. Dr. Aparajita, you are going to uh, live or you have your recording, Dr. Mitra? I'm going to live. Uh, yes. can, you, can you hear me? Please, please start. You can share your screen. Okay, one minute. Mm. Are you able to share your screen? Uh, I, not easily. Actually, I have, on, uh, on the bottom uh, side of the screen, you will see a greenish yes, yes, yes. thing called share screen. Just click on that, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, once you click on, mm -hmm. you double click okay. on the PPT which you want to share now. The PPT is not coming actually. Where is your PPT? It's uh, yeah. open in the, it's coming. Yeah, yeah, there's something trying to be projected on the screen. It's a blank screen at this point. It's not coming actually. Have you shared your PPT? Uh, I'm resending it again. Okay, I, I have yeah. shared. Yes, I have shared. Um, would you want to try sharing screen or you want us to start the PPT? You can, you can start in that PPT. It will save time then. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, do you have the PPT? Strong with the it. Event manager, cubic event manager, do you have the PPT? Meanwhile, you can start uh, sharing the screen. I'll guide you how to share your screen, Dr. Aparajita. Yeah, cubic team, do you have Dr. Aparajita's uh, slide? Shongu Mitra has it, I think. Do you have it handy now? Yes. Do you have it on your screen? Uh, it's not opening, I don't know. I, I have already... Uh, I have already opened in through uh, the Microsoft Office, but it's not coming. Can you please start the PPT? I will uh, tell. I will speak. Uh, Cubic team, can you please bring her PPT on the screen? Cubic That's team. Fine. I have mailed it to uh, Shongu Mitra. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you would be, Dr. Up, uh, Dr. Mitra is going to be talking on OPC poisoning, correct? Yes. Great. So are we able to bring it on? I'm sending to Dr. Nishal also. Now I, will, will it be helpful or Abhishek, Dr. Abhishek? Yeah, Cubic team, can you, can you play her slides? Wait for two minutes, sir. We are playing, sir. Just for two minutes. Okay. okay thank you. I have sent to Dr. Okay. Vishak. So. Okay. Meanwhile, we can uh, go ahead and take questions on the topics that we have already discussed uh, paracate poisoning and TCA poisoning, tricyclic antidepressant. So, if anyone has any questions, Dr. Avishay, can you see the chat box? And Dr. Ajay, are you around? If you can take questions. Yeah, I am here. Great. So, do we see any questions for Dr. Ajay? Okay. But, uh, you know, like what you were saying, uh, Ajay, that uh, the outcome of this poisoning is not very good. 
Okay. Yeah. As per evidence uh, or what we see in our practice. So what do you think are simple things that may change the outcome of patients coming with this person? Uh, the top uh, three. Then please to give us two minutes. Okay. Sure. Till now, what I have seen in paracade poisoning, most of the patient, not most, in a hundred percent of my patients who came to me with paracade poisoning, they have not survived. Even in literature, also when I remember, when I saw the first, very first patient, I saw the literature searching for paracade poisoning and uh, its treatment, and I was astonished to see that there is hundred percent mortality. So, but a uh, few studies. Uh, has been done which say that early initiation of uh, hemodialysis, hemofiltration can give benefit to the patient. So uh, if a patient with paracade poisoning presents to the emergency department very early, in very early phase, within one to two hours of uh, taking the consum consuming the poison, which is very, very rarely it happens. In that case, I suppose if hemodialysis can be initiated early phase without waiting for the patient to deteriorate, that can help in saving the life of the patient apart from any other treatment modalities which are uh, available as there is no antidote available for paracade poisoning. So early intervention, um, early arrival of the patient and early intervention to get the poison out of the system. So, yeah. you know, to very grossly put, but uh, how do, if this is so lethal, the common sense question would be that why are we using this? You know, so, um, you know, where are we using this for? Why is this even available? Yeah, this is a, actually, this is a herbicide, which is available in mixture in yeah. combination with other agents, which uh, minimize the toxicity of paracade, but still it is uh, easily available in the market. It is not yet banned by the government. In some countries it is banned, but not in India. And uh, recently I am seeing that the cases of herbicide poisoning, uh, Recently, I am seeing that the cases of herbicide poisoning are on increasing trend. Um, maybe people, are, people, many people, they do it intentionally for just for uh, threatening their family members that thinking that this is a herbicide and it won't harm much without knowing the exact mortality rate of uh, this. Uh, even the literature uh, says that a small amount, even a one sip, can kill a patient. Uh, the prolonged effects which can be there is development of progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So even if the patient uh, gets discharged, even, yeah, even if the patient gets discharged from the hospital, uh, maybe within next four or five months or six months, the patient uh, may deteriorate, develop pulmonary fibrosis and be die because of respiratory failure. Even lung transplant has been tried, but uh, after lung transplant also because of persistent paracate concentration in the serum, Again, the fibrosis will develop in the transplanted lung and uh, that also will be a failure. So I don't think any it, it, specific modality is available. So it, it makes sense then if it is so lethal, then you rather limit the availability rather than try to look for antidotes or how do you get it out of the system? So yes, thanks uh, Dr. Ajay for that. And uh, okay. Dr. Aparjita is ready to go. Dr. Mitra? Yes. yes. Great. Over to you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First, I should congratulate the semi West Bengal chapter for conducting such wonderful uh, conference. Excuse uh, me, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, for next slides, please say next. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, am I visible or? Uh, yeah, you're visible, ma'am. I'm on audible. audible board. Okay. okay. You're Thank audible. You so the slides are on. Uh, for your okay, next okay. slide, just Thank say you next. So Thank you. So, so my presentation. Uh, is on organ phosphate poisoning. I'm Dr. Aparajita Mitra. I'm the associate consultant in emergency medicine in Ruby General Hospital, Kolkata. So coming to the first slide, uh, please change. So uh, this is the organ of phosphate poisoning and we are going to discuss about it. Uh, please next slide. Now coming to one patient uh, with a chief complaint of epigastric pain, headache, slurred speech and altered behavior, not oriented to time. Uh, next slide. So this is a 30-year-old female patient admitted in uh, hospital. And the police was informed since uh, the poisoning was detected and it underwent the case of medical case and history of ingestion of buckling poisoning was, buckling medicine was there. Next slide. 
on examination the pupil was pinpoint the pinpoint pupil is meant by the normal size less than the normal size which is 2 to 4 millimeter in diameter in bright light and 4 to 8 millimeter in diameter in dark light so the pinpoint pupil in case it is a less than 2 millimeter next slide so this is the picture how it, it is looked then next slide so the investigation report came out to be high random blood sugar level 256 as which is uh, more than the normal range of less than 200 mg per dl next slide and the other blood investigation revealed there is uh, very low cholinesterase level that is 129 um, international units per liter and the potassium level is also low next slide please so what is cholinesterase? It is an esterase that lyses the choline-based esters and it catalyzes the hydrolysis of cholinergic neurotransmitters such as breaking acetylcholine into acetic acid and choline. Next slide, please. Next slide, yes. The location of the acetylcholine is it's found in synaptic cleft, RBCs and blood plasma. Next, please. And pseudocholinesterase is present in plasma. It also affected in same manner as like cholinesterases, which is present at the synaptic cleft. Please next. So we are measuring the plasma cholinesterase or pseudocholinesterase for diagnosis because it is easy to measure and easily available. Usual diagnostic value is the 50% reduction uh, from the normal values, which are around uh, 8 to 18 international units per milliliter. Then Progressive increase in pseudocholinesterase with treatment is the indirect proof of uh, getting organ phosphorus poisoning. The next slide, please. So mechanism action, uh, acetylcholine acts as the synapse uh, for signaling and it binds to the acetylcholine receptor. And when acetylcholine esterase uh, comes in the picture, it binds to the um, acetylcholine and it uh, prevents it from binding with the acetylcholine receptor. And the organ of phosphorus competitively inhibit the acety, uh, acetylcholine esterase, and thus it also uh, acts in the postsynaptic neuron or muscle cell, and thus it also prevents binding of the acetylcholine to the uh, acetylcholine receptors. Next slide, please. So coming to the patient, which we were talking about, the treatment given, firstly, we have to secure the ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation. Then the gastric lab was, was done, and it was uh, the sample collectors was sent to the forensic laboratory for testing, and atropine injection was given, and PAM injection, that is pralidoxime injection, was given, and 1 to 2 gram for past 15 to 30 minutes, inclusion, repeating 1 hour if necessary. Next slide, please. So coming to the patient, the blood pressure and the pupil size was monitored in every hour. It was noticed that the pupil size was increasing and the patient is uh, improving gradually. Next slide, please. So the person bringing the patient uh, showed this organ phosphorus poison, malathion. Next slide, please. So coming to the who classification there is highly toxic organophosphate and there is moderately toxic highly toxic example phosphamidone ethylparathion methylparathion chlorothiophos carbophenethion and moderately toxic and malathion phenethion temifos phenethrotin and diazinone next slide please so route of exposure it is through inhalation route through ingestion route through absorption and also through the eyes Next slide, please. So it's the autonomic nervous system, uh, adrenergic and cholinergic system, and the receptors uh, present, um, re respectively. We are coming to the next slide for the discussion. Please, next slide. So sign and symptom of organ phosphate poisoning based on the receptor. When the receptor involved is nicotinic receptor, and its, stimulate, its stimulation leads to near, uh, weakness, fascicle, cramps, paralysis, tachycardia, and hypertension. Its action is based on the neuromuscular junction, autonomic ganglia, adrenal medulla, and central adrenal medulla. And coming to the muscarinic receptor stimulation, uh, which uh, acts on the central 
which acts on the central nervous system also, the manifestations are anxiety, restlessness, ataxia, convulsion, insomnia, dysarthria, tremor, coma, respiratory depression, and circulatory collapse. Uh, from the M1 to M5 receptors, M2 receptors mainly uh, found in heart and it causes bradycard and hypertension. M3 and M2 receptor acts on people and it causes blood vision and meiosis. M3, M2 receptor also acts on exocrine glands and it uh, causes respiratory symptoms like rhinorrhea, bronchorrhea, gastrointestinal symptoms like increased salivation, diarrhea, ocular symptoms like increased lacrimation and other excessive sweating. And M3 and M2 receptor, which is found in smooth muscle, uh, the manifestation shows as bronchospasm, abdominal pain, urinary incontinence. Next slide, please. So phases of OP poisoning. First, coming to the acute OP poisoning, it is within 24 hours of exposure. It uh, it, uh, the effects are divided into muscarinic, nicotinic, axinous, and CNS effect. Uh, we will discuss this, it later. Then number two, the intermediate syndrome, which will be manifested in, in one to two days, and delayed neuropathy, uh, which will be manifested in 24 hours to two weeks, and neuropsychiatric disorder after two weeks. Next slide, please. So acute OB poisoning, the features are muscarinic features like the mnemonic we already know, the dumbbell, D for diarrhea, U for urination, M for meiosis, B for bronchorrhea and bronchospasm, E for emesis, lacrimation, salivation, and sweating. And nicotinic features are muscle weakness, muscle fasciculation, muscle paralysis, hypertension, and tachycardia. CNS features are fatigue, confusion, unconsciousness, seizure, ataxia, and respiratory depression. Next slide, please. Then uh, it's the pictorial presentation of the muscarinic effect, like excessive sweating, meiosis bronchorrhea spasm, then bradycardia, hypertension. Next slide, please. Bronchorrhea is the early cause of mortality. As we already know that any problem in airway can uh, cause death uh, early. So bronchorrhea can cause early death. Excess fluid secretion in airway, obstruction of the upper and lower airways, pulmonary edema leading to hypoxia, leading to death. Next slide. So intermediate syndrome, coming to the intermediate syndrome, it is, uh, it is manifested 24 to 96 hours after poisoning, after the cholinergic phase settles. Excess acetylcholine at neuromuscular junction causes down regulation of nicotinic receptors, characterized by proximal neck muscle weakness, leading to respiratory distress and failure. And it lasts for a few days about, uh, to about three weeks. Next slide, please. Now coming to op induced polyneuropathy, it is delayed, rare, and neurotoxic effect one to five weeks after severe acute poisoning due to slow release of OP from body fat. Next slide, please. So diagnosis of OP poisoning, it's mainly uh, clinically based on the history of ingestion of poison, characteristic clinical features, clinical improvement after atropine or auxin given, inhibition of cholinesterase activity. Next slide, please. So other tests of prognostic values like hyperglycemia, neurophilic, neutrophilic leukocytosis, proteinuria or glycosuria and blood pH level, that is acidosis. Next slide, please. Reasons of high glucose level in OP poison, it, these are oxidative stress, renal tubular damage, stimulations of adrenal gland and release of catecholamine. Next slide, please. So the treatment given already this like uh, management of ABC first, then gastric lavage, atropine injection, PAM injection. Next slide, please. Gastric lavage is a process of cleaning out the contents of the stomach. It has been used as a mean of eliminating poisons in the stomach. You can use the activated charcoal along with the gastric lavage to uh, decrease the effects of the OP poison in the body. Next slide, please. So coming to the atropine, it's a muscarinic antagonist. Aim of the atropine uh, administration is to reverse cholinergic features to improve the cardiac and the respiratory functions. Target endpoint of atropinization are as follows. Drying of pulmonary secretion, that is clear lung filled on auscultation, high uh, heart rate uh, more than 80 bits per minute, uh, systolic BP more than 80 mmHg, pupils no longer pin pinpoint, dry axilla and bowel signs just present. Next slide, please. So coming to the PAM injection that is pralidoxin, it belongs to the group of compound called oxygens that bind, bind to the organ phosphate inactivated acetylcholinesterases. Next slide. So this is a pictorial presentation. 
uh, acetylcholine esterases uh, acts on acetylcholine to break uh, it break this into acetic acid and choline next slide please and uh, the when op poison uh, comes in the picture it uh, it causes the uh, binding with the uh, normal acetylcholine and it inhibits it to bind to the receptor, CH receptor. The extent of potential reactivation of organophosphate inhibited acetylcholine esterase decreases with time, a phenomenon called aging. Aging is due to dealkylization of the alco alkoxyl group of the residue bound to the enzymes. Next slide, please. So this is also a pictorial presentation. When the inhibitor molecule is absent, uh, the substrate binds to the active site, that is the and uh, the allosteric site uh, remains empty. And when the inhibitor is present, it binds to the allosteric site and it does the conformational change in the receptor. And so the substrates cannot fit into the active site. Next slide, please. So action of the PAM, the pralidoxin actually binds to the other hub, hub that is the unblocked anionic site of the active site and then displaces the phosphate from the serine residue. The conjoint poison or the antidote then unbinds from the site and thus regenerates the fully functional enzymes. Next slide, please. So these are the questions we, uh, we can answer now after the discussion. So what are the organophosphate poisons? What can be the reason of slurred speech and the altered behavior related to that patient? Firstly, we have discussed. Then why atropine was given in this case and what is the role of PAM? What can be the reason of pinpoint people and what can be the reason of low cholesterol level? What can be the reason of high glucose level in the blood in that patient? So coming to the next slide, there is some important uh, journal discussion, latest journal discussion. The link is given as uh, follows, but I, I would like to discuss about some important uh, topics which uh, which is uh, found interesting to me number one the analysis of risk factors for complications in patients with the acute organ phosphorus poisoning and nursing strategies in the uh, jiang wen zuan it's uh, done in china the conclusion was the age 40 year old basic disease doses more than 100 ml of op poison time from poisoning to rescue one hour dca score less than 10 points are risk factor for complications of acute organ phosphorus poisoning patient therefore targeted nursing measures shall be adopted for such condition to reduce the incidence of the complications next the lipid emulsion for the treatment of acute organ phosphate poisoning an open label randomized trial uh, done uh, and the conclusion was there is no apparent benefit in acute op poisoning however an extended dose appears safe for the indication next the factors associated with time to successful waning in mechanically ventilated organ phosphate poison patient. Uh, this uh, study conclusion was the initial RDW and initial doses of atropine were found to be the strongest factor associated with time to successful waning in mechanically ventilated OP poison patient. So RDW and atropine can be used as simple risk assessment tools in OP poisoning. So below the link is given for the journal discussion, there are more uh interesting uh interesting topics re related to the op poison uh, next slide please so mm, this is all for uh, today thank you very much and thank you same as Beng bengal team for inviting me thank you thank you dr Aparachita. um so that's one of the common seen uh, poisoning across but yes. uh, as you say that uh, management there's been a lot of uh, literature on that as to Mm -hmm. is to be given, not to be given, what's the best way? So let's move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, thanks, Dr. Prajita. Please request you to stay around because during the discussion time, we can take Thank some you questions. so much. Thank you, Dr. Nishu. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Bismai Kumar, Senior Consultant Nephrologist and Transplant Physician, Narayana Super Specialty Hospital, Howrah. Dr. Bismai Kumar, welcome to Semicon. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Am I audible? You're clearly audible. Yeah. Uh, Would you want to share your slides? Yeah, I'd like to do that. Uh, just, just give me a moment, please. Please allow me to share. Yes. Uh, we can see your slide. It's in a slideshow. If you can make it full screen, it would be sure, sure. Is it visible now? 
uh, it still remains in the slide show. Yeah, now it has come. Now it has come. Thank you very All much. All good to start. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, SEMI, Society of Emergency Medicine, uh, Dr. Steep, Dr. Ramjit, and the entire scientific committee for giving me this topic, which is uh, my favorite topic. And uh, today, I'm a nephrologist speaking to you, uh, and I will also speak something which may sound Greek and Latin to you at first, but if you hear carefully, we'll all correlate to this. Now, my feeling about hemoperfusion is that it's actually the dialysis underutilized. Now, I've been working in this field for last around 12 years, and I feel that dialysis is still underutilized, uh, and it, it hasn't got that opportunity which it should be provided for a uh, for a human survival, which we are actually doing medicine. So today I shall try to summarize my experience and my learning over last 10 years with this modality of hemoperfusion, uh, which is largely still, I think is obscure and mostly unexplored in just 12 minutes. And I try to stick to this time. So uh, quickly uh, going into, uh, you're all aware being in emergency department because these are the uh, dialysis modalities which you are seeing day in day out. Now these are various modalities of dialysis. HD means hemodialysis, HF means hemofiltration, HDF means hemodiafiltration, CRRT means continuous renal replacement therapy. And the last one, HP means hemoperfusion, which is the topic of the day. Now how we go around these modalities of dialysis is basically based on their surface area of the, uh, of the dialyzer, the blood flow of the dialyzer and the dialysate components which we use. So as you go up on the dialysis modality like HD, that is hemodialysis to CRRT, basically you, you are trying to change the dynamics of the blood flow and you're trying to change the, uh, the surface area and the surface pore membrane, uh, the pores inside the semi permeable membrane of the dialysate. So the advantage which dialysis uh, has, it has uh, to regulate the water and electrolyte and the acid base balance. And as you go up the order, we go into HF and HDF, basically it becomes more costlier. And uh, sometimes you need to go uh, in a different mode, which is CRRT, which is basically for unstable patients, unstable means hemodynamically unstable patients, uh, where you need to uh, do this modality. Then the most important one, which is our part today, is the hemoperfusion. Basically, it is important because in dialysis, we can remove small molecules, small to mid-sized molecules. I'll tell you what is small to mid-sized molecules. Whereas in the hemoperfusion, we can actually remove middle to large or bigger molecule, and which is our area of interest, especially when you're doing uh, something, uh, you're treating uh, poisoning. But the disadvantage is with hemoperfusion, you actually cannot correct the acid base balance. You cannot remove fluid. So that is the disadvantage part of hemoperfusion. So to start with, basically hemoperfusion, it's, it's an extracorporeal blood purification modality. So what is an extracorporeal system? Extracorporeal means anything which is done outside the body where we are actually taking the blood from the venous circulation outside into the tubular circulation, which includes dialyzer, the plastic tubes, the machine. And there we are using the treatment modality. It can be hemoperfusion for sepsis. It can be ECMO. So all this comes are dialysis. This comes from the extracorporeal therapy. So what we do, basically, we pass this uh, anticoagulated blood with this sort of device, which is basically in the shape of a column. And that has a absorbed absorbent particle. Now, what is an absorbent particle? Anything which absorbs, it takes inside it and doesn't let it go out. So that is an absorbent particle. So it is used for removal of toxins in poison, but it has wider varieties. You can also use for cytokines in septic patients. You can easily even impregnate antibiotics and provide it to the patient. Now, what is the mechanism? The mechanism is the whole blood passes through this column, which contain this fixed absorbent particles and whatever molecules, paraquat, toxins, drugs, which are in the range of this 100 to 40,000 Daltons binds to these particles and are removed as the blood exits the column. So a higher molecular weight solute are adsorbed 
less efficiently. So if you have a bigger molecule, probably or a protein bound molecule, probably you will not get this benefit. But you have to have specific size molecule which can actually get into that resin and get adsorbed into the resin. So these are basically charcoals which are commonly used. And now charcoal is becoming obsolete, and we have newer resins which has basically hydrocarbon polymers or the polystyrene which is available. Because of their better bioavailability and a better biocompatibility. Now, what uh, 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 the benefit charcoal has? The charcoal is a water soluble molecule. So, whatever drugs which are water soluble, we can use charcoal. Whereas resin has a greater lipid soluble. So, whatever drugs or uh, poisons which are lipid soluble, you can remove through resins. So, adsorption may be modified. You can actually these resins are uh, are. Can be bioengineered. You can actually modify this resin uh, based on the molecule you want to remove. You want to remove interleukin six. You can have the same absorbent. You can remove bil bilirubin. You can have the same. You want to remove paraquat. You can have the same. So you can have basically various resins which can make you able to remove these endotoxin or toxins or antibodies which you want. And that's the beauty of hemocompletion. Now I'll just uh, uh, show you in this diagram. Now, this is the column. And this, which you see over here, uh, the meshwork of uh, this molecule, this is the resin molecule. And the, these are the blood molecules which is going to pass. We have the RBC here, these are the small molecules, the A molecule, which we want to remove. And these are some A molecules which are protein bound. And the yellow A molecule basically are getting released from the protein bound fraction. So we have that drugs also. So what is happening is normally the small molecules gets out because the size is not appropriate for the small molecule. But what happens with the A molecule, the, it is specifically targeting this molecule. So it gets stuck in this resins. And these are the A molecule which gets stuck in the resins and RBCs and all, they are not stuck. So they just pass out. So when you get at the end of the, uh, of the column, you get a purified blood, free of toxins, free of drugs and metabolites. As per your requirement, you can use this absorbent column. So we have this absorbent columns like charcoal. We have uh, this neutral macroporous resins. Now some there are newer engineered uh, resins like which are used for uh, uh, bilirubins and uh, and sepsis. So they are anion exchange resins which can used which can be used as a hemoperfusion cartridge. And this is a picture of a hemoperfusion. We all seen this as an emergency medicine the physician. You would have seen this. It's a very common gamma filter. Now, uh, the problem with this was this was done in the older days. The problem was it has a low clearance for middle molecules and it has a poor biocompatibility. So it can cause reactions. It can be harmful for blood cell. It, it's, it has a weak cytoskeletal. So it can easily break off and form embolus. So that is called a charcoal embolus. And it may not be that biocompatible. So it can cause reactions. Now, the benefit with newer resin is basically it's more hydrophobicity. It has a molecule sieve mechanism where you can bind to this molecule much well through this van der Waals forces. And this is how it goes and just uh, uh, attaches to the specific areas and it gets stuck over there. And then uh, the, the other part, the pure blood goes out and the toxins are actually stuck in this resin. And that is how the hemoprofusion is working. Now, comparing the charcoal hemoperfusion and the resin hemoperfusion is basically charcoal is unselective and resin is a selective. You can actually be on engineering it and charcoal is what is your just the charcoal which you're providing it. So it, around 13 to 50 nanometer you can selectively use for various toxins. Uh, charcoal is good enough for small to middle molecules, whereas resins are good for middle to macro molecules and protein bound molecules as well. Charcoals are harmful to blood cell, poor, poor biocompatibility. It can form charcoal embolus, foam embolism, whereas resin, you don't have that problem. And um, it is definitely finding it more wider use in resin, especially if you are using it for immune diseases, liver disease, renal failure, and definitely for all kinds of poisoning. So that is a basically indication of hemoperfusion. Any case of acute poisoning with drug and, toxi uh, and toxins, especially you don't have any specific antidote, it will enhance the removal. The dose exceeds 30% of the scavenging capacity. And intake, if you don't know what is the, because most of these people, they are in the altered sensorium, uh, family members don't know what is the drug taken. They take time to get the drug, uh, the, the label of the drug which the patient has taken. So in such case, definitely we have to be very early on target. Poisoning patients with liver, kidney diseases, 
especially patient who have already have a kidney disease then it becomes tougher for the normal of the toxin then you require this hemoperfusion so uh, another indication is having the blood concentration of the drug the poison has reached a lethal dose or has not been reached to the estimate uh, but estimate has to continue to absorb so there hemoperfusion is indicated so this is how uh, the indication of hemoperfusion comes into uh, the poisoning I, now the indication uh, uh, i think 7 minutes are there i'm just cross 7 minutes so uh, you you have couple of more minutes dr bismuth i am 7 minutes 47 seconds now <laughs> my, um, my own we, we had the timer on you can take a yeah, couple okay. of more minutes please okay please so uh, removal of lipid soluble especially higher molecule bound toxins uh, are good poisoning like paraquat poisoning barbiturate thiopyrin valproate cover we all know this that what are the indications so there are huge list of these drugs which can actually remove by using hemoperfusion i was listening to this paraquat uh, topic also definitely hemoperfusion is always better if early clearance of paraquat is required especially when you use it with dialysis your efficiency to remove this uh, molecule becomes greater especially high flux dialysis so we have several retrospective studies which actually uh, has shown that it has an increased survival when performed with 4 to 5 hours of paraquat within 4 to 5 hours of paraquat ingestion but that actually doesn't happen in reality because patient presents late and you have other modalities like hemodialysis normal hemodialysis which also can be used with hemoperfusion now this is a picture what paraquat can do to a simple grass you can see there somebody asking why the paraquat is so poisonous now you see that is a normal grass and this is the the whole grass has burnt out now what is happening is paraquat actually to free radical is destroying and cause uh, the tissue and causing severe fibrosis and once lung fibrosis sets in then it's just difficult and it's easily available drug you can find it in every farmer's home it is the drug which is used uh, it is not a drug it's a commodity used by the farmers in, in rural india and there has been severe protest on this uh, many countries have already banned like uh, for example sweden kuwait but it is still prevalent in our country do anybody has an idea what is the current market value of paraquat business it is around 107 million dollars in 2005 and this share is going to increase to 53 million by 2026 you can amount imagine the amount of uh, usage of this, this drug so be ready to have more poisoning cases and so we have to be more um, acquainted with this modality of treatment now how a, a prescription of dialysis hemoperfusion uh, uh, happens now you are using a column the column is the, what is the weight around 100 to 300 grams of activated charcoal or you may be using a 300 to 6 Yeah, uh, 50 grams of resin. Access, you can have a tunnel access or a non-tunnel access, whichever a, a dialysis line is best preferred. And you have to use the cartridge size as per the body surface area. You are using a uh, heparin as an anticoagulant. The target of the heparin should be two to two point five times of APTT, and approximately what heparin we are using is around six thousand to ten thousand internationally. Blood flow, we keep it around three hundred, but that is based on the hemodynamic profile of the patient duration normally we give it for 4 hours we do not reuse the device we throw it we always single use it we have to reuse another device if you are doing the second one and definitely repeat treatment is helpful because there is tissue release of the molecules so monitoring drug level is the best uh, way to monitor your effect but uh, unfortunately is not available all the center and it takes too long for the drug level to come to be clinically useful for us to uh, take care of this patient and platelet count is another important thing which have to manage this is how the hemodial hemoperfusion operating procedure works this is a pump line and this this side is the cartridge pit if you are using a dialysis you have to go and put it post cartridge post uh, hemoperfusion cartridge you have to place the dialyzer and complication thrombocytopenia 1 hypocalcemia hypoglycemia and leukopenia uh, sometimes you may have a of blood temperature going down and hypotensions if your patients are already on vasopressors combination of hemodialysis and hemoperfusion it's another very interesting topic because it is definitely very useful uh, you can actually remove fluid correct electrolytes you can actually help the patient if the patient is having acute kidney injury and uh, if you are combining both you have to use first the hemodialysis and then go for hemoperfusion because you have to save the patient you have to correct hypokalemia so that is the first thing you have patient that may kill the patient 
and if you are using together you use the hemoperfusion cartridge followed by upstream you are using the dialysis cartridge so hemodialysis will always enhance your elimination of uh, the poison if you are using in combination with hemoperfusion and you can also correct uh, the metabolic abnormality your clearance is better especially if you are using it for low molecular weight less than 500 dalton especially if you uh, if it's small volume of this tissue low degree of protein bonding and high water solubility here the hemodialysis goes better than hemoperfusion especially if you have drugs like amphotericin d and vancomycin poisoning where you can use high flux to remove it much better so if you are using the combination especially if the patient is having high tissue binding high liver lipid solubility may be beneficial but there are some uh, drugs which it's difficult to handle like tca we have just discussed digoxin calcium channel blockers so hemodialysis removes the toxic metabolites like methanol glycol all these things are all known to you there has been a systemic review which has shown that hemodialysis is actually somewhere better uh, especially if you are using in metformin poisoning or so so there is a huge list uh, of uh, drugs which can be removed for hemodialysis itself like alcohol ethanol methanol lithium salicylates and uh, contraindication if you are having hemorrhage you have to use heparin and then it's a difficult choice severe thrombocytopenia coagulopathy hypotensive patient complication like hypophosphatemia alkalemia and dds like dialysis disequilibrium can happen post dialysis now <clears throat> these are the various drug levels drug concentration where one uh, over other is uh, preferred um, i'm not going to the detail of that i'll just share this video to you because uh, uh, i have been quite a, uh, a lot of work on that now what protocol we are following uh, at present in our hospital we are doing something called high flux high time high flow dialysis with hemoperfusion what is this high flux high time high flow dialysis now i use a combi combi dialysis i use a hemoperfusion with a high flow dialysis high flow means i keep the blood to around 400 ml per minute i extend the dialysis time which is conventionally 4 hours to 6 hours and i use a high flux dialyzer which can help me remove 8 to 10 nanometers uh, or molecule uh, pore size you can remove 5 to 60 kilo dialysis so that is the benefit i get and what this benefit i have seen and this is my experience i used it in four paraquat poisoning where i had 100% benefit where all the patients were discharged one of them uh, interesting stories were there with uh, not because of short of time not doing that and there were some uh, uh, drugs which we removed pregabalin we used hemoperfusion patient was discharged tell me certain amlodipine 160 tablets of amitriptyline and tramadol one patient took and we did uh, hemoperfusion discharge successfully two patients we couldn't save because uh, of uh, uh, they presented late and uh, we didn't get proper referral at that particular time uh, this was our experience from uh, the hospital which we were working. But I had a previous experience also when I was in a government hospital. There we had, uh, we didn't have that much of uh, high flux dialysis. We used to do normal dialysis. So we modified the dialysis a little bit. We extended the dialysis time. We um, used the little high flow dialysis in that time. Then in that, uh, we had four paraquet. Uh, in that, we had one survivor. But there we didn't have the hemoperfusion cartridge. So unfortunately, we had to work only with dialysis. Uh, then uh, two peripheral centers uh, we did uh, to Paraguay where uh, I could provide it was around six hours distance from uh, the main city and then we send the Paraguay uh, population cartridge and provide two survivors uh, of and there were lethal doses around 30 40 uh, milli, uh, ml and um, uh, and uh, the last three uh, cases were in uh, small uh, hospitals where actually we could do because these patients reach the center and then we get a referral and these referrals are usually on suburban areas and there we lost all the three patients to paraquat we could do only one session of hemoperfusion with this patient so the take home measure is definitely you have to appreciate the capability of hemoperfusion as an efficient extracorporeal therapy and it should be done as early as possible so early referral to center with hemoperfusion and hemodialysis facility should be done proper rational use of hemodialysis is possible if you can have a facility of high flux high hemodialysis it's always better and patients should get the best chance of survival and uh, in, with combination of medical therapy, hemoperfusion, and hemodialysis as early as possible from the zero hour. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity. Great. Uh, that was in detail and going through every aspect of hemodialysis and its role in poisoning. Thanks, Dr. Bismi. <coughs> We will just uh, take a couple of minutes if we have any questions on the poisoning. I think we have come to the end of the poisoning module teaching for Semicon 2022.
Um, any questions? Anybody has any questions on these? We've had interesting talks on parakeet poisoning. We've had uh, tricyclic antidepressants. We had OP poisoning. And to, uh, you know, uh, finish it all in a good way. Okay, somebody has a question. Role of ECMO in parakeet and aluminum sulfide poisoning. If yes, um, if yes, is see? this the new way out as both poisons have high death rate? If you allow me to take this question, because please, please, sir, Dr. Bismarck, please, 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 please. Basically, yeah, it's a basically extracorporeal oxygenation system. Okay, it doesn't help you in poison removal because that cartridge is not good enough to absorb the molecule. So possibly it will not be a good help. It may be a help uh, for oxygenating the patient, especially if the patient has already entered a fibrosis, a lung fibrosis, a pulmonary fibrosis, which is the end point of all these patients. But possibly. Uh, it may not be a good idea to have just an ECMO yeah. food. Yeah. I, I, I agree on that. Actually, the role of what you want to do first in poisoning, you need to get the substance out. And the one what is going to do that better is a hemodialysis and your antidotes and your interventions than an ECMO. ECMO is a common thing that you do to improve the cellular oxygenation. So it can be any condition. It can be poisoning, it can be sepsis, but this is ECMO is done to ensure your cellular oxygenation happens better. So yes, ECMO has been uh, quite rampantly used in most of these scenarios. Let's say one of these patients arrest, then it becomes an uh, you know indication of doing an ECMO. If it is a prolonged arrest and you know early arrival, less comorbids, and you think they have a good chance, but uh, not a direct evidence is what uh, I would think. Anybody else, anybody has a take on this? Do you want to say anything? Dr. Ajay, Dr. Aparajita, you are there on the call. No, I think Dr. Vishnu has clearly uh, clarified the doubt which was there regarding ECMO. Nothing much to say from uh, I can Great. add on something that there is some role which is coming off of plasma paresis. Now, what is plasma paresis? Now, plasma paresis is basically what we remove the antibodies and uh, your proteins from the blood. We remove the plasma, we get the RBC, WBC platelet back to the body. And we give new plasma to the patient or it can be replaced by albumin or saline. Now, what uh, is this modality is important, especially if you're handling a late case. Now, that will help you if the drug is protein bound. Now, all this modality will not help you if the patient is having a protein bound model. So you are using this molecule to use remove the free bound molecule, not the protein bound. So when you are using this modality, it actually can also enhance. Now we have to wait for more studies to come uh, because the hypotension, use of heparin, all these things are a little bit of controversy in this situation. But uh, definitely that is another modality which is coming up for poison removal using plasma pens. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you all the speakers for a wonderful afternoon. Like I said, it's post lunch and we are talking about toxins. There can't be a more lethal combination than this, but uh, you all kept it alive and you all kept it very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, next over to Dr. Abhishek. Is there a break now? Do we continue? Yeah, we'll have a two minutes break. Okay, just run a two video. minutes break, so please don't yeah. go anywhere. Just move yeah. your legs around. Have very soon we'll be in the next. Uh, very soon yeah. we'll start our next session. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all who did the poisoning module. Thank you very much.
thank you uh, welcome back all to, to the session uh, 12th session uh, that will be on obstetric and gynecology uh, and the, this session also will be moderated by dr naga nishal uh, over to you dr naga hi so here we come again and uh, let's move ahead to the next topic the next topic would be delivered by dr meghna dr meghna is you can bring her yeah yeah, and Dr. Meghna is Consultant Emergency Medicine, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Patpat Ganj, New Delhi. And she's Secretary for Semi Delhi Chapter. Topic would be Maternal CPR and Post ROSC Care. All yours, Dr. Meghna, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll have to share my screen, please. Yes, please. You would want to run your uh, PPT, you can start yes. sharing. Yeah, we have something coming up on the screen. Yeah, could you make it full slide, please? Is it now full slide? Yes, yes, you're good, you're audible, your slides are there, please go ahead. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here. I'm Dr. Meghna Halder. I'm here to talk about paternal CPR and post ROSC care. So to talk about why sudden cardiac arrest in pregnancy is important. It's a rare occurrence in most of our emergencies. It's a challenging and far more complex than other cardiac arrests that we see in our emergencies, precisely because there are two lives at stake here. And also with pregnancy brings with it the physiological and the anatomical changes. At, at one point of time, it will also require a multidisciplinary approach. So if you have to talk about what are the different causes for which the cardiac arrest in pregnancy occurs, it ranges widely from eclampsia, intracranial hemorrhage, hemorrhage from spleening artery rupture, hepatic rupture, or antepartum hemorrhage. Also drug toxicities like magnesium sulfate or illicit drugs, pulmonary embolism, amniotic fluid embolism, cardiac causes such as arrhythmias, infarctions, cardiomyopathy, and definitely you will have your sepsis, hypoglycemia, aortic dissection, and anaphylaxis. So there are a whole wide range of reasons for which they can present to us in an emergency. So now to talk about precisely as to what changes occurs in the pregnancy. Basically, after 28th week of pregnancy, we see dramatic changes in the physiological uh, make of the maternal care. So the plasma volume goes up to 50%, which results in dilutional anemia. The heart rate increases, the cardiac output increases about 40%. The uterine blood flow, it takes a huge demand on the cardiac output. There's a reduction in the systemic vasculature resistance, and there's a decrease in the arterial blood pressure, and there is a decrease in the venous return. So what does all of that translate into during sleep PR? So basically, it increases our circulation demands during CPR. We have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. We also have decreased um, rapid development of hypoxia and decreased buffering capacity for the maternal resuscitation. So this is all of this has to be taken in consideration while resuscitation, resuscitating a maternal case. So let's take first the airway consideration that one has to think about. It's a physiologically difficult airway. So ideally, the most experienced emergency physician should be taking care of the airway. And also early intubation is advised. So basically, there is very decreased tolerance to the hypoxia and apnea. There is hyperemia, hypersecretion and edema of the airway mucosa, which leads to bleeding and in turn, difficult visualization during the intubation. Also, because of the gravid uterus, they are most likely to regurgitate and aspirate. So an early intubation and the most experienced physician. Let's talk about the modifications to CPR that are suggested. So basically, the modifications come into play only when the fetal viability is being considered, So, which is about 22 to 26 weeks of gestation. Before 22 to 24 weeks of gestation, all efforts should go for maternal resuscitation and with no modification to, to CPR. After 22 to 26 weeks, however, we need to minimize the aortic cable compression. 
we also need to start having the preparations for a perimortem cesarean section. However, there are no changes in the ACLS guidelines in the approach to a maternal resuscitation. There are no changes in the defibrillation modes or the jewels required, no changes in the drugs. Earlier, it used to be suggested that you place your hands a bit above when you're doing maternal resuscitation, but there are no scientific evidence to support the same. So except for the fact that you need to minimize the aorta cable compression and prepare for the perimortem C-section if required, there's no other modifications to CPR. So how do we do the aorta cable compression minimization? So it can be done with one-handed technique as shown or a two-handed technique. Also, there are cardiac, cardiac wedges or the bed can be tilted to the left side. It's a class one level of evidence C and that during a gravid uterus in cardiac arrest, it, there should be uterine displacement. So if you have to summarize this in the AHA guidelines, you have to continue with your high quality CPR, your defibrillation as and when indicated, all other ACLS interventions to continue. Then assemble the maternal cardiac arrest team, for which we will then consider the cause of the arrest. For all maternal interventions, it is basically airway management, 100% O2, IV access to be placed above diaphragm so that we are counteracting the femoral and the saphenous vein compression. And also, if the patient was already on IV magnesium, you have to stop that drug. And because of the magnesium, they can be result in hyperkalemia, which should be addressed with calcium chloride or calcium gluconate. Then continue our CPR and defibrillation as and when required. For obstructed interventions, basically we have to do the lateral uterine deplacement. We have to prepare for perimortem cesarean delivery. So if there is no ROSC within five minutes of CPR, we should prepare for the delivery and the neonatal team to receive the neonate. So the concept of perimortem C-section was brought by Katz et al. in 1986. It, the four minutes was given as a time frame because after that, there was irreversible brain damage and very minimal chances of recovery, both for the mother or the fetus. The recent recommendation by Royal College of Obstetric and Gynecology said that if there is a need for PMCS after four to five minutes, the viability of the fetal is not to be checked or to waste time for checking the viability. There. Basically, that is to aid the maternal resuscitation. It reduces your uterine blood flow. It relieves the diaphragmatic pressure. So PMCS is basically indicated after four to five minutes of maternal resuscitation, which has not achieved ROSC. How do we do PMCS? There's a vertical incision either from the xiphoid or from the umbilicus to the, down to the pubic symphysis, plant dissection, expose the peritoneum, then again a vertical incision over the uh, inferior part of the uterus, lift it away from the fetus, and then with blunt scissors, extend this uh, incision line. Deliver the baby, clamp and uh, cut the cord, and then deliver the products of conception, and continue with the resuscitation. They had done this uh, study in UK in the period of 2011 to 2014, in which they found 66 cardiac arrest in pregnancy. And they found that the percentage of PMCS, which was successful, was when the time duration was minimal. So we see that the time at which we make that decision is of essence. So let's talk about post ROSC care. So after an extremely adrenal rush uh, resuscitation, we now have the pulse. So great job. But now the real work begins. We have to intubate the patient and secure the uh, ventilation status if not done earlier. But we should not rush into it. We should first stabilize the hemodynamics. So the goal BP uh, systolic blood pressure should be around more than 90 mmHg. Your target map should be about 65 mmHg. Next, if we are connecting to the ventilator settings, we should have lung protector settings. What are those? Tidal volume of six to eight ml per kg, fats to be maintained above 94%, and end tidal CO2 
to be kept between 30 to 40 mmHg. ECG as soon as possible so that we can rule out any ST elevation MI and if there is one, we can then process the patient to move to uh, for cardiac angiography and PCI. Also, we need to check the response of the patient. If there is none, then we should aim for targeted temperature management. Glycemic and seizure control is also important. So how do we achieve targeted temperature management is by keeping the temperature between 32 to 36 degrees centigrade. And this should continue till at least 24 hours. We basically need to be cognizant about the post-cardiac arrest syndrome, which is the period where it is, the patient is at highest risk of developing ventricular arrhythmias and reperfusion injuries. This is basically divided into four categories. One is because of the persistent precipitating pathology. Second is due to the anoxic brain injury. Third, because of the post-cardiac arrest myocardial dysfunction. And fourthly, because of the systemic ischemia and reperfusion response. Also, the anoxic injury is aggravated further with insults with poor glycemic control and hyperoxia. So, as AHA guidelines also suggest, that we need to optimize ventilation and oxygenation, intubate and ventilate. Hypertension should be avoided by IV boluses or by vasopressin infusions. 12 lead ECG as soon as possible. And then, if uh, not an MI, then ICU care. We should definitely not forget our reversible causes, which is our 5 Hs and 5 Ds. Hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion acidosis, hypo or hyperkalemia, hypothermia, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponades, toxins, cardiac and pulmonary thrombosis. So basically, aggressive temperature monitoring and control to 32 to 36. Monitoring of seizures, we can preempt with antiepileptics, correct electrolytes or hypoglycemia and monitor frequently. Also to nurse the patient at 45 degrees angle and aim for a higher end of the normal PP. We can use inotropes. However, if the patient is with the background of trauma, we should have uh, blood products as early as possible. We should also aim for the PCO2 to be at 4.5 to 5.5 kPa and use the ETCO to monitor to titrate ventilation. So from me, the take home points would be an emergency department should have a maternal cardiac arrest code. There should be retraining with mock drills. Equipment should be marked and maintained. And for ROSC care is of essence to improve outcomes. Never forget our reversible causes. ECG is crucial after achieving ROSC. Targeted temperature management ensures neuroprotection. And definitely enjoy your adrenaline rush in the emergency medicine. These are my references. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Meghna. Um, adrenaline, you. for sure, that's a double whammy there. And uh, you're going to have more than adrenaline that you need to deal with situation. Uh, I would request you to be around. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, we you. will move on to our next speaker, Dr. Sujit. Dr. Sujit, slides, please. Okay. So, Dr. Sujit Singh is President, Semi UP Chapter, Medical Director and Head, Emergency and Critical Care Department, Sharda Narayan Hospital, UP. Dr. Sujit, good afternoon. And uh, would you like to share? Is that your screen or you want us to run the show? Dr. Sujit, you are on mute. You are still on mute. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Very good afternoon, everybody. And a uh, uh, big congratulations to uh, Bengal team for doing a, such a wonderful uh, semicon. And today, my talk is the eclipse and management in the emergency room. And uh, first, uh, we start with the case which came into the our emergency room. Uh, 
30 year old female with GP0, gestational age of 33 plus weeks, hypertension and uh, proteinuria since 11 weeks of gestational age, and this prenatal examination at a local clinic. Dyspnea occurred two days ago. Dyspnea reoccurred with conscious changes with the heart rate of 110. And in emergency room, the BP was 221 by 120 with the respiratory rate of 44 and SpO2 of 88%. With uh, the body weight of the patient is 80 kg. And the, uh, after auscultation with the Krebs over the bilateral basal lung. One of episode of seizure in the emergency room we get. So this type of patient, if came to our ER, then there is a clear cut diagnosis because the patient is uh, gravida and with the seizure and with high BP. But what other things we can think in our ER when patients come? That is the differential diagnosis. The patient may be uh, consideration of the cerebral uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cerebral hemorrhage and hypertensive encolopathy, encephalitis, hypoglycemia, meningitis, stroke hemorrhage or stroke ischemia, metabolic disorder, or sometimes undiagnosed tumor. So these are the things which we consider. Now we came on the diagnosis of the eclampsia. Eclampsia manifests as a one seizure or more with each seizure generally lasting for 60 to 75 seconds. Hypertension greater than 140 by 90 of the gestational phase after 20 weeks and uh, proteinuria in 2 plus with or without coexisting systematic abnormalities of the kidneys, liver or blood. Inclimpsia in the absence of hypertension with proteinuria occurs in 38% of cases reported. And similarly, the hypertension was absent in 16% of cases reviewed in the United States. Seizure or postictal state is 100%. So any pregnant woman with a uh, hypertension and a seizure, then it came into the strong consideration of the uh, eclampsia. 83% of uh, headache, usually in the frontal region, and vision disturbance found in 44%, such, such as a blurred vision and photophobia. Amnesia and other mental status changes, and many times in patient came in the coma. So what physical signs we get in these patients? A sustained systolic blood pressure greater than 160 uh, millimeters of mercury or diastolic blood pressure uh, greater than 110 millimeters of the mercury, tachycardia we found, tachypnea, uh, just as in this patient, it is a 44, and uh, rails, hyperreflexia, clonus, papillary edema, and uh, oliguria or neuria sometimes, localized neurological uh, deficit, and uh, right upper quadrant or gastric abdominal tenderness with nausea, generalized edema, a small fundal height for the estimated gestational age, apprehension, and marked proteinuria. So we came on the definition of the eclampsia that any new onset of the grand mal seizure activity and or unexplained coma during pregnancy or postpartum in women with a sign symptom of preeclampsia, it typically uh, occurs at 20th week of gestation. It is a considered a complication of severe preeclampsia. Now, what is the prevalence of the eclampsia? We found 10% of all pregnancies are complicated by hypertension. Eclampsia and uh, preeclampsia account for about half of the, these cases worldwide. Preeclampsia affects approximately 4.5 to 11.2 percent of the pregnancies in industrialized countries. Now, the risk factor of the eclampsia. Uh, family history of preeclampsia is the one of the major risk factor. Previous preeclampsia and eclampsia, multi-fetal gestational, just like twin pregnancy, hydrated mole, fetal hydrops, 
टीनेज प्रेगनेंसी प्राइमरी ग्राइविडा और नली पैरिटी और पेशेंट मोर देन थर्टी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ एज समाइम्स लो सोशियो इकोनॉमिक स्टेटस इज इज मोर कॉमन ऑबिसिटी इन रीनल डिजीज पेशेंट जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज इट इज ऑल्सो कॉमन इन द जेस्टेशनल डायबिटीज अंडरलाइंग हाइपर टेंशन क्रॉनिक इलनेस सच एज ऑटो इम्यून डिजीज एज एस एल डी डायबिटीज मिलाइटस और रीनल डिजीजेस now the uh, management of the this uh, laboratory what what are the investigation we have to do in this patient so complete blood count cbc with platelet count we have to send we have to assess the liver function of the patient and for this the uh, got level is more than 72 international unit and the bilirubin uh, sometimes increases in this patient LDH is more than 600 international unit. Elevated levels due to the hepatocellular injury and the health syndrome, and these are the complications of health syndromes. And uh, fibrinogen level and fibrin degradation products, PT and APTT, activated partial partial thromboplastin time, which I say, and uh, kidney function test. We have to know the blood urea nitrogen, creatinine level, uric acid. and 24 hour urine collection for protein excretion and uh, what is the maternal mortality maternal mortality death is largely due to the result of complication from the abrasive placenta or maybe the hepatic rupture or uh, cerebral edema and in the neonatal the mortality due to the delivery like uh, to be due to the preterm sequelae of the prematurity include Uh, maybe due to the respiratory distress chronic lung disease or interventricular hemorrhage cerebral palsy sepsis and uh, necrotizing enterocolitis now we come in the important part of the management delivery is the only definitive treatment for eclampsia so admit to the our emergency or intensive care unit for supportive treatment until the we perform the delivery of the uh, patient what uh, supportive care first of all we have to secure intravenous line with a large bore always try to put the large bore uh, bore catheter ringer lactate or normal saline is the recommended fluid which have to given initially we start with the if there uh, with 30 drops per minute and the target will be the 1 liter into 6 to 8 hours start uh, oxygen and keep a keep patient in the left lateral uh, decubitus position so try to put the patient in a left lateral position supportive care for ecliptic conversions includes uh, the first of all the close monitoring maintain airway at all times start the anti convulsion therapy and blood pressure control in the uh, bp uh, should be assessed with the goal maintaining the BP, systolic bp is less than 170 mm of the mercury and uh, diastolic bp is, should be less than 110 mm of the mercury with hypotensive medication as uh, mm, we have to give the hydrolyzine or labetalol nifedipine which is recommended in this uh, pregnant woman and uh, never do the excessive decrease of the blood pressure can cause inadequate utero placental perfusion and fetal distress antenatal steroid may be administered in anticipation of delivery at least the 34 week gestation due to the uh, late, uh, due to the early age of the gestation and the recommended is betamethasone or dexamethasone keep nil by orally npo should be done until the patient is stabilized or delivered to reduce the risk for aspiration when postictal monitoring uh, fluid intake urine output mat maternal respiratory rate uterine contraction status now fetal monitoring fetal heart rate should be monitored continuously if the fetal heart rate tracing does not improve okay if fetal uh, heart rate tracing does not improve following a seizure you are not able to hear you you are not able to hear you okay okay i uh, can hear you now it is it is audible i am audible yes you are audible oh, okay okay abrasion may be present where uterine hyperactivity and fetal bradycardia persists 
now we come on the ph uh, pharmacotherapy goals so reduce the morbidity prevent complications and correct eclampsia the drug of choice for the uh, anti convulsant is the magnesium and uh, control of hypertension is essential to prevent further morbidity or possible mortality most recommended anti hypertensive agent is hydrolyzin labetalol and nifedipine and uh, hydrolyzin we give uh, 5 mg iv over 3 to 4 minutes if not possible give i minutes until the bp came to below uh, 170 uh, by 19 and maximum total dose should not be increased by the uh, 20 mg if hydrogen is not available give the labetalol 10 mg iv if inadequate response after 10 minutes repeat 20 mg in if 10 minutes later is still adequate increase the 40 mg then 80 mg 10 minutes later if it's still inadequate Nifedipine can be given 5 mg orally if no response is after 10 minutes repeat the dose monitor the patient very closely assess the pregnancy status if pregnant delivery uh, delivery as soon as patient is stabilized deliver regardless of gestation measurement of the temperature four hourly assess the cervix and the delivery is most important thing adequate pain relief for the labor and delivery is vital and may be provided with either systemic opioids or epidural in the absence of fetal mal presentation of fetal distress oxytocin should be given and cesarean delivery recommended in these patient Hello. so thank you to uh, all for this eclampsia management part in the emergency room and uh, what we have to do we, uh, we should maintain the airway and control the bp and uh, nursing should be done in the left uh, lateral position that is recommended and try to as early as uh, delivery of the fetus as possible and maybe cesarean is the most recommended technique to do the fetus uh, out thank you thank you thank you great thank you. thanks dr sujit thanks for the talk we had back to back two um, maternal rs related topics um we could take some questions if anybody has any questions about this we could take like what dr magna was saying the guidelines are pretty much same there's no major changes in the guidelines is just that how you manage how your emergency is prepared to take these they don't come every day but when they come you should be prepared to manage them um any questions in the chat box any questions for both the speakers mm. Now, I know conducting delivery is something that uh, we all learned in our MBBS. So, um, if you are pushed to conduct in an emergency, I'm sure we are all game for it. Like what uh, Dr. Magna was saying, that adrenaline rush. So, this is a different kind of a what do you call a positive adrenaline rush, where you are trying to save uh, life, not just one, two. So, if there are no questions, then uh, we shall move ahead. I hand over the stage to Dr. Abhishek. I thank Semicon Twenty Twenty Two for interesting back-to-back -back two uh, modules to be moderated by me. That thanks, Dr. Sujit. Thanks, Dr. Meghna. If you both have anything to say, please go ahead. Otherwise, I hand over the stage to Dr. Abhishek. Thank you, Dr. Yes, thanks, Dr. Abhishek and Dr. Abhishek. Sorry. And uh, uh, congratulations and uh, uh, yeah. yeah and that uh, successful uh, semicon thank you thank you thank you very thank much you. Uh, thank, you. thank you dr naga for uh, moderating both the sessions uh, we are lagging back the time schedule time so we have to start immediately the session 13 uh, after 2 minutes break uh, the next session will be on uh, endocrine and autoimmune emergencies we will start after 2 minutes thank you
welcome back uh now we will start uh, we'll go to our session 13 that is endocrine and autoimmune emergencies uh this session will be moderated by professor dr m rajadurai he is a senior consultant and head department of emergency medicine and critical care apollo cage hospital milvisharam uh, over to dr rajadurai thank you dr avishek Hope I'm audible and the video is also fine. Right. So once again, I welcome uh, all the faculty speakers and uh, uh, you know the listeners for uh, August gathering, Semicon 2022, one of the greatest academic uh, extravagances are being conducted uh, in this part of the world. And uh, session 13, we are going to head into session 13 directly. That is endocrine and autoimmune emergencies. And uh, I have three lectures for uh, under this session. The first lecture will be on myxedema coma and Graves disease. The speaker is going to be Dr. Sapna Gupta, who is a vice president of Semi Gujarat chapter and also an associate professor in the field of in the Department of Emergency Medicine at uh, NHL Medical College, Ahmedabad. Welcome, Dr. Sapna. Talk on myxedema coma and Graves disease. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are. You are audible. Yeah. Yes, yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, we are able to see your screen, and it's full screen. Kindly. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Sami West Bengal chapter and thanks uh, to Dr. Lahiri for having me as a part of Samicon 22. Uh, this uh, today I am going to talk about the two thyroid emergencies as I have. Uh, this is uh, my hospital and this is my team. Uh, Coming to the case uh, directly, a 60-year-old uh, female brought to ED with a history of uh, difficulty in breathing and altered sensorium. She also had facial puffiness since four days and weakness since 10 days. Basically, this patient was staying alone and was brought by neighbors. She didn't have any documents available uh, with her. Recently, she wasn't taking any medication as per the history, whatever history was available, but she had a history of thyroid before 30 years. So uh, on the preliminary examination of this patient, she had uh, positive findings of hypothermia, sinus bradycardia, hypotension. She was conscious but had delayed responses. She was hypoxic, had hypoglycemia also and had respiratory acidosis on the uh, first ABG, which is done immediately in the ER. So on the physical examination, she had pallor, generalized non-pitting edema, dry coat skin, delayed deep tendon reflexes, a well-healed surgical scar on the anterior neck, and she had some deformity of left leg. So coming to the differentials, uh, hypothermia, which is common in uh, hypothyroid patient, commonly uh, uh, myxedema coma presents very commonly in the cold weather. Septic shock can be precipitating factor or can be coexisting. We have to carefully rule it out. We have to carefully, ru carefully rule out psychiatric disorders, dementic illnesses, any new cerebrovascular in uh, uh, insult. Uh, drug overdoses are to be ruled out, which is usually difficult in the scenario which we are facing. So patient might be subjected to uh, toxicology screening uh, along with the primary investigation to uh, to rule out any other coexisting drug overdose. Uh, so all this and hypoglycemia can uh, coexist other central uh, metabolic uh, uh, reasons of encephalopathy, encephalitis can coexist or can be a differential diagnosis which need to be ruled out. But looking to the telltale signs or the uh, hypothyroid habitus which we say the diagnosis of myxedema coma, it is mainly a clinical diagnosis, uh, administration of thyroid hormones should not be uh, delayed till uh, waiting for the laboratory confirmation of the diagnosis because this is a rare but life-threatening emergency and has a mortality rate as high as 30 to 60 percent. It results from decompensated hypothyroidism which affects almost every 
organ system. Salient features are altered mentation with hypothermia, maybe bradycardia, hypotension, hypoglycemia, and hypoventilation. So a high index of suspicion is required from the side of clinician and with a key uh, clue and a key to look for the management of the precipitating or triggering event. In our case, as we expected, all labs were not contributing anything except the grossly deranged thyroid hormone profile, which is which uh, we get only after some time. So the main management stays as a supportive care and management of our ABCs, airway breathing uh, and circulation, correction of hypovolemia, hypo, hypoxia, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia may be coexisting because there is impaired water clearance in this patient leading to fluid retention and hyponatremia. Vasopressor only if after the hypovolemia is corrected, hypothermia correction should be gradual, there will be pass, there should be passive rewarming. Steroids are indicated to, uh, to uh, overcome metabolic stress and the foremost cornerstone of the treatment is thyroid replacement therapy. IV thyroxine in the doses of 4 microgram per kg followed in 24 hours by 100 micrograms. T4 is preferred than T3 and it, it, T3 being active and more, much more potent metabolite. It should be, uh, re, uh, dose should be reduced to half in cases of elderly with cardiac disease and uh, it is always preferred slow and gradual correction when if patient tolerates orally or if it can be given by RILS tube, it is always wise to give thyroxine 50 microgram per day by the Rice tube or uh, by oral route. Coming to the second emergency, uh, uh, thyrotoxicosis, which is due to hyperthyroidism and almost 85% cases of hyperthyroidism are due to Graves disease, which is an immune system disorder where the TSG receptor antibodies stimulate excessive release of thyroid hormones. This is more frequently seen in women and which is commoner in women compared to men. The classic triad is thyrotoxicosis, diffuse goiter and exophthalmus. Pre-tribial myxedema is seen in few cases of thyrotoxicosis. So typical history will be like fever, or fever, anxiety and myalgesias patient might be giving history like I am feeling like my heart is racing. There may be a goiter along with uh, seen in the general examination. There will be tachycardia, hypertension, temperature will be raised, the goiter will be tender. Patient will be having, patient will be having fine traumas in the hand and frequently arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation and other uh, irregular heart rhythm is seen on the ECG. Again, the precipitants are systemic insult in form of infection trauma. I'll, I'll add COVID-19 in this list. Endocrinal insult in form of DKA or hyperosmolar coma. Uh, poor compliance to antithyroid medication or some drug interactions with the anti uh, leading to uh, affecting the mechanism of antithyroid medicines. There can be cardiovascular in insults and it can be because of the radioactive iodine therapy also. Now, differential diagnosis of thyrotoxicosis is to be very, very carefully worked out. Being having fever and tachycardia, all the causes of infection and sepsis need to be ruled out and looking carefully for any focus of infection. But if you will look at the list, the each and every condition which mimics thyrotoxicosis is itself is a very, uh, a very uh, very uh, crucial, I mean, a very dreaded emergency. Like if you talk about malignant hyperthermia and the condition which can be corrected by drug. So this this uh, mimics should be well, very carefully addressed. Heat exhaustion, heat stroke, tremors, very confusing with the delirium tremen, pheochromocytoma presenting with the similarly tachycardia hypertension. There can be withdrawal of medications like cocaine opioids or there can be sympathomimetic ingestion like cocaine, amphetamine or ketamine uh, and the most common poisoning uh, in our setup, organophosphorate po poisoning will also present like this. So treatment again will be supportive with the airway management of airway breathing circulation 
बीटा ब्लॉकर टू इनहिबिट पेरिफ्रल एड्रीनर्जी की इफेक्ट inhibition of thyroid hormone synthesis by antithyroid drugs methamazole inhibition of thyroid hormone release by lugol uh, solution peripheral conversion of t it is important to prevent peripheral conversion of t4 to t3 as we know t3 is four times more potent it crosses blood brain barrier and it it uh, is responsible for the majority of the effects of the thyroid hormone to prevent the reabsorption cholesterol amine should can be given for every 6 hourly treatment of the triggering factors and definitive therapy in form of radioactive ablation or surgery coming to the evidence based practice uh, for the common recommendations for the this two emergent thyroid emergencies uh, in all elderly female patients uh, presenting with hypothermia with all uh, mixed edema coma should be kept in mind and other differential diagnosis should be ruled out carefully always search for a precipitating triggering event which can be because of the weather cold weather is the commonest time of presentation for mixed edema coma patients medication uh, non compliance or uh, other cardiac event leading to uh, introduction of new medications are all this leading to triggering the uh, emergency uh, both this emergencies are majority of clinical diagnosis in the sense of our UG days we are learning those uh, signs of tip to toe signs of hypo and hyperthyroidism. Those are telltale signs are evident. Don't look for other complicated diagnosis and go for this uh, treatment because the early treatment has an uh, impact on morbidity and mortality in the cases of myxedema coma in particular. So thorough medical history and history of thyroid surgery, thyroid manipulation and looking for the recent precipitating factors. All mimics, as I told earlier also, that thyroid storm can have uh, multiple, multiple uh, precipitating factors as well as it mimics with the very dreaded emergencies. So it should be very carefully ruled out. Uh, presentation in thyrotoxicosis according to age may vary. Patient may come with only arrhythmias and cardiac fibrillation along with fever, tachycardia and tremulousness. So in thyroid storm, uh, laboratory investigation, as I said earlier, might be totally normal, but uh, temptation to do a detailed endocrine search or battery of investigation should be deferred by an emergency physician because it, in, in, uh, as such, in a course of hospitalization, it is going to be need, done afterwards. So initial efforts uh, should be on the RSC stabilization along with cardiac and temperature blood glucose level monitoring by establishing the already IV access and at every point of time we should keep in mind that this patient will require may require definitive airway management with even with the meticulous monitoring and continuous uh, care uh, sometimes this patient may require emergency intubation the point to be kept in the mind are that this patient may will be having difficult airway the difficult airway algorithm of the institute should be in place and the first attempt to intubation should be done by the best person or best expertise because large tongue uh, la altered anatomy large goiter in front of the neck uh, vocal cord edema all this can lead to uh, catastrophe in uh, while doing an intubation so that's the with that i would summarize i will conclude my presentation and uh, yeah to each piece uh, to each and every pg attending this session thank you very much kudos to all of you each of you are a uh, true corona warrior and i in time this too shall pass thanks to the organization uh, organizer and moderator sir thank you very much Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the nice presentation. Telltale sign is sign is one thing which we need to remember, and uh, uh, we'll be having uh, you know we'll be taking question and answer after the end of this uh, session on the poll. I have uh, next speaker online who's going to talk about the Addisonian crisis and the Quant syndrome. Doctor Anup Kumar Rana, who is an assistant medical superintendent, Apollo Hospital, Bhuvneshwar, Odisha. He's also Vice President Semi for Odisha Chapter, Dr. Anand Kumar. I think his uh, presentation will be a pre-recorded one. Can I have the host to 
share the video. Hi friends, this is a 45 years old male, feeling dizzy, nauseating, lethargic, there is an alert bracelet, the BP is low, the sugar is low. So what is the diagnosis? Yes, it's Edison's disease. Myself, Dr. Anup Kumar Rana, the Assistant Medical Superintendent of Apollo Hospital, Bhubaneswar. Today we are going to discuss about Edison's disease and Kohn syndrome. Aldosterone is a mineral corticoid which is released from zona glomerulosa. Cortisol, cortisol, and corticosterone are glucocorticoids which are released from zona fasciculata. Both are from adrenal cortex. Edison's disease. Basically, this is an acquired primary adrenal insufficiency caused by an autoimmune process. It is rare but potentially life threatening emergency condition. There is a bilateral adrenal cortex destruction which leads to decrease cortisol, aldosterone, and androgens. It is insidious in course, present with glucocorticoid deficiency, which is followed by mineral corticoid deficiency. Etiology, primary adrenal insufficiency, usually autoimmune, which is most common. Next is infection. Next is adrenal hemorrhage, where Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome occurs. Infiltration, as in the case of hemochromatosis, amyloidosis, and metastasis. Other causes of may be sarcoidosis, lymphoma, genetic disorders. Also, drugs may cause this, that is ketoconazole and etomidate. Secondary adrenal insufficiency, basically due to exogenous steroid administration. There is a suppression of ACTS synthesis. So the difference between primary and secondary, primary is intrinsic, secondary is because of extrinsic or outside glucocorticoid administration. Epidemiology, Edison's disease is there. The incidence is 0.6 per 1 lakh population per year. In adult, the age of presentation is 30 to 50. Women, it is more common than in men. There are various risk factors which are documented, type 1 diabetes, hypoparathyroid, hypopituitary, pernicious anemia, Graves disease, chronic thyroiditis, vitiligo, myasthenia gravis, and dermatitis, hepatic formis. Pathophysiology, there is adrenal failure which leads to decreased cortisol production, which leads to decreased aldosterone production. Eventually, due to loss of negative feedback inhibition, there is elevation of ACTH and MSH. Edison's disease manifests as insidious and gradual onset of non-specific symptoms. In many cases, the diagnosis is made only after the patient presents with an acute adrenal crisis. The initial presentation is Fatigue, generalized weakness, weight loss, nausea, vomiting, pain, abdomen, dizziness, tachycardia, and postural hypotension. Most common presentation which you will find in Edison's disease is hyperpigmentation, which is absent in secondary insufficiency because of ACTH and MSH level being normal in secondary. In this case, it is high. Hyperpigmentation is not seen in secondary insufficiency because of ACTH and MSH levels low. Also, one of the most important questions, hyponatremia with or without hyperkalemia or hypertension. What is the diagnosis? It is Edison's disease. And if all three are present, it is crisis. Crisis is nothing else, but it is an acute exacerbation of the Edison's disease. It often manifested as severe dehydration, confusion, refractory hypertension, shock, more common in primary adrenal insufficiency. How will you evaluate? There is low cortisol and aldosterone level. However, renin level is high and there is a blunt cortisol response with ACTH stimulation. The cortisol level has a diurnal variation. It is usually highest in the early morning. So morning samples are taken. But in emergency, you may not get a morning sample. The ACTH level is high in primary adrenal insufficiency. We have already discussed in a few slides back that primary means there is destruction. However, the feedback is there. So the ACTH level is high. In central adrenal insufficiency, there is low ACTH or normal ACTH. Corticotopy stimulation test. 
also is uh, seen ACTA stimulation shows a normal response that is adequate response. If there is no or less response, that is adrenal insufficiency. Aldosterone concentration is low, the renin activity is increased. Also, we have already discussed the biochemistry part, the hyponatremia is there, hyperkalemia is there, hypoglycemia is there, at times hypercalcemia may also be seen. The TSH level will be slightly high. In case there are anti-21 hydroxy antibodies present, which this marks autoimmune destruction of adrenal gland. Imaging studies in chest X-ray, there may be a small heart that is small heart uh, because of decrease in cardiac workload. There will be bilateral enlargement of the adrenal glands, which may be seen with adrenal hemorrhage on uh, abdominal CT. If there are small adrenals, we may suspect autoimmune adrenal destruction in tuberculosis calcification or hemorrhage will be seen. MRI of hypothalamopituitary region should be obtained if ACTH is inappropriately low in the presence of cortisol deficiency. Additional studies are also present. Just like ECG will show tolerability waves in case of hyperkalemia. The differential diagnosis. Uh, most other conditions that can cause shock are sepsis, shock itself, or chronic fatigue syndrome, infectious mononucleosis, hypothyroidism. Now, coming to the main topic, the Edisonian crisis. It is an episode of acute adrenal insufficiency, which may be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Basically, it is an acute exacerbation, severe life threatening endocrine emergency, which requires immediate recognition and treatment. The chronic part of the stable part is called as Edison's disease. It is characterized by acute change in physiological state, quick progression from non specific symptoms of fatigue, weakness. Nausea, vomiting, pain abdomen, back pain, diarrhea, dizziness, hypotension, shock, to obtundation, metabolic encephalopathy, and shock. Most common precipitating cause is acute infection. This, it may be a subtle uh, GI upset. One of the more common presentation of Edisonian crisis is a patient who was on chronic steroid therapy who apparently stopped their usual dose of corticosteroids. Confirm laboratory evaluation should not delay the treatment. In acute phase, first of all, give fluid resuscitation, 2 to 3 liters of normal saline, or 5% exposed in normal saline in first 12 to 24 hours to restore the intravascular volume with intravenous normal saline. Volume status and urine output should be used to guide resuscitation. Critically ill patient who fail to respond to initial IV fluid bolus will need to be started on vasopressors to maintain a map of above 65 for adequate organ perfusion and may need elective intubation to protect if comatose. Also to correct hypoglycemia, dextrose may be given. Now what is the immediate treatment is hydrocortisone. The initial dose is 100 mg IV followed by 50 to 100 mg IV every 6 hours for 24 hours. Children 50 mg, maximum to 100 mg IV bolus. Under emergency condition, dexamethasone polyvinigram IV can also be given. Mineral corticoid, fludrocortisone, 0.05 to 0.2 milligram daily. After the initial stabilization of the patient using the above measure, the underlying causes of crisis need to be identified and treated. Current guidelines for adisonian crisis, in acutely ill patient with signs and symptoms suggestive of acute adrenal insufficiency, one should rule out adisonian crisis, assess blood pressure and perform orthostasis. Determine the history of steroid use. Perform appropriate tests like sodium, potassium, creatinine, urea, THH, cortisol, and plasma ACTH levels. This stable patient, consider performing a short ACTH hormone test. Never delay treatment because of testing. If in doubt and suspicion is high, address the IV hydrocortisone and hydrate the patient. Next, come down, coming down to Cohn syndrome. It is a non-suppressible hypersecretion of aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid. Underdiagnosed cause of hypertension. The most common cause of mineral corticoid excess is primary aldosteronism. Bilateral micronodular hyperplasia is more common than unilateral. A rare cause is glucocorticoid remedial aldosteronism, which we will henceforth call as GRA. Other rare causes 
are syndrome of inappropriate syndrome of apparent mineralocorticoid excess cushing syndrome glucocorticoid resistance adrenocortical carcinoma congenital adrenal hyperplasia progesterone induced hypertension and ledo syndrome clinical manifestation clinical hallmark of mineral corticoid excess is hypokalemic hypertension serum sodium tends to be normal due to concurrent fluid retention severe hypokalemia may be associated with muscle weakness overt proximal myopathy and even hypokalemic palsy severe alkalosis leads to muscle cramping severe cases it may cause titanium event who should be tested hypertension and spontaneous or low dose diuretic induced hypokalemia also the following patients should undergo testing even if they are normal calamity like severe hypertension or drug resistant hypertension hypertension with sleep apnea hypertension and a family history of early onset hypertension or cva at a young age all hypertensive first degree relative of patient with primary aldosteronism hypertension and af so how do we do the testing morning blood sample for plasma aldosterone concentration or plasma renin activity or plasma renin concentration psc greater than 10 pra less than normal or one does the patient have a spontaneous hypokalemia yes so it is primary aldosterone is no going for confirmatory testing 24 hours urine aldosterone fluidocortisone suppression test and saline suppression test if plasma aldosterone concentration less than 10 the plasma renin activity greater than one so it is surgically curable primarily aldosterone is is unlikely diagnosis after diagnosis next step is to use imaging to further assess the cause ct scan fine cut of adrenal region is the better of choice adrenal venous sampling it is used to compare aldosterone level of ivc with right and left adrenal veins surgical candidate with either no obvious lesion on ct Evidence of unilateralism in patients greater than 40 years of age. Confirmation of diagnosis. Example: saline infusion test, two liters of normal saline over four hours. If it is negative, then nothing to do. If it is positive, that is unenhanced CT adrenals, you will find unilateral adrenal mass, age less than 40, adrenal atrophy, unilateral. If age greater than 40, adrenal venous sampling. If positive, again adrenal lactobi, unilateral. If negative, drug treatment. Unenhanced CT adrenal shows bilateral microvascular hyperplasia. Go in for drug treatment. Normal adrenal morphology. Family history of early onset hypertension. Screen for glucocorticoid remedial aldosteronism. If negative, drug treatment. If positive, dexamethasone. Now, what is this drug treatment? It is mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, amyloid. Okay, amyloid. Differential diagnosis with normal adrenal morphology and family history of early onset severe hypertension. Diagnosis GI. Consider that diagnosis of non-endoscopic related mineral corticoid excess is based on documentation of suppressed renin and suppressed aldosterone in the presence of hypokalemic hypertension. Treatment patient greater than forty. With confirmed mineral corticoid excess and unilateral lesion on CT surgery, laparoscopic adrenal lectomy is the preferred approach. Patient who are not surgical candidates or with evidence of bilateral hyperplasia based on CT should be treated medical. Now, what is the medical treatment? Uh, consider prior to surgery to avoid post-surgical hypoaldosteronism. Consists primarily of spinal lectomy. Pavlovtal can be started at uh, 12.5 to 50 mg BD and titrated to a maximum of 400 mg per day to control blood pressure and normalize potassium. Side effects are uh, menstrual irregularity, decreased libido, gynecomastia. More selective uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist is aplerinone. Doses start at 25 mg BD and can be titrated to 200 mg per day. Another useful drug is the sodium channel blocker, amylorad. So again, we come back to the old question. Uh, this is a 45 years old male, feeling dizzy, nausea, lethargy, alert bracelet is present there. BP is low, sugar is low. 
this is a MRKM part B or FRCM uh, secondary uh, question, SBA question. The diagnosis is yes, adrenal crisis, acute adrenal insufficiency. In other words, it is additional crisis. So, what should be the treatment? It is immediate hydrocortisone 100 milligram IV, fluid resuscitation, monitor and treat hypoglycemia. All this we have already discussed with other electrolyte imbalance. Also, after doing this, treat the underlying cause. What are the blood tests? Serum cortisol and ACTH, full blood count, urea and electrolytes, RBS, ABG, and lipase. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, nice presentation. Addisonian crisis is always uh, worrisome in all our critical care units. I think as rightly mentioned, suspecting and immediate treatment is uh, the way forward for uh, this uh, crisis. And uh, never delay treatment for testing is uh, one of the well said point uh, from your slide. Thank you, sir. And uh, we move on to the next talk, which is about uh, on autoimmune emergencies. Uh, I welcome Dr. Bodhisattva Chaudhary, who is a consultant and in charge for emergency and critical care department, ILS Hospitals, Haura. He's also a visiting consultant in Namri Hospital, Salt Lake. He's, an, uh, he's also a joint secretary for uh, West Bengal uh, Semi Chapter. And uh, he's an instructor for various AHA courses. And uh, he's a life member of Semi, ISCM, and uh, much more societies. Welcome, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. To you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. We can see your screen. Okay. okay. Let me uh, share my slides. Uh, is it visible? Just waiting. Yes, it is visible. Please make it full screen. Thank you. Yeah. It's okay now? Yes, right. Please go ahead. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Bodhisattva Chaudhuri. Now, autoimmune emergencies is something, it, it's a bit rare we get to see an emergency, but it's something we should know how to diagnose, how to treat, because most of the time, the chances of missing it is very common. It's a bit vast topic, uh, so I, I will only cover the most important and most common things, and uh, I will go, go about a bit fast about it because of the time shortage. So let's start about the, what are the most important autoimmune emergencies we can see in our departments. The, then let's go by the primary rheumatological causes, like uh, most commonly seen in acute low back pain, acute gout, acute arthritis, including septic arthritis, lupus flare, systemic necrotizing vasculitis, scleroderma, renal crisis, Catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome or CAPS, erythromonodosum or complex regional pain syndrome. We can also get a, a other medical and iatrogenic emergency with patients who already have any systemic rheumatic disease. Like the patients may present with other infection and sepsis. Patient may present with inside induced GI bleed, acute left ventricular failure, intracranial bleed, accelerated hypertension, tubercular or tubercular meningitis, acute adrenal insufficiency by sudden steroid withdrawal, seizures or drug-induced bone marrow suppression. Now, let's first start with lupus flare. Now, lupus flare, it is told that every person who has, uh, who has been uh, be, being treated for lupus for more than five years is going to suffer at least one lupus flare in their lifetime. Now, it might be a mild to moderate flare or a severe flare. Now, how to differentiate? We, 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 mild to moderate flare, are the patient may present with a new rash or a worsening of the pre-existing rash, photosensitivity, lupus profundus or paniculitis, cutaneous vasculitis or non-healing ulcers, polycytosis, severe polyarthritis, or persistent fever, which are attributed to lupus and no other causes could be found. But a severe flare, it can present with new or worsening CNS lupus. The patient may present with severe headache, nausea, neck pain, uh, seizure, even coma. Vasculitis, nephritis, patient may present with severe AKI, myositis, severe pain, swelling, which can further precipitate AKI. Thrombocytopenia with platelet going down below 60,000. Hemolytic anemia with hemoglobin uh, less than seven or a sudden decrease uh, in, in hemoglobin of more than three gram per deciliter. So what is the most common clinical dilemma we get in ED with these kinds of patients? The biggest problem is we don't know whether the fever in a given case of lupus is due to increased lupus activity or infection. That is the biggest confusion because SLA being an immunocompromised state, also the patient will be on multiple immunosuppressants, uh, is frequently complicated by infection. 
So in, in such setting, the presence of leukocytosis and or increased CRP or procalcitonin is a pointer towards infection. Now, the well, important thing that we need to remember in lupus and every other autoimmune disease, including rheumatoid arthritis or, or, or scleroderma, or on these cases, uh, the, the inflammatory markers, both ESR and CRP, gets elevated. But lupus is an exception because in lupus, generally, ESR gets elevated, but CRP generally stays normal. So in a lupus flare, if a patient comes with elevated CRP, it uh, does point towards an uh, infective cause. In contrast, if the patient comes with leukopenia and a normal or minimally elevated CRP levels, it favors a diagnosis of increased lupus activity. But however, these are uh, relative points and uh, ultimately bacteriological isolation or histological confirmation it remains the only foolproof method of differentiating between the fever due to lupus activity or infection. And the biggest problem, these two make also coexist. So what to do? In Minor flares, the treatment is mostly NSAID with low-dose steroids along with hydroxychloroquine, which is, needs to be given in every case of lupus. In major flare, the, the dose is mostly high-dose steroids. In majority of the organ life-threatening cases, you may need to give IV pulse of methane prednisolone of 500 to 1,000 milligram daily for three to five days, uh, along with other immunosuppressants like azathioprine, the cyclophosphamide, microphotomophotyl, methotrexate, or even rituximab. In emergency department, if you are absolutely sure the patient is having a lupus flare, give the pulse dose of methylprednisolone in emergency itself. It, that may save the patient's life. Now, let's come to acute low back pain. It can be due to mechanical causes, neuropathic causes, or medical causes. So in these cases, we need to see the uh, take a fo focus history and a proper physical examination to help place the patients with low back pain into one of these categories. Next is uh, the imaging and uh, lab investigations as and when indicated. So if you go by the different sources of back pain, the possible sources with a neuropathic back pain, degenerative spinal diseases, spinal stenosis, herniated disc, osteoporotic compression fractures, spondylolisthesis, or overall any other fractures. Possible source of inflammatory back pain, spondyloarthropathies. This, this encompasses ankylosing spondylitis, enteropathic arthritis, and psoriatic arthritis. And other possible sources of back pain like abdominal aortic aneurysm, tumors including METs, renal diseases, GI diseases, infection like epidural abscess, osteomyelitis, septic discitis, or paraspinous abscess. The, what are the red flag signs when a patient comes to comes with back pain? You need to think of these three points but most importantly. Cancer infection in patients who are aged more than 50 with history of cancer, patient presents with UTI, fever, or chills may have prostatitis, mostatic CA, history of drug abuse or immunosuppressed patient. In patient of spinal fracture, there will be history of significant trauma or history of long-standing steroids, age more than 70 or postmenopausal female. And cauda equinox syndrome can be seen with uh, patient, patient will present with acute urine retention or overflow incontinence, saddle paresthesia or progressive lower limb weakness. How to manage your imaging as necessary? NSAIDs are um, drug of choice unless there are contraindications. In case of inadequate relief, you can add non-benzodiazine muscle relaxants like uh, thiocolchicoside or cyclobenzaparin, or opioid analgesics or tramadol can be should be used only if any or all the above measures do not yield benefit. Next comes acute gout, a very common rheumatological emergency. Patients generally present with acute pain in one of the lower limb joints. It is usually monoarthritis, uh, uh, most commonly involving the uh, first MTP joint or it can be oligoarthritis with multiple MTP or, or intertarsal joint or ankle joint. Uh, polyarticular presentation is very rare. All the patient present with is monoarthritis of uncertain etiology should ideally undergo a joint aspiration to undergo uh, to regularly septic arthritis because acute gout may coexist with joint septic arthritis. Drug, NSAID, steroids, and colchicine. Now, corticosteroids may be used in patients with um, contraindication of NSAIDs because NSAIDs is the widely used drug, the drug of choice, with very quick concept of action. Corticosteroids are used in cases where NSAIDs cannot be given, like renal failure or heart failure. Oral prednisolone, 20 to 40 milligram per day, tapered over two weeks, or intramuscular methylprednisolone, 40 to 120 milligram, is commonly used. Interarticular corticosteroids are also very much effective in acute gout, especially if it involves large joints. Allopurinol or febuxostat, the drugs that are commonly used in gout, should not be started during an acute attack of gout, as it may precipitate another attack or prolong the duration. Patients already in, uh, 
whereas the patient is already on allopurinol or fluoxetine, they should continue the drug. Next comes uh, life-threatening disease that is the catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome or CAPS. It's a uh, the patient will present with multi-organ failure in a patient with antiphospholipid syndrome. The organs commonly involved, most commonly renal, followed by lungs, CNS, cutaneous, GI, almost every organ can be involved. Precipitating factors seen in one third of the patients include infections, oral contraceptives, surgical stress, and discontinuation of anticoagulants. DIC is also very common. Mortality is very high or more than 60%, and the causes include heart failure, malignant hypertension, ARDS, renal failure, CNS causes, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, or thrombocytopenia. Now, how to define a case of a catastrophic FES? Now, the definite definition is a evidence of vessel occlusion or any occlusive impact involving more than three organs or systems or tissues like heart, kidney, lungs, skin, etc. They have to be either simultaneous or they, may, they need to be present within a week of one another. Anatomical pathological confirmation of small diameter vessel occlusion in at least one of the organ or tissue. So ideally, skin biopsy is most easily done. And persistent presence of antiphospholipid antibodies or uh, lupus anticoagulant, not more than six weeks. So these are the rashes that you can see with the skin ulcers and uh, uh, CNS involvement. The picture can be seen. How to manage? First to diagnose, you need to see a deranged APTT with a in the positive APLA, that is antiphospholipid antibody, anti-cardiolipid antibodies, beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies. Now, the management revolves around three objectives. To treat any precipitating factor, which is the prompt use of antibiotics if an infection is suspected, or amputation for a necrotic organ, high awareness in patients with APS who undergo an operation or an invasive procedure. To prevent or to treat the ongoing thrombotic events, and to suppress the excessive cytokine storm. So the first line of drug, and this is very important, anticoagulation. Usually intravenous heparin is a drug of choice along with corticosteroids. Second line, plasma exchange, intravenous immunoglobulin. Third line, fibrinolytis, cyclophosphamide, anticytokines. Next is mass or macrophage activation syndrome. So uh, what is mass? It, is, it has been described as a uh, life-threatening complication of chronic autoimmune diseases, including SLE, idiopathic juvenile arthritis, adult onset still disease, PAN, or Kawasaki disease. How to define clinical criteria, high-grade fever for at least more than seven days, splenomegaly, lymphadenopathies. Lab criteria, cytopenia, most commonly bicytopenia, elephant triglyceride and ferritin, and low fibrinogen. So treatment, the treatment protocol includes uh, mostly supportive with ICU surveillance and continuous monitoring, establishment of hydroelectric balance, FFP transfusion, cultures, and antibiotic therapy when the activation is due to infection. Drugs, most uh, the, the drug of choice is IVIG, along with IV or oral cyclosporine or IV corticosteroids. Interleukin 1 and, and interleukin 6 inhibitor has, has also been tried. Scleroderma renal crisis. Now, it is the most frequent renal complication of systemic cirrhosis associated with, with very high fatal outcome, more than 70% cases. Characterized by accelerated hypertension, rapidly progressive renal failure, increased plasma renin activity, macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. It's commonly seen in patients with diffuse systemic cirrhosis more than five years with recent increase in skin thickening. Pericarditis, pericardial effusion, even tamponade is quite common. Key management is early detection and treatment with AC inhibitors. Renal transplantation may be considered, but in selected patients only, because uh, 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 only after several months of dialysis, because there are chances of recovery in some patients with dialysis. Differential diagnosis can be unconstituted vasculitis, which do not respond to AC inhibitors, but respond to steroids. Malignant hypertension, drug-induced renal injury, complement dysregulation, HUS, TTP, transplant rejection. Next is vasculitis flare. Now, vasculitis characterized by... Vascularity is characterized by the infiltration of vessel walls by inflammatory leukocytes with reactive damage and subsequent loss of vessel integrity may present as acute life-threatening manifestation that require ICU admission. It will present with digital ischemia, aortic aneurysm or dissection, pulmonary hemorrhage, rapidly progressive renal failure, ischemic bubble, or acute ischemic optic neuropathy. Management flares that needs immunosuppressive treatment with high-dose corticosteroids, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, Methylprednisone pulse may be required in serious situations. Uh, Reduxinum can be tried. 
So some other point that that we, 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 you need to know that is the rheumatologic causes of strider. This may be life threatening. Like a rheumatoid arthritis patient may present with cricoid synovitis. Relapsing polyconjunctivitis this may have blockage, blotting or subverting inflammation. Edema may actually need emergency tracheostomy. Complete immediate uh, angioedema with present day as mucosal edema. GPA present as uh, laryngotracheitis or tracheomalacia. Inflammatory myopathy present as pharyngo or uh, laryngeal muscle weakness. ARDS can be seen in scleroderma, uh, all kind of uh, tissue disorders, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, SLE, especially uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, Chartres syndrome, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, medications like methotrexate. Acute abdominal pain, most commonly seen in pan because of uh, ischemic bowel. SLE, patient, patient may have bowel vasculitis or perforation or pancreatitis. HSP can represent vasculitis. Systemic nec um, necrotizing vasculitis can, can present as pancreatitis and Bechet disease can cause, can have mucosal isolation. To, to summarize, for emergency, always ABC is first. Next stabilization is very much important before intubation in patients with long standing rheumatoid arthritis because of chances of atlantoaxial subluxation or dislocation, and in ankle and spondylitis patients because of fused bamboo spine. In, especially in AS patients, intubation is a lot of times extremely difficult. You may need to may, you may need to take help of fiber optic methods. Educate history is very important, including detailed past medical history, history of ongoing or recent immunosuppressive medications, family history of any autoimmune diseases. If in dilemma regarding sepsis or autoimmune cause, should always treat both. Point of care assay, especially CRP and procalcitonin, if available in emergency, might be helpful in these cases as it, as it will give an idea whether the patient is having sepsis or not. No one should die in emergency or ICU without a trial of steroid if you're suspecting a case of autoimmune emergency. And do not forget about CAPS with the catastrophic APS. They need anticoagulation as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bodhivata, for that uh, detailed presentation on autoimmune diseases. And uh, though it is under-recognized, I feel it is still not an uncommon disease in our uh, emergency and critical care units. I guess a focused history and targeted physical examination will be the key to diagnose uh, these autoimmune immunogenesis. And as you rightly said, the taking care of the APCs is a priority in this uh, emergencies. Now we'll move on to the question and answer sessions for this uh, 13th session. We hope Dr. Sopna, Dr. Anu is online. We'll wait for a few questions if that comes. So if no questions, I think thank you. I take this time to thank uh, Dr. Sopna Anup and Dr. Bodhisattva for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, session and for the key points what you have given to, to the lectures. So before we go on to the next session, I think uh, we'll go for a short break and then we'll go on to the next uh, session, which is on transfusion medicine. Over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you. Uh... For concluding the session, uh, before starting the next session, we'll have a two minutes break.
Welcome back, everybody. Now we'll be starting the session 14th, Blood and Transfusion Medicine. Our moderator will be Dr. Professor M. Majid Rai himself. And over to you, Dr. Rajiv Rai. Thank you, Abhishek. Once again, I welcome all the listeners uh, of uh, Semicon 22 for this uh, wonderful uh, session, which is going to be on uh, transfusion medicine. So the first talk, we have uh, two lectures uh, in this session. The first talk is going to be on uh, AVC of Massive Transfusion Protocol uh, by Dr. Somar Datta, Consultant and Coordinator, Department of Emergency Medicine, Narayana Super Specialty Hospital, Gauda. Welcome, Dr. Somar Datta. And over to you. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Yeah. You, can, you may kindly share your screen. Yes, we are able to see your screen. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Semicon for giving me this opportunity. And the topic being ABC of massive transfusion, blood transfusion. So hemorrhage remains a major cause of uh, potentially preventable uh, death across the world. Rapid transfusion of large volume of blood product is required in patients with hemorrhagic shock which may lead to a unique set of complications by itself. A protocol-based management of this category of patients using massive transfusion protocol have been shown to improve outcomes. So these are certain uh, conditions where you get uh, people who lose a lot of blood in, such as in polytrauma, in major surgeries like liver, uh, liver resection, in cardiothoracic surgeries, and this frequently in ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm liver transplant in obstetric catastrophes and GI bleed. So what do we understand by this terminology, massive transfusion? So massive transfusion refers to any situation where a patient is getting a lot of blood transfusions. So it is established to provide rapid blood replacement in a setting of severe hemorrhage. And early optimal blood transfusion is essential to sustain organ perfusion and oxygen. Now coming to a definition, there are a lot of definitions in the various literatures. It is like replacement of one entire blood volume within a span of 24 hours, transmission of more than 10 units of PRBCs in 24 hours, transmission of more than 20 units of PRBCs in 24 hours, transmission of more than 4 units of PRBCs in one hour, when ongoing need is foreseeable, and replacement of 50% of total blood volume within a span of three hours. Among these, the most widely accepted is the transfusion of more than 10 units in a span of 24 hours. Now, what is the principle of management of massive blood loss? So in massive blood loss, there is the first thing that we lose is the intravascular volume. So vital com component of blood loss management. So we need to do a replacement of the volume and the compensatory mechanisms that operate in the reverse way maintain the vital organ perfusion till about 30% of total blood loss, volume loss. Inadequate resuscitation leads to shock, whereas overzealous resuscitation can be deleterious and lead to multiple complications and also increase the bleed. Coming to loss of blood components, so this is best managed by following the massive transfusion protocol. Increasing loss leads to dilution and anemia and later on dilution coagulopathy. Protocol-based empirical replacement of coagulation factor is recommended in massive blood transfusion. So when we transfuse a huge blood components along with volume replacement, we should keep in mind the physiology that occurs when such amount is being transfused within a short span of time. So the primary goal that we need to achieve is to maintain an educate cardiac output to maintain the oxygen carrying capacity of blood and to maintain the hemostatic potential. Now what the classic definition which you have for massive transfusion protocol is only giving transfusion within a span of time. But to be more precise, it should have been a massive hemorrhage protocol because in this, we not only 
control uh, give transmission alone but there is also monitoring for the ongoing transmission related complications considering targets what are the targets that we need to achieve at the end of the resuscitation administration of other medications like tranexamic acid keeping the patient in an warm environment and also the most important is source control of bleed now when should we think that we should start a massive transmission protocol so there is no one clinical or laboratory finding that accurately predicts the need to activate an massive transmission protocol so it is based on the clinical judgment the decision tools that we have and the response to an early management so these are the two scoring systems that can be used one is the abc score or the assessment of blood consumption and the newer score that is the revised assessment of bleeding and transmission the rap score which is more sensitive and specific than the abc score so in this score we have four parameters like penetrating injury one point first positive one shock index more than one we consider as one and pelvic fracture to be as a individual <coughs> parameter so any two of these are present then we should start massive transmission protocols now what is the because the bloods are no longer given we are not giving a whole blood so it, we are giving components so what should be the ratio so large studies are saying that patient who has sustained severe traumatic injuries should get a ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1 of platelet ffp and rbcs in 2015 there was a trial called proper randomized clinical trial where they compared the ratios 1 is to 1 is to 1 versus 1 is to 1 is to 2 in terms of mortality this was done because uh, as we know that ffp and cryoprecipitates are kept in a very low temperature and it takes time to thaw so if we keep a ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1 it so actually it delays the transmission time so in order to minimize the time this ratio was formulated but in the long time it was seen that there was no mortality benefit then giving a 1 is to 1 is to 1 now what are the initial baseline tests that we need to do and what are the tests that we should keep on doing at repeated interval to know the patient's condition so these are the hemoglobin levels the blood lactate diana the fibrinogen level and the serum calcium levels coming to tranexamic acid as per, as we know in the crash two and crash three trial there is a benefit of giving tranexamic acid so it should be given within 3 hours of the injury and every 15 minutes delay decreases its mortality benefit by 10% the dose is 1 g bolus followed by 1 g over 8 hours now hypothermia increases the mortality by worsening the coagulopathy in trauma patients so we need to maintain monitor the core body temperature and we should prevent hypothermia by removing any wet cloth if there are any or place warm blankets and to administer warm iv fluids so commercially available warmers are there so we can use those to keep our transfusion products at close to body temperature now what are the targets that we need to achieve both clinically hematologically and metabolic so these are done to monitor the tissue perfusion and the response what we get to the resuscitation now laboratory targets are more important to assess the trajectory of massive transmission protocol so these are the target values of the various parameters so hemoglobin you should target to achieve at least to 7 or more than that hematocrit minimum should be achieved is 32 platelet count should exceed more than 50000 per deciliter inr should come down to less than 1.1 maintaining a map of at least 65 fibrinogen level more than 1.5 maintaining a ph in the normal physiological range and a core temperature body temperature of more than 35 so these are the acceptable components so if the recipient blood group is known then we can transfuse the same group blood or ffps or platelets but if it is not known then we as we all know that blood group o can be transfused to all blood groups similarly ab group ffps or cryo or platelets can be used for all uh, group person so if it is unknown we can transfuse other group o blood and components other components in the ab group 
So this is a comparison of whole blood and the components. So if you see that in the whole blood has got a higher hematocrit value, more number of platelets and the coagulation protein as compared to the component. But thing is that you cannot give it for specific conditions like anemia, hemoglobin, hemoglobin or low platelet count. Whereas that benefit we have in the component. And also <clears throat> one more benefit that we achieve is that we can alter the one is to one is to one ratio by seeing at the laboratory values and the thromboelastogram reports. So you can change as per the patient's requirement. So these are the various components. So PRVCs, what we get is every unit will raise the hemoglobin by one. It gives a volume of 160 to 220 per unit and it raises the hematocrit by 3%. So platelet, we have a random and single donor. So random donor gives a rise, raises the platelet count by around 6,000, where a single donor will raise it by 24 to 35,000 per unit. Coming to FFP, so FFP contains most of the clotting factors, fibrinogen, plasma proteins, particularly the albumin, the electrolytes, and the physiological natural anticoagulants like protein C, protein S. <laughs> so fibrinogen concentrates are being recommended by some of the European guidelines, again, because of the cost and the unavailability in many centers. We don't have, but we have an alternative that is the cryoprecipitate, which can be extracted by centrifuging the uh, FFPs. So it is rich in factor eight, fibrinogen, conolubin factor and factor 13. So cryoprecipitates can be used for in place of fibrinogen. It contains around 200 to 250 milligram of fibrinogen per unit. Standard dose is of two, five unit dose should be administered early in major <coughs> oxidic hemorrhages. And subsequent uh, cryoprecipitates should be uh, as per the patient's requirement, keeping a minimum threshold of 1.5. So these are the complications of major transfusion. So uh, acid-based derangement, hypothermia, coagulopathy, cyclic toxicity, electrolyte abnormalities, like hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia can be seen. And also the transmission associated acute lung injuries, which will be discussed subsequently in the next discussion. So <clears throat> this is a picture showing a, whenever there's a massive bleed and we transfuse a lot of crystalloids and PRBCs, it leads to a vicious triad of coagulopathy, acidosis and hypothermia, which in turn increases the possibility of bleed. So these are the monitoring recommendations uh, for seeing the ongoing resuscitation. Periodically, we should look for protrombidine, APTT, the platelet count, fibrinogen, electrolytes, and the viscoelastic test. So it should be done after every five to seven units that is being transfused. Now, viscoelastic whole blood assay, this is a very good uh, and a real-time uh, monitoring of the patient. So it helps uh, to see the entire coagulation process through the graphical representation by seeing the clot initiation, the propagation, and what is the lysis of the clot. So this is the normal graph that we get, and each part represents either the clot formation or in the fibrinolysis. So by seeing the shapes of the curves, we can decide which is the component that needs to be replaced. So to summarize, the patient requiring massive transmission needs careful and ongoing consideration of several complex physiological relationships. And there is no clear cut lower limit for which we think that this transmission can be futile. So it can be started as soon as possible. The coagulation system should be frequently monitored by either lab values or if available viscoelastic measures. And a commercial blood warmer should be used whenever more than three units are transfused at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Somat, for that uh, nice lecture on uh, massive transfusion protocol. I think uh, the restricted transfusion policy has, against the liberal transfusion policy, has changed uh, the entire uh, you know, game of game plan of uh, our transfusions in right. our emergency and critical care departments, right. and um, avoiding deadly triads, setting up targets. All this added to the value of uh, the transfusion medicine. Thank you for highlighting the same. Uh, please be online in the meeting for to take the question and answer sessions, which is post to the 15th session. 
So now I welcome Dr. Ravi Chaudhary, who is a consultant and head of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Paras Jaika Hospital, Udaipur, Rajasthan, to deliver a talk on the complications of transmission policies, precisely to talk on trolley and taco. Dr. Ravi, Ravi. Dr. Ravi, are you online? Uh, yes, I am online. I'm just uh, saving my screen. Yes, we can hear you well. I think, uh, yeah. Are you able to see your screen? Right, good to go. Session is yours. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, Thank you for giving me the opportunity for this uh, topic. The topic is uh, Chali and Taka. Uh, so basically, uh, what is, uh, I'm Dr. Ravi. Uh, basically, uh, I will talk about uh, the most common uh, complications about uh, blood transfusion, that's uh, Chali and Taka. So if you go for that epidemiology, then we'll see that the National Blood Collection and Utilization Survey report described TACO to occur approximately uh, one uh, person uh, is uh, having with that uh, 14,000 transfuse uh, components. And TACO appears as per the uh, serious hazard and transfusion report, uh, TACO appears to be one of the leading cause of transfusion related uh, fatalities uh, with 44.1% of that. A report transfusion uh, related uh, fatalities being from TACO. FDA reported in uh, 2012 to 2016 that 30% uh, of the reported transfusion related fatality due to uh, TACO. Uh, and for the uh, data for the trolley, National Blood Collection Utilization Survey reported trolley to occur one uh, in uh, 64,000 transfuse uh, components and the frequency is approximately 1 to 15%. The FDA has reported trolley to be the leading cause of transfusion related fatalities uh, for many years, with 34% reported transfusion related fatalities being from the trolley. Uh, but in controversy, in contrast, 2017 short report published that 4% of the reported uh, transfusion related fatalities were due to uh, trolley. So, so I will, uh, before I start uh, discuss, uh, the detail in uh, <coughs> trolley and taco, I will go first for the cases. So this is a case one, uh, 31 year old female. Uh, she had normal vaginal delivery three hours ago in the hospital uh, as per gynecologist and she has a small uh, PPS. And uh, for that uh, uh, PPS, uh, PRBC transfusion is started as per the protocol. And now after starting that uh, <coughs> approximately 19 minutes after issuing that uh, plate, plate, uh, the PRBC, the patient complaining, start complaining of shortness of breath, orthopnea and fever and chills. And her examination, vital signs showing hypotension, 90 by 60 is the blood pressure, heart rate, she's tachycardic 135, uh, SpO2 is 74% on room air and bilateral crepes on test examination. And uh, second case, uh, 75 year old male, he was presented in emergency department uh, with complaining of uh, bleeding PR from last three days. Uh, his, uh, we did uh, his uh, lab test and the hemoglobin was 3.6 gram per DL. Is a um, known case of renal failure and known case of tonic anemia. So uh, his hemoglobin was very low. So four PRBs and four FFP transfusion uh, was planned for four hours. And at the end of transfusion, the patient uh, started uh, shortness of breath. On examination, he is uh, hypertensive. BP is 160 by 110. Heart tachycardia was there. Uh, SpO2 is hypoxic, 84% room air, and bilateral crepes were there. So uh, what will the diagnosis of these two cases and how we manage these cases, I will go through these things. So these two cases uh, could be ta uh, Taco and Shali. So initial management after any blood transfusion reaction is uh, uh, almost same. So initial management is uh, airway. Initial management is initial stabilizes. Like we have to stabilize the airway breathing and circulation. And we need to do complete set of vital signs, the blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, SpO2 and uh, blood sugar. 
Uh, these patients sometimes require uh, ventilatory support, NIV or magnetic, mechanical ventilation, what is required, we have to go for that. And uh, recheck the blood uh, for any AVO discrepancy. This is a clerical check. We have to check the blood components, what we received, and uh, if the patient is correct or the blood components are correct. In complete examination, physical examination, we have to check the rail, strong eye, JVP. So, okay, in this here we use ABC, ECG, uh, chest X ray to decocardiography. And we have to report all the blood transfusion reaction to blood bank. And uh, we need to collect blood transfusion samples and urine samples for workup uh, to see if there is any uh, intravenous hemolysis or not, or urine for uh, hematuria and all those things. So, in short, uh, if any patient who is presented after uh, blood transfusion and he is having shortness of breath associated with AILS, that could be TACO. TACO is the transfusion associated circulatory overload, or it could be uh, TRALI, that is transfusion related acute like lung injury. Uh, in practice, uh, the uh, distinguish between uh, these two is very difficult and they require a uh, a laboratory, a major laboratory investigation and some monitoring that's usually even not uh, report, uh, not available in uh, some hospitals. So basically, TACO is the CHF exacerbation from acute increase in intravascular volume. And here for the TACO, uh, the risk factors are elderly age and those pre-existing cardiac or renal disease. Preventive measures are we need to uh, transfuse that uh, blood for the longer period and uh, it's concurrently sometimes we need to give diuretics. A uh, trial is described as non cardiogenic pulmonary edema, secondary to increased vascular permeability due to post neutrophil that become activated by substance in uh, donated uh, blood. That's uh, usually uh, HL antigens. Uh, usually, this results spontaneously go dead, but patient uh, may require intensive airway support, including intubation. Diuresis, usually in uh, trial, is not effective. So, as per NHSN uh, 2016 TACO definition, new onset or observation of three or more uh, of the following within six hours of the transfusion, uh, the patient might have uh, diagnosed with TACO, acute respiratory distress, dyspnea or sapniaca, evidence of positive fluid balance, left uh, BNP, radiographic uh, evidence of pulmonary edema, evidence of left, left heart failure or elevated uh, central venous pressure. For the tally definition, we will give NHLBI. This is the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute 2005 uh, definition. Patient without acute lung injury risk factors other than transfusion, if they are presented within, uh, with a new acute lung injury with, and uh, the symptom onset or sign uh, during or within six hours after the end of transfusion, then this might be uh, due to uh, trauma. So there are a couple of uh, key diagnostic uh, features, differences uh, from the TACO and TRALI. So uh, the both have acute onset of respiratory distress symptoms, usually uh, less than six hours upon the blood transfusion. In both the situation, patient uh, have hypoxia, SpO2 less than 90%, PO2 uh, by FiO2 is less than 300. Uh, in both conditions, patient, may patient is uh, presenting with pulmonary edema. Here in uh, chest x-ray, we can see bilateral infiltrates. Mm, the alternative risk factors for pneumonia, sepsis, aspiration, uh, multiple trauma, acute pericarditis, uh, uh, this is uh, not present in, uh, may be uh, not uh, present in um, both the cases. And uh, hydrostatic pulmonary uh, pressure, uh, this is uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, this is increased in uh, more than 18, increased in uh, DACO patients. In TACO patients, we will see next slides. The pathophysiology is there is increased hydrostatic pressures. So there is the fluid is usually protein poor fluids. And in TACO, again, there is increased ventricular filling or myocardial stretching. So BNP is increased uh, more than 250. And if you have pre uh, transfusion BNP increase, then the pre post transfusion ratio is greater than 1.5, and anti pro BNP is more than 1000. A response to diuretics, uh, usually in TACO, the response to diuretics is good. Uh, Trali, there's no uh, good response for that uh, diuretics. In cardiogenic non, -L uh, L uh, non laboratory evidence, in TACO, usually the ejection fraction is less than uh, 45%. Systolic blood pressure is more than uh, 65. And the cardiothoracic ratio is greater than 0.55 on the radiograph. And uh, in uh, ECG, we uh, can see that uh, in both the cases, uh, there should not be any uh, new uh, ischemic changes on ECG or trop uh, levels should be uh, normal for both the uh, diagnosis. Uh, supportive and uh, some diagnosis. So if we examine the patient, uh, 
in taco and trali there are some differences so neck veins usually distended in taco trali the neck veins they is normal in own auscultation they both have rails but in taco we can have s3 in trali no s3 blood pressure is again a differentiating factor uh, feature we can found that in taco it's uh, hypertension and trali there is no hypertension temperature in taco is uh, normal trali may be febrile white blood cells uh, in trali there is a transient leukopenia uh, due to uh, neutrophil sequestration in uh, pulmonary fields. Uh, leukocyte antibodies, these are usually HLA class first, second antibodies uh, and anti HLA antibodies usually present in Kali. And post transfusion cytokinins in TACO, we will see that the IL 10 is increased. In Kali, IL 10 is not increased. This uh, IL 10 is important uh, factors here because this is uh, having you know, post uh, having some uh, future therapy directed uh, towards this one. So we will see that uh, some little uh, bit uh, pathophysiology about that uh, trolley and taco. So as per the uh, theories, and they're saying that there are two hits. The first hit is the patient and second is the transfusion products. So in taco, the first hit, the patient is usually poor adaptability for the volume order. Maybe uh, usually they have history of cardiac failure, renal failure, positive fuel loads. And the secondary hit in uh, for the taco is uh, suboptimal fluid management and uh, the, in taco there is uh, pulmonary edema is usually uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema in trali if you see that first it is the patient is usually uh, pro inflammatory there is increased ila chronic alcohol abuse the elderly patient acute renal failure trauma liver surgery mechanical ventilation uses crp or low il6 the secondary hit for the trial, trial patient, uh, trolley patient is anti LHLA class 1, class 2 antibodies, anti HNA antibodies, non antibody mediators. So this is the secondary hit. And the uh, trolley patients, the pulmonary edema is usually uh, non cardiogenic pulmon uh, pulmonary edema. And now we will go for some uh, potential therapies and future direction. Unfortunately, for both uh, TACO and trolley, only supportive measures are available and specific therapies are lacking. Supportive measures for TACO may include diuresis, oxygen, and intubation. For trolley, supportive measures may include oxygen, intubation, and judicious uh, fluid and pressure management to maintain hemodynamics. Uh, there are some uh, ther uh, therapies for the trolley mitigation. We can use some preventive measures that include the donor deferral uh, based on antibody screening, anti HNA and anti HLA antibody, a donor deferral based on history of pregnancy and history of transfusion and deferral for all female donors. These trolley mitigation therapies we have to use in our uh, ICUs where we will see the patient is uh, pro-inflammatory conditions. They, if they are meeting all the uh, criteria for the donor deferral, then better to go for the donor deferral therapies for these patients. Uh, these are some uh, future therapies uh, that is uh, useful for this, uh, maybe uh, uh, potential therapies. IL-10 is the most important second for the trolley. Uh, second is CRP uh, down modulation, ROS inhibitors, IL-8 receptor blockage, IVIZ disruption, component targeting, and uh, anti platelet agents. Uh, so uh, I am concluding my presentation. So uh, the take-home point, unfortunately, both uh, for both TACO and TRALI, only supportive measures are available and specific therapies are lacking. Uh, definitely, the airway breathing circulation and the emergency management is uh, first. Uh, supporting measures for TACO is uh, diuresis, oxygen, and intubation. And the, for the trolley, trolley is oxygen intubation and judicious use of the fluid and pressure management uh, to maintain the uh, HEMO and dynamics. Thank you, Dr. Lavi, for finishing your presentation on time. Uh, and your you. presentation is very crisp and uh, easy to understand. Uh, we feel that you know the diagnostic challenge yes. uh, from the underlying disease of lung injury or worsening of heart disease post transfusion versus trolley and taco is uh, more challenging than uh, you know the disease per se. Anyway, thank you for highlighting the same. Uh, please be online to take question and answer session if anything post 15 uh, session. So we'll go on to the next uh, session for uh, today. I once again welcome all the uh, you know, speakers and uh, listeners for this uh, Semicon 2022. We are into the 15th session, which is going to be about the dermatological emergencies. And uh, we have uh, two lectures in this uh, session. The first session is about uh, uh, dress SJS and 10. The speaker is going to be Dr. Asif Iqbal. Dr. Asif, are you online?
Dr. Asif. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello, Dr. Rajdurai. Hi. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. You're very much audible. Um, you're free to uh, share your uh, screen. Yes, we are able to see your screen. Yes. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Please. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you, Semicon Bengal, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, initially, when they gave me this topic, I was a little surprised. Uh, uh, emergencies in dermatology, but like uh, personal experience and sometimes they do suddenly land up and uh, it's important for any emergency resident uh, to know these few uh, conditions, uh, to pick them a little early and uh, what is the exact role of emergency physician uh, while resuscitating these patients. So let's quickly move on. Uh, I'll be discussing about uh, dress and the overlap syndrome of SJS and TEN. So as we all know, uh, DRESS as acronym that stands for drug reaction with isnophilia and systemic symptoms. Uh, it's nothing but uh, idiosyncratic adverse drug reaction that affects the skin and various internal organs. The important hallmark is a long latency period between, between the exposure to the medication and onset of reaction, which can be two weeks, three weeks, and sometimes even eight weeks. So this point is very important because in history taking we have to focus upon this usually the rash is uh, usually this uh, latency period is followed initially by fever rash and involvement of at least one internal organ system as we all know withdrawal of the inciting medication and systemic corticosteroids are mainstay of treatments for this so when we talk about uh, dress uh, we should know what is mobile form rash. It's nothing but a drug eruption, which appears in the form of a maculopapular. So we can see in this picture, there are two variants of maculopapular drug eruption, and one is exanthem, what we see. These two presentations are very common in DRESS. Pathophysiology is usually multifactorial. Immunological and non-immunological factors play their role. Proposed contributing factors include dysfunctional drug detoxification pathways, which lead to accumulation of harmful metabolites and reactivation of herpes virus. So important thing is to note that human herpes virus plays an important role in its etiology and especially the six and seven variants of HHV. So though it is rare, the instances have been somewhere from one in thousand to one in 10,000. Uh, it affects adults usually, males and females equally, uh, most commonly because of drugs and the drugs which notable are antimicrobials like ampicillin, dapsone, isoniazide, linozolide, minocycline, rifampicin, sulfasalazine, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, vancomycin. Anticonvulsants again are very common because of which the patient can present to you with dress. Uh, amongst, amongst them are the aromatic ones like carbamazepine, phenytoin, lamotrigine, and phenobar. Amongst, uh, apart from this, antivirals, antidepressants, antihypertensives, and some others like allopurinol, NSAIDs like celecoxibs can also cause dress. So when you are giving these drugs, please make sure that your presence don't present with these symptoms or when you are facing with such a patient in your ER, you should take a detailed history of drugs and specify whether these drugs have been taken in the past three to four weeks or not. So clinical features, latency period as already we have described, Fever is usually high, can touch up to 40 degrees centigrade, which quickly uh, goes into a rash. The rash usually is morbidly formed, exanthematous rash, or sometimes it can be a erythroderma. The clue, uh, especially for DRESS, is facial swelling. About 30% of the patients present with facial swelling, which can be the mucosal involvement that usually affects lips, mouth, throat, and genitalia. At least one organ is involved, the rash can last for many weeks. So when we were talking about organs, the generalized, the, the usually is the lymph, lymph node involvement, leukocytosis, abnormal liver function, and peripheral isnophilia. Uh, an important point to note here is, though the acronym DRESS includes peripheral isnophilia as one of the factor, it may not be essential for diagnosing it. 
okay the common the most common visceral organ involved in liver is fulminant hepatitis and which is most responsible for deaths in these patients so there is registrar criteria for diagnosis of dress which should contain hospitalization of a patient acute rash suspicion of a drug related reaction plus at least three of this which is high fever lymphadenopathy at two sides organs involved common one is liver liver which results in acute fulminant hepatitis it can involve any other organ from kidney heart any other system hematological abnormalities like eosinophilia is also common but need not be mandatory for diagnosis of dresss now treatment uh, i just want to focus this is something like a combo of chemical burn and an anaphylaxis that's how you should approach this patient with so we have to first withdraw or stop the agent which is responsible for that find out the drug what the patient is taking and stop it immediately then as usual focus upon the airway breathing and circulation because i as i said there is uh, mucosal involvement uh, there is a swelling of the face so there is a good chance that these patients can come in airway compromise there is a good chance that the patient can come with strider respiratory failure so focus upon your airway clear the airway maintain a patent airway which is a very very essential nebulized corticosteroids or iv corticosteroids oral corticosteroids again depends upon patient to patient have shown some benefit uh, you can also think about in refractory cases iv immunoglobulins plasma pharesis in few cases have reported that has got a good outcome immunomodulatory drugs like cyclophosphamide bicofenolate uh, and others have limited role still we need more supportive data on this you should what you should focus upon is a good resuscitation wherein you maintain a airway you clear the airway you maintain a secure airway you maintain oxygenation and ventilation you maintain a very good circulation and maintain the hemodynamics of these patients apart from this supportive cares like dressing wound care topical steroids emollients and other oral antihistaminics may be required to alleviate the discomfort for these patients uh now after discussing about dresss now we'll move on quickly to sjs and toxic epidermonecrolysis so sjs ten are life threatening mucocutaneous reactions so they are the more dangerous ones usually caused by a drug characterized by diffuse keratinocyte apoptosis that is the cell death of keratinocytes the percent of affected body surface area determines whether the reaction is described as sjs or a combo of both are at 10 so this point essential is affected body surface area the amount of detachment of epidermis from dermis is that percentage will decide whether it is sjs or a combo of sjs 10 or at 10 so sjs 10 present opposite signs of a spectrum of same rare adverse immunological reactions so the annual incidence of 1.2 to 6 per million for sjs and approximately 1 per million for 10 the average mortality rate for sjs ranges from 1 to 5% but when you go to the 10 because it is an opposite end it is a more fatal one so the mortality rates can go somewhere 25 to 30% patho physiology because of most affecting drugs it's an adverse drug reaction the most common medications you should note of is allopurinol anesthetics sulfonamide antibiotics and anticonvulsants especially the aromatic ones sometimes genetic factors do play a role or uh, sometimes viral illnesses most of them viral illness especially in children can result in this condition immune dysregulation results in diffuse diffuse keratinocyte apoptosis that has been shown to involve fas fas ligand interactions signs and symptoms usually the latency period here also is 1 to 3 weeks but probably lesser when you compare to dresss initially there is a fever there is dysphagia and a burning sensation of eyes so note what the points are in this there is ocular involvement and there is oral involvement so these patients can come with a airway compromise these patients can come with ocular complications skin involvement often is heralded by sensation of diffuse skin pain so skin pain is another differentiating point here and the most important is these are more dirty looking lesions in simple the appearance is more dusky they are targetoid skin lesions and there is extensive mucosal erosions which differentiates these when compared to the dress 
progression of epidermis detach the detachment of epidermis progresses and it gets separated from the dermis completely leading to bulle and epidermal sloughing so these uh, lesions look more dirtier more panicky for us involvement of respiratory epithelium can lead to respiratory insufficiency the same thing happens the epidermis the, the, the respiratory epidermis is ciliary one which can get detached from the dermis that can result in respiratory insufficiency and most of these patients can land up in ARDS so they may need ventilation oxygenation, oxygenation abundantly so a variety of other organs can also be involved in these conditions the two things what you have to remember uh, in this is one is the targetoid and atypical targetoid lesions two mucosal surfaces involving ocular oral genital the important thing is nikolsky sign which refers to detachment epidermal detachment occurring with lateral pressure adjacent to bulle is present and this can be a clue for diagnosis to nikolsky sign so some dds are as you all know staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome fixed drug eruptions drug induced linear iga bullous dermatosis so this is skin biopsy more for histopathological so in this you can clearly see that the epidermis is very much detached from the underlying dermis the underlying dermis still remains clear and it's not inflamed much so this was what i was telling with respect to the body surface area the epidermal detachment how much it is if it is less than 10% you call you call it sjs if it is 10 to 30% you call it a overlap of sjs and 10 if it is greater than 30% then you have to call it as 10 treatment again is first to discontinue the offending agent focus upon the airway breathing because in this there is more amount of uh, injury more amount of involvement of respiratory epithelium so these patients can come with airway compromises respiratory failure so focus upon your airway secure the airway as and when required oxygenation nebulization they can come with circulatory collapse so give adequate fluid boluses maintain the hemodynamics expose the area prevent hypothermia and measure the body surface area of the detached lesion so that you diagnose in which category exactly this comes so this is done usually by thermal regulation by various methods fluid replacement maximize protein nutrition because the wounds are heavy here meticulous wound care should be done as ocular complications are more common an ophthalmology consultation should be taken so the treatment mainly is some steroids can be used mainly to suppress the immunity and the topic is little controversy and we need more evidence on this a uh, few centers have have uh, used high dose iv immunoglobulin of 3 to 4 grams per kg uh, with, with or without corticosteroids and re results have been beneficial so prognosis is basing upon the score 10 score which you can clearly see it's available anywhere online so it has got six scores and basing upon as the score goes high the mortality of patient worsens so this is a histological pathology i'm not going much into it so this is a summary one to understand what is drss 10 the overlap and sjs so with respect to the time with respect to the skin changes involved and with respect to the systemic involvement you can have a brief idea for differentiating and diagnosing these common dermatological emergencies okay so i think i've come to end of this topic so when i was doing a residency if i get any dermatological case after resuscitation i would be worrying for diagnosis and i would be in search of a dermatology resident which uh, usually they tell they are not available and they will only be available in the opr so hope we understand the dermatological emergencies more and focus upon this thank you so much thank you dr asif for uh, differentiating this uh, dermatological uh, emergencies as you rightly said i think focus history and uh, you know spotting out based on the presentation and the focus to physical examination is very important in differentiating and treating and as you rightly said again abc management holds a key in these uh, dermatological emergencies can you be on line to take any question and answers at the end of the session we okay. have another interesting topic coming up uh, necrotizing fasciitis one of the common dermatological emergencies and the surgical emergency which is cellulitis so necrotizing fasciitis and cellulitis uh, the speaker is going to be dr abbas ali is attending consultant in the department of emergency medicine max super specialty hospital delhi over to you dr asif dr abbas uh, is the most important topic for any physician
Can we have Dr. Abbas Ali to share the screen, please? Good evening, everybody. Yeah, good to go. Good evening. So, what is hidden is meant to be hidden. For those who know, we'll find the truth. Dear can residents and faculty, can we have your slide in uh, presentation mode? Uh, one second, please. Sorry. Well, listen to your bus start. Yes, sir. Share the screen and make it full screen. Yeah, it's good. Yes, yes. Correct. All right. Yes. Can you make it full screen, Dr. Abbas, if that is possible, or please go ahead with the presentation. Yeah, this is yeah. fine. This is fine. Use the computer keyboard to change slide. Yeah, let me just, I'll just use the computer keyboard. One second, please. Technical issue. Have you sent your presentation to the post? No, but I'll present it from here. One second, please. Almost done. I think I just need I just need to come in again. Abbas, log out and log in again. Yes, sir. Risha, can we take a break for two minutes?
हाँ प्रियंका बोलो Yes, I'm back. Continue. Hi, am I audible now? Yeah, you're perfectly audible. Your screen is audible. Yeah, you are. Uh, I'm so sorry. Audible. All right. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. So, uh, what is hidden is hidden, and what the mind knows, you will see. So, my name is Dr. Basili Khatai, and I'm uncovering necrotizing fasciitis. So, uh, in necrotizing fasciitis, there is infection or inflammation which is deep to the fascia. And because it is deep to the fascia, the skin findings are less or skin findings are rare comparatively except in the later stages. So, what this slide is telling you is the, the typical skin findings and necrotizing fasciitis, which is seen only in about 25%, the blisters, the bullae, they are only the tip of the iceberg. And there is something really dangerous lurking beneath because once the infection spreads through the fascia, it goes deep and it causes necrosis of the vessels and the viscera beneath the skin and the facial planes. So your necrotizing fasciitis, skin findings are just the tip of the iceberg and what is deeper is what is dangerous. So uh, necrotizing fasciitis can be classified into three types clinically. Um, I don't think it helps you too much clinically, the classification, but just for a theoretical standpoint, we can. We can call it type one, type two, and type three. Type one necrotizing fasciitis is poly polymicrobial. It can have gram positive, gram negative, or anaerobic infections. Okay. And this generally uh, produces gas, which can be felt as crepitus. And it is seen in comorbid conditions like diabetics or your renal failure patient, obese patients, they can have something, uh, they, can, they can have type 1 polymicrobial necrotizing fasciitis. Also, um, it can involve the head, it can involve the neck, it can involve uh, the anogenital region, for example, phoneus gangrene. And these patients can present in shock or septic shock. Type 2 necrotizing fasciitis is generally caused by streptococcus, group A streptococcus, and occasionally by staph aureus. And uh, surprisingly, type 2 does not cause gas or crepitus on examination. It generally involves the extremities. So, uh, minor traumas or injuries which can cause a superficial uh, tissue loss can present as a type 2 necrotizing fasciitis. Type 3 neck fasci is what we are scared of or are we? So type 3 neck fasci uh, is called gas gangrene. It is caused by Clostridium perforangens or in some cases Clostridium septicum septicum. 
and uh, the most common uh, mode of infection uh, is penetrating trauma. That would be a direct injury or uh, surgeries, IV drug abusers, or in rare cases through hematogenous spread from the bowel. The issue with type 3 neck fash or gas gangrene is that the invasion is deeper into the tissue and the progression is extremely rapid. Yeah. And uh, management wise, you need to treat, uh, you need to be actively resuscitating the sepsis in these patients. And yeah, all right. Next, let's talk about clinical examination symptoms. So these patients present with pain, which is out of proportion of what you see. So they have severe pain, but when you examine, it's out of proportion of what you actually see. And also the uh, erythema, which they have around the pain, it is beyond the point of pain on examination. It goes beyond that point of pain. Also on examination, the erythema, which uh, is around the area of infection is pretty much similar to cellulitis. But what differentiates this from cellulitis is the fact that edema goes beyond the erythema and it is not localized just to the erythema. In neck fash, the erythema or edema goes beyond the area of erythema. And uh, also on uh, palpation, it has a woody induration or a woody feel to it. Other skin findings like subcutaneous emphysema or typically uh, known as crepitus is non-specific. It's only seen in 25% of patients, but if you have it, it is pretty diagnostic. Also, there can be skin discoloration, purplish skin discoloration over the area of infection. And finally, there can be blister formation or bullae formation. And if these bullae, they turn hemorrhagic, then they give the typical violaceous bullae appearance. Looks can be deceiving. So in necrotizing fasciitis, uh, your patient can look absolutely fine. They can look absolutely fine with just a little pain in some part of the body, or they can look absolutely toxic. So don't get fooled by these looks. Don't let, let these looks deceive you. This patient is or might die on your table. So don't get deceived by their looks. Necrotizing fasciitis is a killer. So let's talk a little bit about phonius gangrene. So necrotizing fasciitis of uh, the groin or more commonly the scrotal region is known as phonius gangrene. Now, because this region is anatomically in such a, uh, is anatomically such that uh, erythema and edema is very difficult uh, to be uh, exa or uh, clinically, it's very difficult to find erythema and, uh, and edema in this area. But if you have a clinical suspicion, you know, don't hold back. You need to get a urology consultation done here. And if you need to push that patient to the OT, push that patient to the OT. Okay, so index of suspicion, keep a very low index of suspicion when it comes to phonius gangrene. Right, so now this, when, when you have an undifferentiated diagnosis, you're not very sure, then you have to go to my best friend or you can take help of my best friend, which is the ultrasound machine using a high frequency probe, put some jelly on it and put that probe on that part of your patient and use the mnemonic staff that subcutaneous thickening air facial fluid. So on ultrasound, 
you could see uh, these three findings, which is subcutaneous thickening. If you can see the skin here, you will be able to uh, see uh, on the top of the picture, the thickening of the tissue right on top of the picture. So that is subcutaneous thickening. And just below that, you will see lakes of fluid going down. Lakes of fluid going down the fascia. That's your fascia with lakes of fluid going down. So subcutaneous thickening, facial fluid, and just below that, you can see these bright areas of echogenicity, bright areas. This is your air or gas. And how do I know this? Because there is an acoustic shadow just below that. So use the mnemonic staff, subcutaneous thickening, facial fluid, and air in your ultrasound machine. So uh, not very specific, more than 30, 30%, but in uh, a diagnosis which is not clear, this can just add to your armory. Okay, so you need to resuscitate that patient. You need to hit hard and hit fast, um, resuscitate him with fluids and your antibiotics. So antibiotics of choice would be clindamycin. So that is 600 mg to 900 mg of clindamycin. Okay, clindamycin also helps reduce the toxin load immediately. And to that, you want to add a beta lactam antibiotic, broad spectrum beta lactam antibiotic like piperacillin tazobactam. In case you have a patient who is immunocompromised or who is resistant to gram negatives, you can also uh, use meropenem in these patients. And when you have a high index of suspicion for uh, MRSA, add a linozolid or a vancomycin in these patients. So necrotizing fasciitis has a 20 to 80% mortality. And in these patients, the mortality is increased or the mortality depends on time to admission and time to debridement, okay? So if you have a neck fash, you know, kill, kill the surgeon with your politeness, you know, but get that patient to the OT. Push to fight for your patient, send this patient to the OT. So my take home points for you is necrotizing fasciitis is a life-threatening condition. You need to hit hard and hit fast with resuscitation, with high-end antibiotics. Next, you uh, have to fight for your patient. You know, you need, you need to fight, you need to put your foot down, send this patient to the OT. Play your cards right. Don't, don't let this don't let anyone take this patient's soul away from you. Fight for your patient, keep him alive. And it, and uh, I'm sure you guys will do amazing. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you much. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Abbas, for that uh, colorful presentation. Of course, saving lives is a duty of any every emergency physician. That's why we have gathered here. And uh, I guess a lot of take-home points from your presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, I shall forward to the speakers. So, so I do not have any question, but uh, can I? I give my suggestions to the residents. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself and do it. Okay. So my name is Dr. Sanjay, and I'm heading Max Healthcare at uh, Delhi. <clears throat> so my suggestion to all the residents is like, you know, when you get a triple encounter, you will get a patient who is in shock. But do not forget. 
to do urogenital examination. Urogenital examination is the most important aspect of uh, any case when you are appearing for an exam. Because there would be a patient with sepsis, there would be a patient with uh, shock. But what is the reason of that sepsis? Most of the time, in our general experience, we have seen that we do not do the urogenital examination. So any abdominal examination is not completed without a urogenital examination. So once you get into a urogenital examination, you'll get to the point where you are heading and why the patient is here for you. Thank you very much. Point well taken, sir. Thank you. I think it is uh, the part of teaching. Whenever there is a pain in uh, abdomen, we need to examine the urogenital. That is a 10 quadrants of abdomen is to be examined. It is a part and parcel of the teaching to the residents of emergency medicine. I think it started from day one of a surgical posting in our MBBS too. Thank you for highlighting the same. And uh, I guess there are no more uh, questions. We can end the session by thanking Dr. Samadatta, Dr. Ravi, and Dr. Asif and Dr. Abbas Ali for the wonderful presentations. And uh, I may conclude the session by thanking uh, Dr. Uh, the organizing team of uh, Semicon 2022 and the scientific team for giving me this sort of an opportunity. Kudos to them, and I greatly appreciate them. Looking forward. Thank you very much. Kudos to all the organizing committee and scientific committee and West Bengal chapter of SEMI for having this session. It's wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajadurai, for moderating and concluding our session. Thank you, Sanjay, sir, for your suggestions and inspirations. These inspirations also will take us ahead. Uh, to conclude, I'll conclude with a vote of thanks from the SEMI West Bengal chapter. Myself, Dr. Avishek Chatterjee, the secretary. Uh, I firstly, I want to thank to the sponsor, Dr. Eddies, and uh, the entire Cubex team for supporting and managing this event. Uh, I, uh, kudos to them. Uh, real th my thanks to my president, Dr. Ramojit Lahiri, Dr. Sudhir Chakravarti, Vice President East, and entire uh, West Bengal team, Dr. Bodhishatto Chaudhary, Dr. Raj, Dr. Adijit Sikh. Seal and entire supporting team. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Hari Prasad, sir, Dr. Venkatesh, Dr. Srinath, sir, Dr. Tamul, sir, 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 Dr. Mahesh Joshi, sir, Dr. Imran, and Dr. Satish for making this uh, event a grand success. Uh, in, uh, while conducting these two days, uh, the attendance was uh, very good. We have uh, seen about uh, 800 attendees, including the faculties in the day one and over 600 faculties, uh, 600 attendees, including the faculties in the day two. And a special thanks to all the PGTs, seniors, my teachers for attending this uh, Semicon 2020 and make it a great uh, success. I'm honored uh, to invite you all again uh, to our much awaited uh, Eastern Zone Emergency Medicine Conference 2022, which will be again held in Kolkata. This will be hopefully a physical con conference if the COVID things uh, goes away. Uh, welcome to the city of joy. Stay safe and healthy. Goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
थैंक यू टीम इट्स अ जॉब वेल थैंक यू एवरीवन थैंक यू